section one of psychology of the unconscious this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. psychology of the unconscious by carl jung section one an introduction to psychoanalysis and analytic psychology when professor freud of vienna made his early discoveries in the realm of the neuroses and announced that the basis and origin of the various symptoms grouped under the terms hysteria and neuroses lay in unfulfilled desires and wishes unexpressed and unknown to the patient for the most part and concerned chiefly with the sexual instinct it was not realized what far-reaching influence this unpopular and bitterly attacked theory would exert on the understanding of human life in general for this theory has so widened in its scope that its application has now extended beyond a particular group of pathologic states it has in fact led to a new evaluation of the whole conduct of human life a new comprehension has developed which explains those things which formerly were unexplained and there is offered an understanding not only of the symptoms of a neurosis and the phenomena of conduct but the product of the mind as expressed in myths and religions this amazing growth has proceeded steadily in an ever-widening fashion despite opposition as violent as any of which we have knowledge in the past the criticism originally directed towards the little understood and much disliked sexual conception now includes the further teachings of a psychology which by the application to it of such damning phrases as mystical metaphysical and sacrilegious is condemned as unscientific to add to the general confusion and misunderstanding surrounding this new school of thought there has arisen a division amongst the leaders themselves so that there now exist two schools led respectively by professor sigmund freud of vienna and dr carl jung of zurich referred to in the literature as the vienna school and the zurich school it is very easy to understand that criticism and opposition should develop against a psychology so difficult of comprehension and so disturbing to the ideas which have been held by humanity for ages a psychology which furthermore requires a special technique as well as an observer trained to recognize and appreciate in psychologic phenomena a verification of the statement that there is no such thing as chance and that every act and every expression has its own meaning determined by the inner feelings and wishes of the individual it is not a simple matter to come out boldly and state that every individual is to a large extent the determiner of his own destiny for only by poets and philosophers has this idea been put forth not by science and it is a brave act to make this statement with full consciousness of all its meaning and to stand ready to prove it by scientific reasoning and procedure developed entirely through empirical investigation and through an analysis of individual cases freudian psychology seems particularly to belong to that conception of max muller's that an empirical acquaintance with facts rises to a scientific knowledge of facts as soon as the mind discovers beneath the multiplicity of single productions the unity of an organic system psychoanalysis is the name given to the method developed for reaching down into the hidden depths of the individual to bring to light the underlying motives and determinants of his symptoms and attitudes and to reveal the unconscious tendencies which lie behind actions and reactions and which influence development and determine the relations of life itself the result of digging down into the hidden psyche has been to produce a mass of material from below the threshold of consciousness so astonishing and disturbing and out of relation with the previously held values as to arouse in any one unfamiliar with the process the strongest antagonism and criticism although originally studied only as a therapeutic method for the sick it was soon realized 
through an analysis of normal people how slight were the differences in the content of the unconscious of the sick and of the normal the differences observed were seen to be rather in the reactions to life and to the conflicts produced by contending forces in the individual these conflicts usually not fully perceived by the individual and having to do with objectionable desires and wishes that are not in keeping with the conscious idea of self produce marked effects which are expressed either in certain opinions prejudices attitudes of conduct faulty actions or in some definite pathologic symptom as dr Jung says he who remains healthy has to struggle with the same complexes that cause the neurotic to fall ill in a valuable book called the neighbor written by the late professor in shaler of harvard university there occurs this very far-reaching statement it is hardly too much to say that all the important errors of conduct all the burdens of men or of societies are caused by the inadequacies in the association of the primal animal emotions with those mental powers which have been so rapidly developed in mankind this statement reached by a process of reasoning and a method of thought and study entirely different from psychoanalysis nevertheless so completely expresses in brief form the very basis of the postulates developed through psychoanalysis that i quote it here such a statement made in the course of a general examination of human relations does not arouse opposition nor seem to be so difficult of acceptance it appears to be the individual application of these conceptions that has roused such bitter antagonism and violent denunciations rightly understood and used psychoanalysis may be compared to surgery for psychoanalysis stands in the same relation to the personality as surgery does to the body and they aim at parallel results it is well to recognize that in the last analysis nature is the real physician the healer of wounds but prior to the development of our modern asepsis and surgical technique the healing produced by nature was most often of a very faulty and imperfect type hideous scars distorted and crippled limbs with functions impaired or incapacitated resulted from the wounds or else nature was unable to cope with the hurt and the injured one succumbed science has been steadily working for centuries with the aim of understanding nature and finding means to aid and cooperate with her so that healing could take place with the least possible loss of function or permanent injury to the individual marvellous results have rewarded these persistent efforts as the brilliant achievements of surgery plainly indicate meantime however little thought was given to the possibility of any scientific method being available to help man overcome the wounds and conflicts taking place in his soul hurts which retarded his development and progress as a personality and which frequently in the struggle resulted in physical pains and symptoms of the most varied character that was left solely to religion and metaphysics now however this same assistance that surgery has given to the physical body psychoanalysis attempts to give to the personality that it cannot always succeed is as much to be expected and more than that surgery does not always succeed for the analytic work requires much of the individual no real result can be attained if he has not already developed a certain quality of character and intelligence which makes it possible for him to submit himself to a facing of his naked soul and to the pain and suffering which this often entails here as in no other relation in life an absolute truth and an absolute honesty are the only basis of action since deception of any kind deceives no one but the individual himself and acts as a boomerang defeating his own aims such deep searching and penetrating into the soul is not something to be undertaken lightly nor to be considered a trivial or simple matter and the fact is that where a strong compulsion is lacking such a sickness or a situation too difficult to meet much courage is required to undertake it in order to understand this psychology which is pervading all realms of thought and seems destined to be a new psychological philosophical system for the understanding and practical advancement of human life it will be necessary to go somewhat into detail regarding its development and present status for in this new direction lies its greatest value and its greatest danger the beginnings of this work were first published in eighteen ninety five 
in a book entitled studien über hysterie and contained the joint investigations into hysteria of dr brewer of vienna and his pupil dr sigmund freud the results of their investigations seemed to show that the various symptoms grouped under the title of hysteria were the result of emotionally coloured reminiscences which all unknown to the conscious waking self were really actively expressing themselves through the surrogate form of symptoms and that these experiences although forgotten by the patient could be reproduced and the emotional content discharged hypnosis was the means used to enable the physician to penetrate deeply into the forgotten memories for it was found through hypnosis that these lost incidents and circumstances were not really lost at all but only dropped from consciousness and were capable of being revived when given the proper stimuli the astonishing part about it was that with the revival of these memories and their accompanying painful and disturbing emotions the symptoms disappeared this led naturally to the conclusion that these symptoms were dependent upon some emotional disturbance or psychic trauma which had been inadequately expressed and that in order to cure the patient one merely had to establish the connection between the memory and the emotions which properly belonged to it letting the emotion work itself out through a reproduction of the forgotten scene with further investigation freud found that hypnosis was unnecessary for the revival of the forgotten experiences and that it was possible to obtain the lost emotional material in the conscious and normal state for this purpose the patient was encouraged to assume a passive non-critical attitude and simply let his thoughts flow speaking of whatever came into his mind holding nothing back during this free and easy discussion of his life and conditions directed by the law of association of ideas reference was invariably made to the experiences or thoughts which were the most affective and disturbing elements it was seen to be quite impossible to avoid this indirect revelation because of the strength of the emotions surrounding these ideas and the effect of the conscious wish to repress unpleasant feelings this important group of ideas or impressions with the feelings and emotions clustered around them which are betrayed through this process was called by jung a complex however with the touching of the complex which always contains feelings and emotions so painful or unpleasant as to be unacceptable to consciousness and which are therefore repressed and hidden great difficulties appeared for very often the patient came to a sudden stop and could apparently recall nothing more memory gaps were frequent relations twisted etc evidently some force banished these memories so that the person was quite honest in saying that he could remember nothing or that there was nothing to tell this kind of forgetfulness was called repression and is the normal mechanism by which nature protects the individual from such painful feelings as are caused by unpleasant and unacceptable experiences and thoughts the recognition of his egoistic nature and the often quite unbearable conflict of his weaknesses with his feelings of idealism at this early time great attention was given towards developing a technique which would render more easy the reproduction of these forgotten memories for with the abandonment of hypnosis it was seen that some unknown active force was at work which not only banished painful memories and feelings but also prevented their return this was called resistance this resistance was found to be the important mechanism which interfered with the free flow of thought and produced the greatest difficulty in the further conduct of the analysis it appeared under various guises and frequently manifested itself in intellectual objections based on reasoning ground in criticism directed towards the analyst or in criticism of the method itself and finally often in a complete blocking of expression so that until the resistance was broken nothing more could be produced it was necessary then to find some aid by which these resistances could be overcome and the repressed memories and feelings revived and set free for it was proven again and again that even though the person was not at all aware of concealing within himself some emotionally disturbing feeling or experience with which his symptoms were associated yet such was the fact and that under proper conditions this material could be brought into consciousness this realm where these unknown but disturbing emotions were hidden was called the unconscious the unconscious also being a name used arbitrarily to indicate all that material of which the person is not aware at the given time the not conscious this term is used very loosely in freudian psychology and is not intended to provoke any academic discussion but to conform strictly to the dictionary classification of 
a negative concept which can neither be described nor defined to say that an idea or feeling is unconscious merely means to indicate that the individual is unaware at that time of its existence or that all the material of which he is unaware at a given time is unconscious with the discovery of the significance in relation to hysteria of these varied experiences and forgotten memories which always led into the erotic realm and usually were carried far back into early childhood the theory of an infantile sexual trauma as a cause of this neurosis developed contrary to the usual belief that children have no sexuality and that only at puberty does it suddenly arise it was definitely shown that there was a very marked kind of sexuality among children of the most tender years entirely instinctive and capable of producing a grave effect on the entire later life however further investigations carried into the lives of normal people disclosed quite as many psychic and sexual traumas in their early childhood as in the lives of the patients therefore the conception of the infantile sexual trauma as the etiological factor was abandoned in favour of the infantilism of sexuality itself in other words it was soon realized that many of the sexual traumas which were placed in their early childhood by these patients did not really exist except in their own fantasies and probably were produced as a defence against the memories of their own childish sexual activities these experiences led to a deep investigation into the nature of the child's sexuality and developed the ideas which freud incorporated in a work called three contributions to the sexual theory he found so many variations and manifestations of sexual activity even among young children that he realized that this activity was the normal although entirely unconscious expression of the child's developing life and while not comparable to the adult sexuality nevertheless produced a very definite influence and effect on the child's life these childish expressions of this instinct he called polymorphous perverse because in many ways they resembled in the various abnormalities called perversions when found among adults under certain conditions in the light of these additional investigations freud was led to change his formulation for instead of the symptoms of the neurotic patient being due to definite sexual experiences they seemed to be determined by his reactions towards his own sexual constitution and the kind of repression to which these instincts were subjected perhaps one of the greatest sources of misunderstanding and difficulty in this whole subject lies in the term sexuality for freud's conception of this is entirely different from that of the popular sense he conceived sexuality to be practically synonymous with the word love and to include under this term all those tender feelings and emotions which have had their origin in a primitive erotic source even if now their primary aim is entirely lost and another substituted for it it must also be borne in mind that freud strictly emphasizes the psychic side of sexuality and its importance as well as the somatic expression therefore to understand freud's theories his very broad conception of the term sexual must never be forgotten through this careful investigation of the psychic life of the individual the tremendous influence and importance of fantasy making for the fate was definitely shown it was discovered that the indulgence in day-dreams and fantasies was practically universal not only among children but among adults that even whole lives were being lived out in a fantastic world created by the dreamer a world wherein he could fulfil all those wishes and desires which were found to be too difficult or impossible to satisfy in the world of reality much of this fantasy thinking was seen to be scarcely conscious but arose from unrealized wishes desires and strivings which could only express themselves through veiled symbols in the form of fantastic structures not understood nor fully recognized indeed it is perhaps one of the most common human experiences to find queer thoughts undesired ideas and images forcing themselves upon one's attention to such an extent that the will has to be employed to push them out of mind it is not unusual to discover long forgotten impressions of childhood assuming a fantastic shape in memory and dwelt upon as though they were still of importance this material afforded a rich field for the searches into the soul for through the operation of the law of association of ideas these fantastic products traced back to their origin revealed the fact that instead of being meaningless or foolish they were produced by a definite process and arose from distinct wishes and desires which unconsciously veiled themselves in these mysterious forms and pictures 
it is conceded that the most completely unconscious product of an individual is his dream and therefore professor freud turned his attention from fantasies and daydreams to the investigation of the nightly dreams of his patients to discover whether they would throw light upon the painful feelings and ideas repressed out of consciousness and therefore inaccessible to direct revelation this brilliant idea soon led to a rich fruiting for it became evident that contrary to the usual conception that the dream is a fantastic and absurd jumble of heterogeneous fragments having no real relation to the life of the individual it is full of meaning in fact it is usually concerned with the problem of life most pressing at the time which expresses itself not directly but in symbolic form so as to be unrecognized in this way the individual gains an expression and fulfilment of his unrealized wish or desire this discovery of the symbolic nature of the dream and the fantasy was brought about entirely through the associative method and developed empirically through investigations of the dreams of many people in this manner it became evident that certain ideas and objects which recurred again and again in the dreams and fantasies of different people were definitely associated with certain unconscious or unrecognized wishes and desires and were repeatedly used by the mind to express these meanings where direct form was repressed and unallowed thus certain dream expressions and figures were in a general way considered to be rather definite symbols of these repressed ideas and feelings found in the unconscious through a comparative and parallel study it soon appeared that there was a similar mechanism at work in myths and fairy tales and that the relationship between the dreams and fantasies of an individual and the myths and folk-tales of a people was so close that abraham could say that the myth is a fragment of the infantile soul life of the race and the dream is the myth of the individual thus through relating his dreams the patient himself furnished the most important means of gaining access to the unconscious and disturbing complexes with which his symptoms were connected besides the dream analysis the patient furnished other means of revelation of his complexes his mannerisms and unconscious acts his opening remarks to his physician his emotional reactions to certain ideas in short the whole behaviour and verbal expressions of the individual reveal his inner nature and problems through all this work it became clear that in the emotional nature lay the origin not only of the various nervous illnesses themselves but also of the isolated symptoms and individual idiosyncrasies and peculiarities which are the part of all humanity and that the pathogenic cause of the disturbances lies not in the ignorance of individuals but in those inner resistances which are the underlying basis of this ignorance therefore the aim of the therapy became not merely the relief of the ignorance but the searching out and combating of these resistances it becomes evident from even this brief description of the analytic procedure that we are dealing with a very complex and delicate material and with a technique which needs to make definite use of all influences available for the help of the patient it has long been recognized that the relation established between physician and patient has a great effect upon the medical assistance which he is able to render in other words if a confidence and personal regard developed in the patient towards the physician the latter's advice was just so much more efficacious this personal feeling has been frankly recognized and made of distinct service in psychoanalytic treatment under the name of transference it is through the aid of this definite relationship which must be established in the one being analyzed towards the analyst that it is possible to deal with the unconscious and organized resistances which so easily blind the individual and rendered the acceptance of the new valuations very difficult to the raw and sensitive soul freud's emphasis upon the role of the sexual instinct in the production of the neurosis and also in its determining power upon the personality of the normal individual does not imply that he does not also recognize other determinants at the root of human conduct as for instance the instinct for preservation of life and the ego principle itself but these motives are not so violently forbidden and repressed as the sexual impulse and therefore because of that repressive force and the strength of the impulse he considers this primary in its influence upon the human being the importance of this instinct upon human life is clearly revealed by the great place given to it under the name of love in art literature poetry romance and all beauty from the beginning of recorded time viewed in this light it cannot seem extraordinary that a difficulty or disturbance in this emotional field should produce such far-reaching consequences for the individual the sexual impulse is often compared with that of hunger and this craving and need lying in all humanity is called by freud 
libido end of section one section two of psychology of the unconscious by carl jung this librivox recording is in the public domain section two the oedipus problem with further investigations into the nature of the repressed complexes a very astonishing situation was revealed the parental influence on children is something so well recognized and understood that to call attention to it sounds much like a banality however here an extraordinary discovery was made for in tracing out the feelings and emotions of adults it became evident that this influence was paramount not only for children but for adults as well that the entire direction of lives was largely determined quite unconsciously by the parental associations and that although adults the emotional side of their nature was still infantile in type and demanded unconsciously the infantile or childish relations freud traces out the commencement of the infantile attachment for the parents in this wise in the beginning the child derives its first satisfaction and pleasure from the mother in the form of nutrition and care for its wants in this first act of suckling freud sees already a kind of sexual pleasure for he apparently identifies the pleasure principle and the sexual instinct and considers that the former is primarily rooted in the latter at this early time commence such various infantile actions unconnected with nutrition as thumb-sucking various movements of the body as rubbing boring pulling and other manifestations of a definite interest in its own body a delight in nakedness the pleasure exhibited in inflicting pain on some object and its opposite the pleasure from receiving pain all of these afford the child pleasure and satisfaction and because they seem analogous to certain perversions in adults they are called by freud the polymorphous perverse sexuality of childhood the character of these instinctive actions which have nothing to do with any other person and through which the child attains pleasure from its own body caused freud to term this phase of life as autoerotic after havelock ellis however with the growth of the child there is a parallel development of the psychic elements of its sexual nature and now the mother the original object of its love primarily determined by its helplessness and need acquires a new valuation the beginnings of the need for a love object to satisfy the craving or libido of the child are early in evidence and following along sex lines in general the little son prefers the mother and the daughter the father after the usual preference of the parents at this early time children feel deeply the enormous importance of their parents and their entire world is bounded by the family circle all the elements of the ego which the child possesses have now become manifest love jealousy curiosity hate etc and those instincts are directed in the greatest degree towards the objects of their libido namely the parents with the growing ego of the child there is a development of strong wishes and desires demanding satisfaction which can only be gratified by the mother therefore there is aroused in the small son the feeling of jealousy and anger towards the father in whom he sees a rival for the affection of the mother and whom he would like to replace this desire in the soul of the child for it calls the oedipus complex in recognition of its analogy to the tragedy of king oedipus who was drawn by his fate to kill his father and win his mother for a wife freud presents this as the nuclear complex of every neurosis at the basis of this complex some trace of which can be found in every person freud sees a definite incest wish towards the mother which only lacks the quality of consciousness because of moral reactions this wish is quickly subjected to repression through the operation of the incest barrier a postulate he compares to the incest taboo found among inferior peoples at this time the child is beginning to develop its typical sexual curiosity expressed in the question where do i come from the interest and investigation of the child into this problem 
aided by observations and deductions from various actions and attitudes of the parents who have no idea of the watchfulness of the child lead him because of his imperfect knowledge and immature development into many false theories and ideas of birth these infantile sexual theories are held by freud to be determinative in the development of the child's character and also for the contents of the unconscious as expressed in a future neurosis these various reactions of the child and his sexual curiosity are entirely normal and unavoidable and if his development proceeds in an orderly fashion then at the time of definite object choice he will pass smoothly over from the limitations of the family attachment out into the world and find therein his independent existence however if the libido remains fixed on the first chosen object so that the growing individual is unable to tear himself loose from these familial ties then the incestuous bond is deepened with the developing sexual instinct and its accompanying need of a love object and the entire future of the young personality endangered for with the development of the incestuous bond the natural repressions deepen because the moral censor cannot allow these disturbing relations to become clear to the individual therefore the whole matter is repressed more deeply into the unconscious and even a feeling of positive enmity and repulsion towards the parents is often developed in order to conceal and overcompensate for the impossible situation actually present this persistence of the attachment of the libido to the original object and the inability to find in this a suitable satisfaction for the adult need interferes with the normal development of the psychosexual character and it is due to this that the adult retains that infantilism of sexuality which plays so great a role in determining the instability of the emotional life which so frequently leads into the definite neuroses these were the conclusions reached and the ground on which freudian psychology rested regarding the etiology of the neurosis and the tendencies underlying normal human mechanisms when dr carl jung the most prominent of freud's disciples and the leader of the zurich school found himself no longer able to agree with freud's findings in certain particulars although the phenomena which freud observed and the technique of psychoanalysis developed by freud were the material on which jung worked and the value of which he clearly emphasizes the differences which have developed lay in his understanding and interpretation of the phenomena observed beginning with the conception of libido itself as a term used to connote sexual hunger and craving albeit the meaning of the word sexual was extended by freud to embrace a much wider significance than common usage has assigned it jung was unable to confine himself to this limitation he conceived this longing this urge or push of life as something extending beyond sexuality even in its wider sense he saw in the term libido a concept of unknown nature comparable to bergson's elan vital a hypothetical energy of life which occupies itself not only in sexuality but in various physiological and psychological manifestations such as growth development hunger and all the human activities and interests this cosmic energy or urge manifested in the human being he calls libido and compares it with the energy of physics although recognizing in common with freud as well as with many others the primal instinct of reproduction as the basis of many functions and present-day activities of mankind no longer sexual in character he repudiates the idea of still calling them sexual even though their development was a growth originally out of the sexual sexuality in its various manifestations jung sees as most important channels occupied by libido but not the exclusive ones through which libido flows this is an energetic concept of life and from this viewpoint this hypothetical energy of life or libido is a living power used instinctively by man in all the automatic processes of his functioning such very processes being but different manifestations of this energy by virtue of its quality of mobility and change man through his understanding and intelligence has the power consciously to direct and use his libido in definite and desired ways in this conception of jung will be seen an analogy to bergson who speaks of this change this movement and becoming this self-creation call it what you will as the very stuff and reality of our being in developing the energetic conception of libido and separating it from freud's sexual definition 
jung makes possible the explanation of interest in general and provides a working concept by which not only the specifically sexual but the general activities and reactions of man can be understood if a person complains of no longer having interest in his work or of losing interest in his surroundings then one understands that his libido is withdrawn from this object and that in consequence the object itself seems no longer attractive whereas as a matter of fact the object itself is exactly the same as formerly in other words it is the libido that we bestow upon an object that makes it attractive and interesting the causes for the withdrawal of libido may be various and are usually quite different from those that the persons offer in explanation it is the task of psychoanalysis to discover the real reasons which are usually hidden and unknown on the other hand when an individual exhibits an exaggerated interest or places an overemphasis upon an idea or situation then we know there is too much libido here and that we may find as a consequence a corresponding depletion elsewhere this leads directly into the second point of difference between jung's views and those of freud this is concerned with those practically universal childish manifestations of sexuality called by freud polymorphous perverse because of their similarity to those abnormalities of sexuality which occur in adults and are called perversions jung takes exception to this viewpoint he sees in the various manifestations of childhood the precursors or forerunners of the later fully developed sexuality and instead of considering them perverse he considers them preliminary expressions of sexual colouring he divides human life into three stages the first stage up to about the third or fourth year generally speaking he calls the pre-sexual stage for there he sees the libido or life energy occupied chiefly in the function of nutrition and growth and he draws an analogy between this period and that of the caterpillar stage of the butterfly the second stage includes the years from this time until puberty and this he speaks of as the pre-pubertal stage the third period is that from puberty onward and can be considered the time of maturity it is in the earliest stage the period of which varies greatly in different individuals that are fully inaugurated those various manifestations which have so marked a sexual colouring that there can be no question of their relationship although at that time sexuality in the adult meaning of the word does not exist jung explains the polymorphism of these phenomena as arising from a gradual movement of the libido from exclusive service in the function of nutrition into new avenues which successively open up with the development of the child until the final inauguration of the sexual function proper at puberty normally these childish bad habits are gradually relinquished until the libido is entirely withdrawn from these immature phases and with the ushering in of puberty for the first time appears in the form of an undifferentiated sexual primitive power clearly forcing the individual towards division budding etc however if in the course of its movement from the function of nutrition to the sexual function the libido is arrested or retarded at any phase then a fixation may result creating a disturbance in the harmony of the normal development for although the libido is retarded and remains clinging to some childish manifestation time goes on and the physical growth of the child does not stand still soon a great contrast is created between the infantile manifestations of the emotional life and the needs of the more adult individual and the foundation is thus prepared for either the development of a definite neurosis or else for those weaknesses of character or symptomatic disturbances which are not sufficiently serious to be called a neurosis one of the most active and important forms of childish libido occupation is in fantasy making the child's world is one of imagery and make-believe where he can create for himself that satisfaction and enjoyment which the world of reality so often denies as the child grows and real demands of life are made upon him it becomes increasingly necessary that his libido be taken away from his fantastic world and used for the required adaptation to reality needed by his age and condition until finally for the adult the freedom of the whole libido is necessary to meet the biological and cultural demands of life instead of thus employing the libido in the real world however certain people never relinquish the seeking for satisfaction in the shadowy world of fantasy and even though they make certain attempts at adaptation they are halted and discouraged by every difficulty and obstacle in the path of life and are easily pulled back into their inner psychic world this condition is called a state of introversion it is concerned with the past and the reminiscences which belong thereto situations and experiences which should have been completed and finished long ago are still dwelt upon and lived with 
images and matters which were once important but which normally have no significance for their later age are still actively influencing their present lives the nature and character of these fantasy products are legion and are easily recognized in the emotional attitudes and pretensions the childish delusions and exaggerations the prejudices and inconsistencies which people express in manifold forms the actual situation is inadequately faced small matters are reacted towards in an exaggerated manner or else a frivolous attitude is maintained where real seriousness is demanded in other words there is clearly manifested an inadequate psychic adaptation towards reality which is quite to be expected from the child but which is very discordant in the adult the most important of these past influences is that of the parents because they are the first objects of the developing childish love and afford the first satisfaction and pleasure to the child they become the models for all succeeding efforts as freud has worked out this he called the nuclear or root complex because this influence was so powerful it seemed to be the determining factor in all later difficulties in the life of the individual in this phase of the problem lies the third great difference between jung's interpretation of the absurd phenomena and that of freud jung definitely recognizes that there are many neurotic persons who clearly exhibited in their childhood the same neurotic tendencies that are later exaggerated also that an almost overwhelming effect on the destiny of these children is exercised by the influence of the parents the frequent over-anxiety or tenderness the lack of sympathy or understanding in other words the complexes of the parent reacting upon the child and producing in him love admiration fear distrust hate revolt the greater the sensitiveness and impressionability of the child the more he will be stamped with the familial environment and the more he will unconsciously seek to find again in the world of reality the model of his own small world with all the pleasures and satisfactions or disappointments and unhappinesses with which it was filled this condition to be sure is not a recognized or a conscious one for the individual may think himself perfectly free from this past influence because he is living in the real world and because actually there is a great difference between the present conditions and that of his childish past he sees all this intellectually but there is a wide gap between the intellectual grasp of a situation and the emotional development and it is the latter realm wherein lies the disharmony however although many ideas and feelings are connected with the parents analysis reveals very often that they are only subjective and that in reality they bear little resemblance to the actual past situation therefore jung speaks no longer of the real father and mother but he uses the term imago or image to represent the father or mother because the feelings and fantasies frequently do not deal with the real parents but with the distorted and subjective image created by the imagination of the individual following this distinction jung sees in the oedipus complex of freud only a symbol for the childish desire towards the parents and for the conflict which this craving evokes and cannot accept the theory that in this early stage of childhood the mother has any real sexual significance for the child the demands of the child upon the mother the jealousy so often exhibited are at first connected with the role of the mother as protector caretaker and supplier of nutritive wants and only later with the germinating eroticism does the child's love become admixed with the developing sexual quality the chief love objects are still the parents and he naturally continues to seek and to find in them satisfaction for all his desires in this way the typical conflict is developed which in the son is directed towards the father and in the daughter towards the mother this jealousy of the daughter towards the mother is called the electro complex from the myth of electra who took revenge on her mother for the murder of the husband because she was in this way deprived of her father normally as puberty is attained the child gradually becomes more or less freed from his parents and upon the degree in which this is accomplished depends his health and future well-being this demand of nature upon the young individual to free himself from the bonds of his childish dependency and to find in the world of reality his independent existence is so imperious and dominating that it frequently produces in the child the greatest struggles and severest conflicts the period being characterized symbolically as a self-sacrifice by jung it frequently happens that the young person is so closely bound in the family relations that it is only with the greatest difficulty that he can attain any measure of freedom and then only very imperfectly so that the libido sexualis can only express itself 
in certain feelings and fantasies which clearly reveal the existence of the complex until then entirely hidden and unrealized now commences the secondary struggle against the unfilial and immoral feelings with a consequent development of intense resistances expressing themselves in irritation anger revolt and antagonism against the parents or else in an especially tender submissive and yielding attitude which overcompensates for the rebellion and reaction held within this struggle and conflict gives rise to the unconscious fantasy of self-sacrifice which really means the sacrificing of the childish tendencies and love type in order to free libido for his nature demands that he attain the capacity for the accomplishment of his own personal fulfilment the satisfaction of which belongs to the developed man and woman this conception has been worked out in detail by jung in the book which is herein presented to english readers we now come to the most important of jung's conceptions in that it bears practically upon the treatment of certain types of the neuroses and stands theoretically in direct opposition to freud's hypothesis while recognizing fully the influence of the parents and of the sexual constitution of the child jung refuses to see in this infantile past the real cause for the later development of the illness he definitely places the cause of the pathogenic conflict in the present moment and considers that in seeking for the cause in the distant past one is only following the desire of the patient which is to withdraw himself as much as possible from the present important period the conflict is produced by some important task or duty which is essentially biologically and practically for the fulfilment of the ego of the individual but before which an obstacle arises from which he shrinks and thus halted cannot go on with this interference in the path of progression libido is stored up and a regression takes place whereby there occurs a reanimation of past ways of libido occupation which were entirely normal to the child but which for the adult are no longer of value these regressive infantile desires and fantasies now alive and striving for satisfaction are converted into symptoms and in these surrogate forms obtain a certain gratification thus creating the external manifestations of the neurosis therefore jung does not ask from what psychic experience or point of fixation in childhood the patient is suffering but what is the present duty or task he is avoiding or what obstacle in his life's path he is unable to overcome what is the cause of his regression to past psychic experiences following this theory jung expresses the view that the elaborate fantasies and dreams produced by these patients are really forms of compensation or artificial substitutes for the unfulfilled adaptation to reality the sexual content of these fantasies and dreams is only apparently and not actually expressive of a real sexual desire or incest wish but is a regressive employment of sexual forms to symbolically express a present-day need when the attainment of the present ego demand seems too difficult or impossible and no adaptation is made to what is possible for the individual's capability with this statement jung throws a new light on the work of analytic psychology and on the conception of the neurotic symptoms and renders possible of understanding the many apparent incongruities and conflicting observations which have been so disturbing to the critics it now becomes proper to ask what has been established by all this mass of investigation into the soul and what is its value not only as a therapeutic measure for the neurotic sufferer but also for the normal human being first and perhaps most important is the recognition of a definite psychological determinism instead of human life being filled with foolish meaningless or purposeless actions errors and thoughts it can be demonstrated that no expression or manifestation of the psyche however trifling or inconsistent in appearance is really lawless or unmotivated only a possession of the technique is necessary in order to reveal to any one desirous of knowing the existence of the unconscious determinants of his mannerisms trivial expressions acts and behaviour their purpose and significance this leads into the second fundamental conception which is perhaps even less considered than the foregoing and that is the relative value of the conscious mind and thought it is the general attitude of people to judge themselves by their surface motives to satisfy themselves by saying or thinking this is what i want to do or say or i intended to do thus and so but somehow what one thought what intended to say or expected to do is very often the contrary of what actually is said or done every one has had these experiences 
when the gap between the conscious thought and action was gross enough to be observed it is also a well-known experience to consciously desire something very much and when it is obtained to discover that this in no wise satisfied or lessened the desire which was then transferred to some other object thus one became cognizant of the fact that the feeling and idea presented by consciousness as the desire was an error what is the difficulty in these conditions evidently some other directing force than that of which we are aware is at work dr g stanley hall uses a very striking symbol when he compares the mind to an iceberg floating in the ocean with one eighth visible above the water and seven eighths below the one eighth above being that part called conscious and the seven eighths below that which we call the unconscious the influence and controlling power of their unconscious desires over our thoughts and acts are in this relative proportion faint glimmers of other motives and interests than those we accept or which we believe often flit into consciousness these indications if studied or valued accurately would lead to the realization that consciousness is but a single stage and but one form of expression of mind therefore its dictum is but one often untrustworthy approach to the great question as to what is man's actual psychic accomplishment and as to what in particular is the actual soul development of the individual a further contribution of equal importance has been the empiric development of a dynamic theory of life the conception that life is in a state of flux movement leading either to construction or destruction through the development man has reached he has attained the power by means of his intelligence and understanding of definitely directing to a certain extent this life energy or libido into avenues which serve his interest and bring a real satisfaction for the present day when man through ignorance and certain inherent tendencies fails to recognize his needs or his power to fulfil them or to adapt himself to the conditions of reality of the present time there is then produced that reanimation of infantile paths by which an attempt is made to gain fulfilment or satisfaction through the production of symptoms or attitudes the acceptance of these statements demands the recognition of the existence of an infantile sexuality and the large part played by it in the later life of the individual because of the power and imperious influence exerted by the parents upon the child and because of the unconscious attachment of his libido to the original object the mother and the perseverance of this first love model in the psyche he finds it very difficult on reaching the stage of adult development and the time for seeking a love object outside of the family to gain a satisfactory model it is exceedingly important for parents and teachers to recognize the requirements of nature which beginning with puberty imperiously demand of the young individual a separation of himself from the parent stem and the development of an independent existence in our complex modern civilization this demand of nature is difficult enough of achievement for the child who has the heartiest and most intelligent cooperation of his parents and environment but for the one who has not only to contend with his own inner struggle for his freedom but has in addition the resistance of his parents who would hold him in his childhood at any cost because they cannot endure the thought of his separation from them the task becomes one of the greatest magnitude it is during this period when the struggle between the childish inertia and nature's urge becomes so keen that there occur the striking manifestations of jealousy criticism irritability all usually directed against the parents of defiance of parental authority of runaways and various other psychic and nervous disorders known to all this struggle which is the first great task of mankind and the one which requires the greatest effort is that which is expressed by hume as the self-sacrifice motive the sacrifice of the childish feelings and demands and of the irresponsibility of this period and the assumption of the duties and tasks of an individual existence it is this great theme which jung sees as the real motive lying hidden in the myths and religions of man from the beginning as well as in the literature and artistic creations of both ancient and modern time in which he works out with the greatest wealth of detail and painstaking effort in the book herewith presented this necessitates a recognition and revaluation of the enormous importance and influence of the ego and the sexual instinct upon the thought and reaction of man and also 
predicates a displacement of the psychological point of gravity from the will and intellect to the realm of the emotions and feelings the desired end is a synthesis of these two paths or the use of the intellect constructively in the service of the emotions in order to gain for the best interest of the individual some sort of cooperative reaction between the two no one dealing with analytic psychology can fail to be struck by the tremendous and unnecessary burdens which man has placed upon himself and how greatly he has increased the difficulties of adaptation by his rigid intellectual views and moral formulas and by his inability to admit to himself that he is actually just a human being imperfect and containing within himself all manner of tendencies good and bad all striving for some satisfactory goal further that the refusal to see himself in this light instead of as an ideal person in no way alters the actual condition and that in fact through the cheap pretence of being able only to consider himself as a very virtuous person or as shocked and hurt when observing the sins of others he actually is prevented from developing his own character and bringing his own capacities to their fullest expressions there is frequently expressed among people the idea of how fortunate it is that we cannot see each other's thoughts and how disturbing it would be if our real feelings could be read but what is so shameful in these secrets of the soul they are in reality our own egoistic desires all striving longing wishing for satisfaction for happiness those desires which instinctively crave their own gratification but which can only be really fulfilled by adapting them to the real world and to the social group why is it that it is so painful for man to admit that the prime influence in all human endeavour is found in the ego itself in its desires wishes needs and satisfactions in short in its need for self-expression and self-perpetuation the evolutionary impetus in life the basis for the unpleasantness of this idea may perhaps be found in an inner resistance in nature itself which forces man to include others in his scheme lest his own greedy desires should serve to destroy him but even with this inner demand in all the ethical and moral teachings of centuries it is everywhere evident that man has only very imperfectly learned that it is to his own interest to consider his neighbour and that it is impossible for him to ignore the needs of the body social of which he is a part externally the recognition of the strength of the ego impulse is objectionable because of the ideal conception that self-striving and so-called selfish seeking are unworthy ignoble and incompatible with a desirable character and must be ignored at all costs the futility of this attitude is to be clearly seen in the failure after all these centuries to even approximate it as evidenced in our human relations and institutions and is quite as ineffectual in this realm as in that of sexuality where the effort to overcome this imperious domination has been attempted by lowering the instinct and seeing in it something vile or unclean something unspeakable and unholy instead of destroying the power of sexuality this struggle has only warped and distorted injured and mutilated the expression for not without destruction of the individual can these fundamental instincts be destroyed life itself has needs and imperiously demands expression through the forms created all nature answers to this freely and simply except man his failure to recognize himself as an instrument through which the life energy is coursing and the demands of which must be obeyed is the cause of his misery despite his possession of intellect and self-consciousness he cannot without disaster to himself refuse the tasks of life and the fulfilment of his own needs man's great task is the adaptation of himself to reality and the recognition of himself as an instrument for the expression of life according to his individual possibilities it is in his privilege as a self-creator that his highest purpose is found the value of self-consciousness lies in the fact that man is enabled to reflect upon himself and learn to understand the true origin and significance of his actions and opinions that he may adequately value the real level of his development and avoid being self-deceived and therefore inhibited from finding his biological adaptation he need no longer be unconscious of the motives underlying his actions or hide himself behind a changed exterior in other words be merely a series of reactions to stimuli as the mechanists have it but he may to a certain extent become 
a self-creating and self-determining being indeed there seems to be an impulse towards adaptation quite as bergson sees it and it would seem to be a task of the highest order to use intelligence to assist one's self to work with this impulse through the investigation of these different avenues leading into the hidden depths of the human being and through the revelation of the motives and influences at work there although astonishing to the uninitiated a very clear and definite conception of the actual human relationship brotherhood of all mankind is obtained it is this recognition of these common factors basically inherent in humanity from the beginning and still active which is at once both the most hopeful and the most feared and disliked part of psychoanalysis it is disliked by those individuals who have prided themselves upon their superiority and the distinction between their reactions of motives and those of ordinary mankind in other words they attempt to become personalities through elevating themselves and lowering others and it is a distinct blow to discover that beneath these pretensions lie the very ordinary elements shared in common by all on the other hand to those who have been able to recognize their own weaknesses and have suffered in the privacy of their own souls the knowledge that these things have not set them apart from others but that they are the common property of all and that no one can point the finger of scorn at his fellow is one of the greatest experiences of life and is productive of the greatest relief it is feared by many who realize that in these painfully acquired repressions and symptoms lie their safety and their protection from directly facing and dealing with tendencies and characteristics with which they feel unable to cope the repression and the accompanying symptoms indicate a difficulty and a struggle and in this way are a sort of compromise or substitute formation which permit although only in a wasteful and futile manner the activity of the repressed tendencies nevertheless to analyze the individual back to his original tendencies and reveal to him the meaning of these substitute formations would be a useless procedure in which truly the last state of that man would be worse than the first if the work ceased there the aim is not to destroy those barriers upon which civilized man has so painfully climbed and to reduce him to his primitive state but where these have failed or imperfectly succeeded to help him to attain his greatest possibilities with less expenditure of energy by less wasteful methods than nature provides in this achievement lies the hopeful and valuable side of this method the development of the synthesis it is hopeful because now a way is opened to deal with these primitive tendencies constructively and render their effects not only harmless but useful by utilizing them in higher aims socially and individually valuable and satisfactory this is what has occurred normally in those individuals who seem capable and constructive personalities in those creative minds that give so much to the race they have converted certain psychological tendencies which could have produced useless symptoms or destructive actions into valuable productions indeed it is not uncommon for strong capable persons to state themselves that they knew they could have been equally capable of a wasteful or destructive life this utilization of the energy or libido freed by removing the repressions and the lifting of infantile tendencies and desires into higher purposes and directions suitable for the individual at his present status is called sublimation it must not be understood by this discussion that geniuses or wonderful personalities can be created through analysis for this is not the aim of the procedure its purpose is to remove the inhibitions and restrictions which interfere with the full development of the personality to help individuals attain to that level where they really belong and to prepare people to better understand and meet life whether they are neurotic sufferers or so-called normal people with the difficulties and peculiarities which belong to all this reasoning and method of procedure is only new when the application is made to the human being in all improvements of plants and animals these general principles have been recognized and their teachings constructively utilized luther burbank that plant wizard whose work is known to all the world says a knowledge of the battle of the tendencies within a plant is the very basis of all plant improvement and it is not that the work of plant improvement brings with it incidentally as people mistakenly think a knowledge of these forces it is the knowledge of these forces rather which makes plant improvement possible has this not been also the mistake of man regarding himself and the cause partly at least of his failure to succeed in actually reaching a more advanced and stable development 
this recognition of man's biological relationship to all life and the practical utilization of this recognition necessitates a readjustment of thought and asks for an examination and reconsideration of the facts of human conduct which are observable by any thoughtful person a quiet and progressive upheaval of old ideas has taken place and is still going on analytic psychology attempts to unify and value all of the various phenomena of man which have been observed and noted at different times by isolated investigators of isolated manifestations and thus brings some orderly sequence into the whole it offers a method whereby the relations of the human being biologically to all other living forms can be established the actual achievement of man himself adequately valued and opens a vista of the possibilities of improvement in health happiness and accomplishment for the human being beatrice m hinkle end of section two section three of psychology of the unconscious by carl jung this librivox recording is in the public domain section three authors introductories authors note my task in this work has been to investigate an individual fantasy system and in the doing of it problems of such magnitude have been uncovered that my endeavour to grasp them in their entirety has necessarily meant only a superficial orientation toward those paths the opening and exploration of which may possibly crown the work of future investigators with success i am not in sympathy with the attitude which favours the repression of certain possible working hypotheses because they are perhaps erroneous and so may possess no lasting value certainly i endeavoured as far as possible to guard myself from error which might indeed become especially dangerous upon these dizzy heights for i am entirely aware of the risks of these investigations however i do not consider scientific work as a dogmatic contest but rather as a work done for the increase and deepening of knowledge this contribution is addressed to those having similar ideas concerning science in conclusion i must render thanks to those who have assisted my endeavours with valuable aid especially my dear wife and my friends to whose disinterested assistance i am deeply indebted zurich c g jung quotation from guglielmo ferrero therefore theory which gives to facts their value and significance is often very useful even if it is partially false for it throws light on phenomena which no one observed it forces an examination from many angles of facts which no one had hitherto studied and it gives the impulse for more extended and more productive researches it is therefore a moral duty for the man of science to expose himself to the risk of committing error and to submit to criticism in order that science may continue to progress a writer has attacked the author for this very severely saying here is a scientific ideal very limited and very paltry but those who are endowed with a mind sufficiently serious and impersonal as not to believe that all that they write is the expression of truth absolute and eternal approve of this theory which places the aims of science well above the miserable vanity and paltry amour popre of the scientist guglielmo ferrero les lois psychologiques du symbolisme eighteen ninety five preface page eight part one introduction any one who can read freud's interpretation of the dream without scientific rebellion at the newness and apparently unjustified daring of its analytical presentation and without moral indignation at the astonishing nudity of the dream interpretation and who can allow this unusual array of facts to influence his mind calmly and without prejudice will surely be deeply impressed at that place where freud calls to mind the fact that an individual psychologic conflict namely the incest fantasy is the essential root of that powerful ancient dramatic material the oedipus legend the impression made by this simple reference may be likened to that wholly peculiar feeling which arises in us if for example in the noise and tumult of a modern street we should come across an ancient relic the corinthian capital of a walled-in column or a fragment of inscription 
just a moment ago we were given over to the noisy ephemeral life of the present when something very far away and strange appears to us which turns our attention to things of another order a glimpse away from the incoherent multiplicity of the present to a higher coherence in history very likely it would suddenly occur to us that on this spot where we now run busily to and fro a similar life and activity prevailed two thousand years ago in somewhat other forms similar passions moved mankind and man was likewise convinced of the uniqueness of his existence i would liken the impression which the first acquaintance with the monuments of antiquity so easily leaves behind to that impression which freud's reference to the oedipus legend makes for while we are still engaged with the confusing impressions of the variability of the individual soul suddenly there is opened a revelation of the simple greatness of the oedipus tragedy that never extinguished light of the grecian theatre this breadth of outlook carries in itself something of revelation for us the ancient psychology has long since been buried among the shadows of the past in the schoolroom one could scarcely repress a sceptical smile when one indiscreetly reckoned the comfortable matronly age of penelope and the age of jocasta and comically compared the result of the reckoning with the tragic erotic struggles in the legend and drama we did not know at that time and who knows even to-day that the mother can be the all-consuming passion of the son which perhaps undermines his whole life and tragically destroys it so that not even the magnitude of the oedipus fate seems one jot overdrawn rare and pathologically understood cases like ninon de l'enclos and her son lie too far removed from most of us to give a living impression but when we follow the paths traced out by freud we arrive at a recognition of the present existence of such possibilities which although they are too weak to enforce incest are still strong enough to cause disturbances of considerable magnitude in the soul the admission of such possibilities to one's self does not occur without a great burst of moral revulsion resistances arise which only too easily dazzle the intellect and through that make knowledge of self impossible whenever we succeed however in stripping feelings from more scientific knowledge than that abyss which separates our age from the antique is bridged and with astonishment we see that oedipus is still a living thing for us the importance of such an impression should not be undervalued we are taught by this insight that there is an identity of elementary human conflicts existing independent of time and place that which affected the greeks with horror still remains true but it is true for us only when we give up a vain illusion that we are different that is to say more moral than the ancients we of the present day have nearly succeeded in forgetting that an indissoluble common bond binds us to the people of antiquity with this truth a path is open to the understanding of the ancient mind an understanding which so far has not existed and on one side leads to an inner sympathy and on the other side to an intellectual comprehension through buried strata of the individual soul we come indirectly into possession of the living mind of the ancient culture and just precisely through that do we win that stable point of view outside our own culture from which for the first time an objective understanding of their mechanisms would be possible at least that is the hope which we get from the rediscovery of the oedipus problem the inquiry made possible by freud's work has already resulted fruitfully we are indebted to this stimulation of four bold attacks upon the territory of the history of the human mind there are the works of ricklin abraham rank meter jones recently silberer has joined their ranks with a beautiful investigation entitled fantasy und mythus we are indebted to pfister for a comprehensive work which cannot be overlooked here and which is of much importance for christian religious psychology the leading purpose of these works is the unlocking of historical problems through the application of psychoanalytic knowledge that is to say knowledge drawn from the activity of the modern unconscious mind concerning specific historical material i must refer the reader entirely to the specified works in order that he may gain information concerning the extent and the kind of insight 
which has already been obtained the explanations are in many cases dubious and particulars nevertheless this detracts in no way from the total result it would be significant enough if only the far-reaching analogy between the psychologic structure of the historical relics and the structure of the recent individual psychologic products alone were demonstrated this proof is possible of attainment for every intelligent person through the work done up to this time the analogy prevails especially in symbolism as Ricklin, rank meter and abraham have pointed out with illuminating examples it is also shown in the individual mechanisms of unconscious work that is to say in repression condensation etc as abraham explicitly shows up to the present time the psychoanalytic investigator has turned his interest chiefly to the analysis of the individual psychologic problems it seems to me however that in the present state of affairs there is a more or less imperative demand for the psychoanalyst to broaden the analysis of the individual problems by a comparative study of historical material relating to them just as freud has already done in a masterly manner in his book on leonardo da vinci for just as the psychoanalytic conceptions promote understanding of the historic psychologic creations so reversedly historical materials can shed new light upon individual psychologic problems these and similar considerations have caused me to turn my attention somewhat more to the historical in the hope that out of this new insight into the foundations of individual psychology might be won End of section three section four of psychology of the unconscious by carl jung this librivox recording is in the public domain section four chapter one part one concerning the two kinds of thinking it is a well-known fact that one of the principles of analytic psychology is that the dream images are to be understood symbolically that is to say that they are not to be taken literally just as they are presented in sleep but that behind them a hidden meaning has to be surmised it is this ancient idea of a dream symbolism which has challenged not only criticism but in addition to that the strongest opposition that dreams may be full of import and therefore something to be interpreted is certainly neither a strange nor an extraordinary idea this has been familiar to mankind for thousands of years and therefore seems much like a banal truth the dream interpretations of the egyptians and chaldeans and the story of joseph who interpreted pharaoh's dreams are known to every one and the dream book of artemidorus is also familiar from countless inscribed monuments of all times and peoples we learn of foreboding dreams of significant of prophetic and also of curative dreams which the deity sent to the sick sleeping in the temple we know the dream of the mother of augustus who dreamt she was to be with child by the deity transformed into a snake we will not heap up references and examples to bear witness to the existence of a belief in the symbolism of dreams when an idea is so old and is so generally believed it is probably true in some way and indeed as is mostly the case is not literally true but is true psychologically in this distinction lies the reason why the old fogies of science have from time to time thrown away an inherited piece of ancient truth because it was not literal but psychologic truth for such discrimination this type of person has at no time had any comprehension from our experience it is hardly conceivable that a god existing outside of ourselves causes dreams or that the dream ao ipso foresees the future prophetically when we translate this into the psychologic however then the ancient theories sound much more reconcilable namely the dream arises from a part of the mind unknown to us but none the less important and is concerned with the desires for the approaching day this psychologic formula derived from the ancient superstitious conception of dreams 
is so to speak exactly identified with the freudian psychology which assumes a rising wish from the unconscious to be the source of the dream as the old belief teaches the deity or the demon speaks in symbolic speech to the sleeper and the dream interpreter has the riddle to solve in modern speech we say this means that the dream is a series of images which are apparently contradictory and nonsensical but arise in reality from psychologic material which yields a clear meaning were i to suppose among my readers a far-reaching ignorance of dream analysis then i should be obliged to illustrate this statement with numerous examples to-day however these things are quite well known so that one must proceed carefully with everyday dream material out of consideration for a public educated in these matters it is a special inconvenience that no dream can be recounted without being obliged to add to it half a life's history which affords the individual foundations of the dream but there are some few typical dreams which can be told without too great a ballast one of these is the dream of the sexual assault which is especially prevalent among women a girl sleeping after an evening happily spent in dancing dreams that a robber breaks open her door noisily and stabs through her body with a lance this theme which explains itself has countless variations some simple some complicated instead of the lance it is a sword a dagger a revolver a gun a cannon a hydrant a watering-pot or the assault is a burglary a pursuit a robbery or it is some one hidden in the closet or under the bed or the danger may be illustrated by wild animals for instance a horse which throws the dreamer to the ground and kicks her in the body with his hind foot lions tigers elephants with threatening trunks and finally snakes in endless variety sometimes the snake creeps into the mouth sometimes it bites the breast like cleopatra's legendary asp sometimes it comes in the role of the paradisiacal snake or in the variations of franz stuck whose pictures of snakes bear the significant titles vice sin lust the mixture of lust and anxiety is expressed incomparably in the very atmosphere of these pictures and far more brutally indeed than in murica's charming poem the maiden's first love song what's in the net behold but i am afraid do i grasp a sweet eel do i seize a snake love is a blind fisherwoman tell the child where to seize already it leaps in my hands o oh, pity or delight with nestlings and turnings it coils on my breast it bites me o oh, wonder boldly through the skin it darts under my heart o oh, love i shudder what can i do what can i begin that shuddering thing there it crackles within and coils in a ring it must be poisoned here it crawls around blissfully i feel as it worms itself into my soul and kills me finally all these things are simple and need no explanation to be intelligible somewhat more complicated but still unmistakable is the dream of a woman she sees the triumphal arch of constantine a cannon stands before it to the right of it a bird to the left a man a shot flashes out of the tube the projectile hits her it goes into her pocket into her purse there it remains and she holds her purse as if something very precious were in it the image disappears and she continues to see only the stock of the cannon and over that constantine's motto in hoc signo winkus these few references to the symbolic nature of dreams are perhaps sufficient for whomsoever the proof may appear insufficient and it is certainly insufficient for a beginner further evidence may be found in the fundamental work of freud and in the works of steckel and ronck which are fuller in certain particulars we must assume here that the dream symbolism is an established fact in order to bring to our study a mind suitably prepared for an appreciation of this work we would not be successful if we on the contrary were to be astonished at the idea that an intellectual image can be projected into our conscious psychic activity an image which apparently obeys such wholly other laws and purposes than those governing the conscious psychic product why are dreams symbolic every why in psychology is divided into two separate questions first for what purpose are dreams symbolic we will answer this question only to abandon it at once dreams are symbolic in order that they cannot be understood 
in order that their wish which is the source of the dream may remain unknown the question why this is so and not otherwise leads us out into the far-reaching experiences and trains of thought of the freudian psychology here the second question interests us viz how is it that dreams are symbolic that is to say from where does this capacity for symbolic representation come of which we in our conscious daily life can discover apparently no traces let us examine this more closely can we really discover nothing symbolic in our everyday thought let us follow our trains of thought let us take an example we think of the war of eighteen seventy and eighteen seventy one we think about a series of bloody battles the siege of strasbourg belfort paris the treaty of peace the foundation of the german empire and so on how have we been thinking we start with an idea or super idea as it is also called and without thinking of it but each time merely guided by a feeling of direction we think about individual reminiscences of the war in this we can find nothing symbolic and our whole conscious thinking proceeds according to this type if we observe our thinking very narrowly and follow an intensive train of thought as for example the solution of a difficult problem then suddenly we notice that we are thinking in words that in wholly intensive thinking we begin to speak to ourselves or that we occasionally write down the problem or make a drawing of it so as to be absolutely clear it must certainly have happened to any one who has lived for some time in a foreign country that after a certain period he has begun to think in the language of the country a very intensive train of thinking works itself out more or less in word form that is if one wants to express it to teach it or to convince any one of it evidently it directs itself wholly to the outside world to this extent this directed or logical thinking is a reality thinking having a real existence for us that is to say a thinking which adjusts itself to actual conditions where we expressed in other words imitate the succession of objectively real things so that the images in our mind follow after each other in the same strictly causal succession as the historical events outside of our mind we call this thinking thinking with directed attention it has in addition the peculiarity that one is tired by it and that on this account it is set into action only for a time our whole vital accomplishment which is so expensive is adaptation to environment a part of it is the directed thinking which biologically expressed is nothing but a process of psychic assimilation which as in every vital accomplishment leaves behind a corresponding exhaustion the material with which we think is language and speech concept a thing which has been used from time immemorial as something external a bridge for thought and which has a single purpose that of communication as long as we think directedly we think for others and speak to others speech is originally a system of emotional and imitative sounds sounds which express terror fear anger love and sounds which imitate the noises of the elements the rushing and gurgling of water the rolling of thunder the tumults of the winds the tones of the animal world and so on and finally those which represent a combination of the sounds of perception and of effective reaction likewise in the more or less modern languages large quantities of onomatopoetic relics are retained for example sounds for the movement of waters rauschen rislin ruschen rinnen rennen to rush rosella rousseau river rhine wasser bissen bissen pissen pisses fisk thus language is originally and essentially nothing but a system of signs or symbols which denote real occurrences or their echo in the human soul therefore one must decidedly agree with anatole france when he says what is thought and how do we think we think with words that alone is sensual and brings us back to nature think of it the metaphysician has only the perfected cry of monkeys and dogs with which to construct the system of the world that which he calls profound speculation and transcendent method is to put end to end in an arbitrary order the natural sounds which cry out hunger fear and love in the primitive force and to which were attached little by little the meanings which one believed to be abstract when they were only crude do not fear that the succession of small cries feeble and stifled which compose a book of philosophy will teach us so much regarding the universe that we can live in it no longer 
thus is our directed thinking and even if we were the loneliest and furthest removed from our fellows this thinking is nothing but the first notes of a long drawn-out call to our companions that water had been found that we had killed the bear that a storm was approaching or that wolves were prowling around the camp a striking paradox of abbe lard's which expresses in a very intuitive way the whole human limitation of our complicated thinking process reads sermo generatur ab intellectu et generat intellectum speech is generated by the intellect and in turn generates intellect any system of philosophy no matter how abstract represents in means and purpose nothing more than an extremely cleverly developed combination of original nature sounds hence arises the desire of a schopenhauer or a nietzsche for recognition and understanding and the despair and bitterness of their loneliness one might expect perhaps that a man full of genius could pasture in the greatness of his own thoughts and renounce the cheap approbation of the crowd which he despises yet he succumbs to the more powerful impulse of the herd instinct his searching and his finding his call belong to the herd when i said just now that directed thinking is properly a thinking with words and quoted that clever testimony of anatole france as drastic proof of it a misunderstanding might easily arise namely that directed thinking is really only word that certainly would go too far language should however be comprehended in a wider sense than that of speech which is in itself only the expression of the formulated thought which is capable of being communicated in the widest sense otherwise the deaf-mute would be limited to the utmost in his capacity for thinking which is not the case in reality without any knowledge of the spoken word he has his language this language considered from the standpoint of history or in other words directed thinking is here a descendant of the primitive words as for instance wundt expresses it a further important result of that cooperation of sound and sign interchange consists in the fact that very many words gradually lose altogether their original concrete thought meaning and turn into signs for general ideas and for the expression of the apperceptive functions of relation and comparison and their products in this manner abstract thought develops which because it would not be possible without the change of meaning lying at the root of it is indeed a production of that psychic and psychophysical reciprocal action out of which the development of language takes place yodel denies the identity of language and thought because for one reason one and the same psychic fact might be expressed in different languages in different ways from that he draws the conclusion that a super language thinking exists certainly there is such a thing whether with erdmann one considers it hypologisch or with yodel as super language only this is not logical thinking my conception of it agrees with the noteworthy contribution made by baldwin which i will quote here word for word the transmission from prejudgmental to judgmental meaning is just that from knowledge which has social confirmation to that which gets along without it the meanings utilized for judgment are those already developed in their presuppositions and applications through the confirmation of social intercourse thus the personal judgment trained in the methods of social rendering and disciplined by the interaction of its social world projects its content into that world again in other words the platform for all movement into the assertion of individual judgment the level from which new experience is utilized is already and always socialized and it is just this movement that we find reflected in the actual results as the sense of the appropriateness or synonymic character of the meaning rendered now the development of thought as we are to see in more detail is by a method essentially of trial and error of experimentation of the use of meanings as worth more than they are as yet recognized to be worth the individual must use his own thoughts his established knowledges his grounded judgments for the embodiment of his new inventive constructions he erects his thought as we say schematically in logic terms problematically conditionally disjunctively 
projecting into the world an opinion still peculiar to himself as if it were true thus all discovery proceeds but this is from the linguistic point of view still to use the current language still to work by meanings already embodied in social and conventional usage language grows therefore just as thought does by never losing its synonymic or dual reference its meaning is both personal and social it is the register of tradition the record of racial conquest the deposit of all the gains made by the genius of individuals the social copy system thus established reflects the judgmental processes of the race and in turn becomes the training school of the judgment of new generations most of the training of the self whereby the vagaries of personal reaction to fact and image are reduced to the basis of sound judgment comes through the use of speech when the child speaks he lays before the world his suggestion for a general or common meaning the reception he gets confirms or refutes him in either case he is instructed his next venture is now from a platform of knowledge on which the newer item is more nearly convertible into the common coin of effective intercourse the point to notice here is not so much the exact mechanism of the exchange secondary conversion by which this gain is made as the training in judgment that the constant use of it affords in each case effective judgment is the common judgment here the object is to point out that it is secured by the development of a function whose rise is directly ad hoc directly for the social experimentation by which growth in personal competence is advanced as well the function of speech in language therefore to sum up the foregoing we have the tangible the actual the historical instrument of the development and conservation of psychic meaning it is the material evidence and proof of the concurrence of social and personal judgment in its synonymic meaning judged as appropriate becomes social meaning held as socially generalized and acknowledged these arguments of baldwin abundantly emphasize the wide-reaching limitations of thinking caused by language these limitations are of the greatest significance both subjectively and objectively at least their meaning is great enough to force one to ask one's self if after all in regard to independence of thought franz mauthner thoroughly sceptical is not really correct in his view that thinking is speech and nothing more baldwin expresses himself more cautiously and reservedly nevertheless his inner meaning is plainly in favour of the primacy of speech naturally not in the sense of the spoken word the directed thinking or as we might perhaps call it the thinking in internal speech is the manifest instrument of culture and we do not go astray when we say that the powerful work of education which the centuries have given to directed thinking has produced just through the peculiar development of thinking from the individual subjective into the social objective a practical application of the human mind to which we owe modern empiricism and technique and which occurs for absolutely the first time in the history of the world inquisitive minds have often tormented themselves with the question why the undoubtedly extraordinary knowledge of mathematics and principles and material facts united with the unexampled art of the human hand in antiquity never arrived at the point of developing those known technical statements of fact for instance the principle of simple machines beyond the realm of the amusing and curious to a real technique in the modern sense there is necessarily only one answer to this the ancients almost entirely with the exception of a few extraordinary minds lack the capacity to allow their interest to follow the transformations of inanimate matter to the extent necessary for them to be able to reproduce the process of nature creatively and through their own art by means of which alone they could have succeeded in putting themselves in possession of the force of nature that which they lacked was training in directed thinking or to express it psychoanalytically the ancients did not succeed in tearing loose the libido which might be sublimated from the other natural relations and did not turn voluntarily to anthropomorphism the secret of the development of culture lies in the mobility of the libido and in its capacity for transference it is therefore to be assumed that the directed thinking of our time is a more or less modern acquisition which was lacking in earlier times but with that we come to a further question viz what happens if we do not think directedly then our thinking lacks the major idea and the feeling of direction which emanates from that we no longer compel our thoughts along a definite track but let them float sink and mount according to their own gravity 
according to culpa thinking as a kind of inner will action the absence of which necessarily leads to an automatic play of ideas james understands the non-directive thinking or merely associative thinking as the ordinary one he expresses himself about that in the following manner our thought consists for the great part of a series of images one of which produces the other a sort of passive dream state of which the higher animals are also capable this sort of thinking leads nevertheless to reasonable conclusions of a practical as well as of a theoretical nature as a rule the links of this sort of irresponsible thinking which are accidentally bound together are empirically concrete things not abstractions we can in the following manner complete these definitions of william james this sort of thinking does not tire us it quickly leads us away from reality into fantasies of the past and future here thinking in the form of speech ceases image crowds upon image feeling upon feeling more and more clearly one sees a tendency which creates and makes believe not as it truly is but as one indeed might wish it to be the material of these thoughts which turns away from reality can naturally be only the past with its thousand memory pictures the customary speech calls this kind of thinking dreamy whoever attentively observes himself will find the general custom of speech very striking for almost every day we can see for ourselves how when falling asleep fantasies are woven into our dreams so that between the dreams of day and night there is not so great a difference thus we have two forms of thinking directed thinking and dream or fantasy thinking the first working for communication with speech elements is troublesome and exhausting the latter on the contrary goes on without trouble working spontaneously so to speak with reminiscences the first creates innovations adaptations imitates reality and seeks to act upon it the latter on the contrary turns away from reality sets free subjective wishes and is in regard to adaptation wholly unproductive let us leave aside the query as to why we possess these two different ways of thinking and turn back to the second proposition namely how comes it that we have two different ways of thinking i have intimated above that history shows us that directed thinking was not always as developed as it is at present in this age the most beautiful expression of directed thinking is science and the technique fostered by it both things are indebted for their existence simply to an energetic education in directed thinking at the time however when a few forerunners of the present culture like the poet petrarch first began to appreciate nature understandingly there was already in existence an equivalent for our science to wit scholasticism this took its subject from the fantasies of the past and it gave to the mind a dialectic training in directed thinking the only success which beckoned the thinker was rhetorical victory and disputation and not a visible transformation of reality the subjects of thinking were often astonishingly fantastical for example questions were discussed such as how many angels could have a place on the point of a needle whether christ could have done his work of redemption equally well if he had come into the world as a pea the possibility of such problems to which belong the metaphysical problems in general viz to be able to know the unknowable shows us of what peculiar kind that mind must have been which created such things which to us are the height of absurdity nietzsche had guessed however at the biological background of this phenomenon when he spoke of the beautiful tension of the germanic mind which the middle ages created taken historically scholasticism in the spirit of which persons of towering intellectual power such as thomas of aquinas duns scotus abelard william of ockham and others have laboured it is the mother of the modern scientific attitude and a later time will see clearly how and in what scholasticism still furnishes living undercurrents to the science of to-day its whole nature lies in dialectic gymnastics which have raised the symbol of speech the word to an almost absolute meaning so that it finally attained to that substantiality which expiring antiquity could lend to its logos only temporarily through attributes of mystical valuation 
the great work of scholasticism however appears to be the foundation of firmly knitted intellectual sublimation the conditio sine qua non of the modern scientific and technical spirit should we go further back into history we shall find that which to-day we call science dissolved into an indistinct cloud the modern culture creating mind is incessantly occupied in stripping off all subjectivity from experience and in finding those formulas which bring nature and her forces to the best and most fitting expression it would be an absurd and entirely unjustified self-glorification if we were to assume that we are more energetic or more intelligent than the ancients our materials for knowledge have increased but not our intellectual capacity for this reason we become immediately as obstinate and insusceptible in regard to new ideas as people in the darkest times of antiquity our knowledge has increased but not our wisdom the main point of our interest is displaced wholly into material reality antiquity preferred a mode of thought which was more closely related to a fantastic type except for a sensitive perspicuity towards works of art not attained since then we seek in vain in antiquity for that precise and concrete manner of thinking characteristic of modern science we see the antique spirit create not science but mythology unfortunately we acquire in school only a very paltry conception of the richness and immense power of life of grecian mythology therefore at first glance it does not seem possible for us to assume that that energy and interest which to-day we put into science and technique the man of antiquity gave in great part to his mythology that nevertheless gives the explanation for the bewildering changes the kaleidoscopic transformations and new syncretistic groupings and the continued rejuvenation of the myths in the grecian sphere of culture here we move in a world of fantasies which little concerned with the outer course of things flows from an inner source and constantly changing creates now plastic now shadowy shapes this fantastical activity of the ancient mind created artistically par excellence the object of the interest does not seem to have been to grasp hold of the how of the real world as objectively and exactly as possibly but to aesthetically adapt subjective fantasies and expectations there was very little place among ancient people for the coldness and disillusion which giordano bruno's thoughts on eternity and kepler's discoveries brought to modern humanity the naive man of antiquity saw in the sun the great father of the heaven and the earth and in the moon the fruitful good mother everything had its demons they animated equally a human being and his brother the animal everything was considered according to its anthropomorphic or theriomorphic attributes as human being or animal even the disk of the sun was given wings or four feet in order to illustrate its movement thus arose an idea of the universe which was not only very far from reality but was one which corresponded wholly to subjective fantasies we know from our own experience this state of mind it is an infantile state to a child the moon is a man or a face or a shepherd of the stars the clouds in the sky seem like little sheep the dolls drink eat and sleep the child places a letter at the window for the christ child he calls to the stork to bring him a little brother or sister the cow is the wife of the horse and the dog the husband of the cat we know too that lower races like the negroes look upon the locomotive as an animal and call the drawers of the table the child of the table as we learn through freud the dream shows a similar type since the dream is unconcerned with the real condition of things it brings the most heterogeneous matter together and a world of impossibilities takes the place of realities freud finds progression characteristic of thinking when awake that is to say the advancement of the thought excitation from the system of the inner or outer perception through the endopsychic work of association conscious and unconscious to the motor end that is to say towards innervation in the dream he finds the reverse namely regression of the thoughts excitation from the preconscious or unconscious to the system of perception by the means of which the dream receives its ordinary impression 
of sensuous distinctness which can rise to an almost hallucinating clearness the dream thinking moves in a retrograde manner towards the raw material of memory the structure of the dream thoughts is dissolved during the progress of regression into its raw material the reanimation of the original perception is however only one side of regression the other side is regression to the infantile memory material which might also be understood as regression to the original perception but which deserves especial mention on account of its independent importance this regression might indeed be considered as historical the dream according to this conception might also be described as the substitute of the infantile scene changed through transference into the recent scene the infantile scene cannot carry through its revival it must be satisfied with its return as a dream from this conception of the historical side of regression it follows consequently that the modes of conclusion of the dream in so far as one may speak of them must show at the same time an analogous and infantile character this is truly the case as experience has abundantly shown so that to-day every one who is familiar with the subject of dream analysis confirms freud's proposition that dreams are a piece of the conquered life of the childish soul inasmuch as the childish psychic life is undeniably of an archaic type this characteristic belongs to the dream in quite an unusual degree freud calls our attention to this especially the dream which fulfils its wishes by a short regressive path affords us only an example of the primary method of working of the psychic apparatus which has been abandoned by us as unsuitable that which once ruled in the waking state when the psychical life was still young and impotent appears to be banished to the dream life in somewhat the same way as the bow and arrow those discarded primitive weapons of adult humanity have been relegated to the nursery all this experience suggests to us that we draw a parallel between the fantastical mythological thinking of antiquity and the similar thinking of children between the lower human races and dreams this train of thought is not a strange one for us but quite familiar through our knowledge of comparative anatomy and the history of development which show us how the structure and function of the human body are the results of a series of embryonic changes which correspond to similar changes in the history of the race therefore the supposition is justified that ontogenesis corresponds in psychology to phylogenesis consequently it would be true as well that the state of infantile thinking in the child's psychic life as well as in dreams is nothing but a re-echo of the prehistoric and the ancient in regard to this nietzsche takes a very broad and remarkable standpoint in our sleep and in our dreams we pass through the whole thought of earlier humanity i mean in the same way that man reasons in his dreams he reasons when in the waking state many thousands of years the first causa which occurred to his mind in reference to anything that needed explanation satisfied him and passed for truth in the dream this atavistic relic of humanity manifests its existence within us for it is the foundation upon which the higher rational faculty developed and which is still developing in every individual the dream carries us back into earlier states of human culture and affords us a means of understanding it better the dream thought is so easy to us now because we are so thoroughly trained to it through the interminable stages of evolution during which this fantastic and facile form of theorizing has prevailed to a certain extent the dream is a restorative for the brain which during the day is called upon to meet the severe demands for trained thought made by the condition of a higher civilization from these facts we can understand how lately more acute logical thinking the taking seriously of cause and effect has been developed when our functions of reason and intelligence still reach back involuntarily to those primitive forms of conclusion and we live about half our lives in this condition we have already seen that freud independently of nietzsche has reached a similar standpoint from the basis of dream analysis the step from this established proposition to the perception of the myths as familiar dream images is no longer a great one freud has formulated this conclusion himself 
the investigation of this folk psychologic formation myths etc is by no means finished at present to take an example of this however it is probable that the myths correspond to the distorted residue of wish fantasies of whole nations the secularized dreams of young humanity Ronk understands the myths in a similar manner as a mass dream of the people Ricklin has insisted rightly upon the dream mechanism of the fables and abraham has done the same for the myths he says the myth is a fragment of the infantile soul life of the people and thus the myth is a sustained still remaining fragment from the infantile soul life of the people and the dream is the myth of the individual an unprejudiced reading of the above-mentioned authors will certainly allay all doubts concerning the intimate connection between dream psychology and myth psychology the conclusion results almost from itself that the age which created the myths thought childishly that is to say fantastically as in our age is still done to a very great extent associatively or analogically in dreams the beginnings of myth formations in the child the taking of fantasies for realities which is partly in accord with the historical may easily be discovered among children end of section four section five of psychology of the unconscious by carl jung this librivox recording is in the public domain section five chapter one part two one might raise the objection that the mythological inclinations of children are implanted by education the objection is futile has humanity at all ever broken loose from the myths every man has eyes and all his senses to perceive that the world is dead cold and unending and he has never yet seen a god nor brought to light the existence of such from empirical necessity on the contrary there was need of a fantastic indestructible optimism and one far removed from all sense of reality in order for example to discover in the shameful death of christ really the highest salvation and the redemption of the world thus one can indeed withhold from a child the substance of earlier myths but not take from him the need for mythology one can say that should it happen that all traditions in the world were cut off with a single blow then with the succeeding generation the whole mythology and history of religion would start over again only a few individuals succeed in throwing off mythology in a time of a certain intellectual supremacy the mass never frees itself explanations are of no avail they merely destroy a transitory form of manifestation but not the creating impulse let us again take up our earlier train of thought we spoke of the ontogenetic re-echo of the phylogenetic psychology among children we saw that fantastic thinking is a characteristic of antiquity of the child and of the lower races but now we know also that our modern and adult man is given over in large part to this same fantastic thinking which enters as soon as the directed thinking ceases a lessening of the interest a slight fatigue is sufficient to put an end to the directed thinking the exact psychological adaptation to the real world and to replace it with fantasies we digress from the theme and give way to our own trains of thought if the slackening of the attention increases then we lose by degrees the consciousness of the present and the fantasy enters into possession of the field here the important question obtrudes itself how are fantasies created from the poets we learn much about it from science we learn little the psychoanalytic method presented to science by freud shed light upon this for the first time it showed us that there are typical cycles the stutterer imagines he is a great orator the truth of this demosthenes thanks to his energy has proven the poor man imagines himself to be a millionaire the child an adult the conquered fight out victorious battles with the conqueror the unfit torments or delights himself with ambitious plans we imagine that which we lack the interesting question of the why of all this we must here leave unanswered 
while we return to the historic problem from what source do the fantasies draw their materials we chose as an example a typical fantasy of puberty a child in that stage before whom the whole frightening uncertainty of the future fate opens puts back the uncertainty into the past through his fantasy and says if only i were not the child of my ordinary parents but the child of a rich and fashionable count and had been merely passed over to my parents then some day a golden coach would come and the count would take his child back with him to his wonderful castle and so it goes on as in grimm's fairy tales which the mother tells to her children with a normal child it stops with the fugitive quickly passing idea which is soon covered over and forgotten however at one time and that was in the ancient world of culture the fantasy was an openly acknowledged institution the heroes i recall romulus and remus semiramis moses and many others have been separated from their real parents others are directly sons of gods and the noble races derive their family trees from heroes and gods as one sees by this example the fantasy of modern humanity is nothing but a re-echo of an old folk belief which was very widespread originally the ambitious fantasy chooses among others a form which is classic and which once had a true meaning the same thing holds good in regard to the sexual fantasy in the preamble we have spoken of dreams of sexual assault the robber who breaks into the house and commits a dangerous act that too is a mythological theme and in the prehistoric era was certainly a reality too wholly apart from the fact that the capture of women was something general in the lawless prehistoric times it was also a subject of mythology in cultivated epics i recall the capture of proserpina dionera europa the sabine women etc we must not forget that even to-day marriage customs exist in various regions which recall the ancient custom of marriage by capture the symbolism of the instrument of coitus was an inexhaustible material for ancient fantasy it furnished a widespread cult that was designated phallic the object of reverence of which was the phallus the companion of dionysus was thales a personification of the phallus proceeding from the phallic hermy of dionysus the phallic symbols were countless among the sabines the custom existed for the bridegroom to part the bride's hair with a lance the bird the fish and the snake were phallic symbols in addition there existed in enormous quantities theriomorphic representations of the sexual instinct in connection with which the bull the he-goat the ram the boar and the ass were frequently used an undercurrent to this choice of symbol was furnished by the sodomitic inclination of humanity when in the dream fantasy of modern man the feared man is replaced by an animal there is recurring in the ontogenetic re-echo the same thing which was openly represented by the ancients countless times there were he-goats which pursued nymphs satyrs with she-goats in still older times in egypt there even existed a shrine of a goat god which the greeks called pan where the hierodules prostituted themselves with goats it is well known that this worship has not died out but continues to live as a special custom in south italy and greece to-day we feel for such a thing nothing but the deepest abhorrence and never would admit it still slumbered in our souls nevertheless just as truly as the idea of the sexual assault is there so are these things there too which we should contemplate still more closely not through moral eyeglasses with horror but with interest as a natural science since these things are venerable relics of past culture periods we have even to-day a clause in our penal code against sodomy but that which was once so strong as to give rise to a worship among a highly developed people has probably not wholly disappeared from the human soul during the course of a few generations we may not forget that since the symposium of plato in which homosexuality faces us on the same level with the so-called normal sexuality only eighty generations have passed and what are eighty generations they shrink to an 
imperceptible period of time when compared with the space of time which separates us from the homo neandertalensis or heidelbergensis i might call to mind in this connection some choice thoughts of the great historian giglielmo ferrero it is a very common belief that the further man is separated from the present by time the more does he differ from us in his thoughts and feelings that the psychology of humanity changes from century to century like fashions of literature therefore no sooner do we find in past history an institution a custom a law or a belief a little different from those with which we are familiar than we immediately search for some complex meanings which frequently resolve themselves into phrases of doubtful significance indeed man does not change so quickly his psychology at bottom remains the same and even if his culture varies much from one epoch to another it does not change the functioning of his mind the fundamental laws of the mind remain the same at least during the short historical period of which we have knowledge and all phenomena even the most strange must be capable of explanation by those common laws of the mind which we can recognize in ourselves the psychologist should accept this viewpoint without reservation as peculiarly applicable to himself to-day indeed in our civilization the phallic processions the dionysian mysteries of classical athens the bare-faced phallic emblems have disappeared from our coins houses temples and streets so also have the theriomorphic representations of the deity been reduced to small remnants like the dove of the holy ghost the lamb of god and the cock of peter adorning our church towers in the same way the capture and violation of women have shrunken away to crimes yet all of this does not affect the fact that we in childhood go through a period in which the impulses towards these archaic inclinations appear again and again and that through all our life we possess side by side with a newly recruited directed and adapted thought a fantastic thought which corresponds to the thought of the centuries of antiquity and barbarism just as our bodies still keep the reminders of old functions and conditions and many old-fashioned organs so our minds too which apparently have outgrown those archaic tendencies nevertheless bear the marks of the evolution passed through and the very ancient re-echoes at least dreamily in fantasies the symbolism which freud has discovered is revealed as an expression of a thinking and of an impulse limited to the dream to wrong conduct and to derangements of the mind which form of thinking and impulse at one time ruled as the mightiest influence in past culture epochs the question of whence comes the inclination and ability which enables the mind to express itself symbolically brings us to the distinction between the two kinds of thinking the directed and adapted on one hand and the subjective fed by our own egotistic wishes on the other the latter form of thinking presupposing that it were not constantly corrected by the adapted thinking must necessarily produce an overwhelmingly subjectively distorted idea of the world we regard this state of mind as infantile it lies in our individual past and in the past of mankind with this we affirm the important fact that man in his fantastic thinking has kept a condensation of the psychic history of his development an extraordinarily important task which even to-day is hardly possible is to give a systematic description of fantastic thinking one may at the most sketch it while directed thinking is a phenomenon conscious throughout the same cannot be asserted of fantastic thinking doubtless a great part of it still falls entirely in the realm of the conscious but at least just as much goes along in half shadows and generally an undetermined amount in the unconscious and this can therefore be disclosed only indirectly by means of fantastic thinking directed thinking is connected with the oldest foundations of the human mind which have been for a long time beneath the threshold of the consciousness the products of this fantastic thinking arising directly from the consciousness are first waking dreams or day-dreams to which freud flournoy pick and others have given special attention then the dreams which offer to the consciousness at first a mysterious exterior and when meaning only through 
the indirectly inferred unconscious contents lastly there is a so-called wholly unconscious fantasy system in the split-off complex which exhibits a pronounced tendency towards the production of a dissociated personality our foregoing explanations show wherein the products arising from the unconscious are related to the mythical from all these signs it may be concluded that the soul possesses in some degree historical strata the oldest stratum of which would correspond to the unconscious the result of that must be that an introversion occurring in later life according to the freudian teaching seizes upon regressive infantile reminiscences taken from the individual past that first points out the way then with stronger introversion and regression strong repressions introversion psychoses there come to light pronounced traits of an archaic mental kind which under certain circumstances might go as far as the re-echo of a once manifest archaic mental product this problem deserves to be more thoroughly discussed as a concrete example let us take the history of the pious abbe egger which anatole france has communicated to us this priest was a hypercritical man and much given to fantasies especially in regard to one question viz the fate of judas whether he was really damned as the teaching of the church asserts to everlasting punishment or whether god had pardoned him after all egger sided with the intelligent point of view that god in his all wisdom had chosen judas as an instrument in order to bring about the highest point of the work of redemption by christ this necessary instrument without the help of which the human race would not have been a sharer in salvation could not possibly be damned by the all-good god in order to put an end to his doubts egger went one night to the church and made supplication for a sign that judas was saved then he felt a heavenly touch upon his shoulder following this egger told the archbishop of his resolution to go out into the world to preach god's unending mercy here we have a richly developed fantasy system before us it is concerned with the subtle and perpetually undecided question as to whether the legendary figure of judas is damned or not the judas legend is in itself mythical material viz the malicious betrayal of a hero i recall siegfried and hagen balder and loki siegfried and balder were murdered by a faithless traitor from among their closest associates this myth is moving and tragic it is not honourable battle which kills the noble but evil treachery it is too an occurrence which is historical over and over again one thinks of caesar and brutus since the myth of such a deed is very old and still the subject of teaching and repetition it is the expression of a psychological fact that envy does not allow humanity to sleep and that all of us carry in a hidden recess of our heart a deadly wish towards the hero this rule can be applied generally to mythical tradition it does not set forth any account of the old events but rather acts in such a way that it always reveals a thought common to humanity and once more rejuvenated thus for example the lives and deeds of the founders of old religions are the purest condensations of typical contemporaneous myths behind which the individual figure entirely disappears but why does our pious abbe torment himself with the old judas legend he first went into the world to preach the gospel of mercy and then after some time he separated from the catholic church and became a swedenborgian now we understand his judas fantasy he was the judas who betrayed his lord therefore first of all he had to make sure of the divine mercy in order to be judas in peace this case throws a light upon the mechanism of the fantasies in general the known conscious fantasy may be of mythical or other material it is not to be taken seriously as such for it has an indirect meaning if we take it however as important per se then the thing is not understandable and makes one despair of the efficiency of the mind but we saw in the case of abbe egger that his doubts and his hopes 
did not turn upon the historical problem of judas but upon his own personality which wished to win a way to freedom for itself through the solution of the judas problem the conscious fantasies tell us of mythical or other material of undeveloped or no longer recognized wish tendencies in the soul as is easily to be understood an innate tendency an acknowledgment of which one refuses to make and which one treats as non-existent can hardly contain a thing that may be in accord with our conscious character it concerns the tendencies which are considered immoral and as generally impossible and the strongest resentment is felt towards bringing them into the consciousness what would egger have said had he been told confidentially that he was preparing himself for the judas role and what in ourselves do we consider immoral and non-existent or which we at least wish were non-existent it is that which in antiquity lay widespread on the surface viz sexuality in all its various manifestations therefore we need not wonder in the least when we find this as the base of most of our fantasies even if the fantasies have a different appearance because egger found the damnation of judas incompatible with god's goodness he thought about the conflict in that way that is the conscious sequence along with this is the unconscious sequence because egger himself wished to be a judas he first made sure of the goodness of god to egger judas was the symbol of his own unconscious tendency and he made use of this symbol in order to be able to meditate over his unconscious wish the direct coming into consciousness of the judas wish would have been too painful for him thus there must be typical myths which are really the instruments of a folk psychological complex treatment jacob burckhardt seems to have suspected this when he once said that every greek of the classical era carried in himself a fragment of the oedipus just as every german carries a fragment of faust the problem which the simple story of the abbe egger has brought clearly before us confronts us again when we prepare to examine fantasies which owe their existence this time to an exclusively unconscious work we are indebted for the material which we will use in the following chapters to the useful publication of an american woman miss frank miller who has given to the world some poetical unconsciously formed fantasies under the title quelque fait d'imagination creatrice subconsciente volume five archives de psychologie nineteen o six end of section five section six of psychology of the unconscious by carl jung this librivox recording is in the public domain section six chapter two the miller fantasies we know from much psychoanalytic experience that whenever one recounts his fantasies or his dreams he deals not only with the most important and intimate of his problems but with the one the most painful at that moment since in the case of miss miller we have to do with a complicated system we must give our attention carefully to the particulars which i will discuss following as best i can miss miller's presentation in the first chapter phenomen de suggestion passagere ou d'auto suggestion instantanee miss miller gives a list of examples of her unusual suggestibility which she herself considers as a symptom of her nervous temperament for example she is excessively fond of caviar whereas some of her relatives loathe it however as soon as any one expresses his loathing she herself feels momentarily the same loathing 
i do not need to emphasize especially the fact that such examples are very important in individual psychology that caviar is a food for which nervous women frequently have an especial predilection is a fact well known to the psychoanalyst miss miller has an extraordinary faculty for taking other people's feelings upon herself and of identification for example she identifies herself to such a degree in cyrano with the wounded christian de neuvillette that she feels in her own breast a truly piercing pain at that place where christian received the deadly blow from the viewpoint of analytic psychology the theatre aside from any aesthetic value may be considered as an institution for the treatment of the mass complex the enjoyment of the comedy or of the dramatic plot ending happily is produced by an unreserved identification of one's own complexes with the play the enjoyment of tragedy lies in the thrilling yet satisfactory feeling that something which might occur to one's self is happening to another the sympathy of our author with the dying christian means that there is in her a complex awaiting a similar solution which whispers softly to her hodi tibi cross mihi and that one may know exactly what is considered the effectual moment miss miller adds that she felt a pain in her breast lorska sarah bernhardt se précipite sur lui pour étancher le sang de sa blessure therefore the effectual moment is when the love between christian and roxanne comes to a sudden end if we glance over the whole of rostand's play we come upon certain moments the effect of which one cannot easily escape and which we will emphasize here because they have meaning for all that follows cyrano de bergerac with the long ugly nose on account of which he undertakes countless duels loves roxanne who for her part unaware of it loves christian because of the beautiful verses which really originate from cyrano's pen but which apparently come from christian cyrano is the misunderstood one whose passionate love and noble soul no one suspects the hero who sacrifices himself for others and dying just in the evening of life reads to her once more christian's last letter the verses which he himself had composed roxanne adieu je vais mourir c'est pour ce soir je crois ma bien aimé j'ai l'âme lourde encore d'amour an exprimé et je meurs jamais plus jamais mes yeux grisés mes regards dont c'étaient les frais mis en fête ne baiseront au vol les gestes que vous faites j'en revois un petit qui vous est familier pour toucher votre front et je voudrais crier et je crie adieu ma chère ma chérie mon trésor mon amour mon coeur ne vous quitta jamais un second et je suis et je serai jusque dans l'autre monde celui qui vous aime sans mes yeux celui whereupon roxanne recognizes in him the real loved one it is already too late death comes and in agonized delirium cyrano raises himself and draws his sword je crois qu'elle regarde qu'elle ose regarder mon nez la camarde il love son épée que dites-vous c'est un nutil je le sais mais on ne se bat pas dans l'espoir du succès non non c'est bien plus beau lorsque c'est inutile qu'est-ce que que c'est que tout cela vous êtes mille ah je vous reconnais tous mes vieux ennemis le mensonge il frappe 
de son épée le vide tiens tiens ha ha les compromis les préjugés les lachetés il frappe que je pactise jamais jamais ah te voilà toi la sottise je sais bien qu'à la fin vous me mettrez à bas n'importe je me batte je me batte je me batte oui vous marrachez tu le laurier et la rose arraché il y a malgré vous quelque chose que j'importe et ce soir grand quand j'entrerai chez dieu mon salut balera largement le sourire bleu quelque chose que sans empli sans hontage j'emporte malgré vous et c'est mon panache cyrano who under the hateful exterior of his body hid a soul so much more beautiful is a yearner and one misunderstood and his last triumph is that he departs at least with a clean shield sans un pli et sans une tache the identification of the author with the dying christian who in himself is a figure but little impressive and sympathetic expresses clearly that a sudden end is destined for her love just as for christian's love the tragic intermezzo with christian however is played as we have seen upon a background of much wider significance viz the misunderstood love of cyrano for roxanne therefore the identification with christian has only the significance of a substitute memory decirenerung and is really intended for cyrano that this is just what we might expect will be seen in the further course of our analysis besides this story of identification with christian there follows as a further example an extraordinarily plastic memory of the sea evoked by the sight of a photograph of a steamboat on the high seas je chante les pulsations des machins le soulevement de vagues le balancement du navire we may mention here the supposition that there are connected with sea journeys particularly impressive and strong memories which penetrate deeply into the soul and give an especially strong character to the surface memories through unconscious harmony to what extent the memories assumed here agree with the above-mentioned problem we shall see in the following pages this example following at this time is singular once while in bathing miss miller wound a towel around her hair in order to protect it from a wetting at the same moment she had the following strong impression il me semble que j'étais sur un piédestal une véritable statue égyptienne avec tous ses détails membres un pied en avant la main tenant des insignes and so on miss miller identified herself therefore with an egyptian statue and naturally the foundation for this was a subjective pretension that is to say i am like an egyptian statue just as stiff wooden sublime and impassive qualities for which the egyptian statue is proverbial one does not make such an assertion to oneself without an inner compulsion and the correct formula might just as well be as stiff wooden etc as an egyptian statue i might indeed be the sight of one's own unclothed body in a bath has undeniable effects for the fantasy which can be set at rest by the above formula the example which follows this emphasizes the author's personal influence upon an artist j'ai réussi à lui faire rendre des paysages comme ceux du lac le mans où il n'a jamais été et il prétendait que je pouvais lui faire rendre des choses qu'il n'avait jamais vues et lui donner la sensation d'une atmosphère ambiante qu'il n'avait jamais sentie 
bref que je me sauvais de lui comme lui même se sauvait de son crayon c'est à dire comme d'un simple instrument this observation stands in abrupt contrast to the fantasy of the egyptian statue miss miller had here the unspoken need of emphasizing her almost magic effect upon another person this could not have happened either without an unconscious need which is particularly felt by one who does not often succeed in making an emotional impression upon a fellow-being with that the list of examples which are to picture miss miller's auto-suggestibility and suggestive effect is exhausted in this respect the examples are neither especially striking nor interesting from an analytical view-point on the contrary they are much more important since they afford us a glance into the soul of the writer Ferranzi has taught us in an excellent work what is to be thought about suggestibility that is to say that these phenomena win new aspects in the light of the freudian libido theory insomuch as their effects become clear through libido besetzungen this was already indicated above in the discussion of the examples and in the greatest detail regarding the identification with christian the identification becomes effective by its receiving an influx of energy from the strongly accentuated thought and emotional feeling underlying the christian motif just the reverse is the suggestive effect of the individual in an especial capacity for concentrating interest that is to say libido upon another person by which the other is unconsciously compelled to reaction the same or opposed the majority of the examples concern cases where miss miller is put under the effects of suggestion that is to say when the libido has spontaneously gained possession of certain impressions and this is impossible if the libido is dammed up to an unusual degree by the lack of application to reality miss miller's observations about suggestibility inform us therefore of the fact that the author is pleased to tell us in her following fantasies something of the history of her love end of section six section seven of psychology of the unconscious by carl jung this librivox recording is in the public domain section seven chapter three part one the hymn of creation the second chapter in miss miller's work is entitled gloire a dear poem honorique when twenty years of age miss miller took a long journey through europe we leave the description of it to her after a long and rough journey from new york to stockholm from there to petersburg and odessa i found it a true pleasure to leave the world of inhabited cities and to enter the world of waves sky and silence i stayed hours long on deck to dream stretched out in a reclining chair the histories legends and myths of the different countries which i saw in the distance came back to me indistinctly blended together in a sort of luminous mist in which things lost their reality while the dreams and thoughts alone took on somewhat the appearance of reality at first i even avoided all company and kept to myself lost wholly in my dreams where all that i knew of great beautiful and good came back into my consciousness with new strength and new life i also employed a great part of my time writing to my distant friends reading and sketching out short poems about the regions visited some of these poems were of a very serious character it may seem superfluous perhaps to enter intimately into all these details if we recall however the remark made above that when people let their unconscious speak they always tell us the most important things of their intimate selves then even the smallest detail appears to have meaning valuable personalities invariably tell us through their unconscious things that are generally valuable so that patient interest is rewarded 
miss miller describes here a state of introversion after the life of the cities with their many impressions had been absorbing her interest with that already discussed strength of suggestion which powerfully enforced the impression she breathed freely upon the ocean and after so many external impressions became engrossed wholly in the internal with intentional abstraction from the surroundings so that things lost their reality and dreams became truth we know from psychopathology that certain mental disturbances exist which are first manifested by the individuals shutting themselves off slowly more and more from reality and sinking into their fantasies during which process in proportion as the reality loses its hold the inner world gains in reality and determining power this process leads to a certain point which varies with the individual when the patients suddenly become more or less conscious of their separation from reality the event which then enters is the pathological excitation that is to say the patients begin to turn towards the environment with diseased views to be sure which however still represent the compensating although unsuccessful attempt at transference the methods of reaction are naturally very different i will not concern myself more closely about this here this type appears to be generally a psychological rule which holds good for all neuroses and therefore also for the normal in a much less degree we might therefore expect that miss miller after this energetic and persevering introversion which had even encroached for a time upon the feeling of reality would succumb anew to an impression of the real world and also to just as suggestive and energetic an influence as that of her dreams let us proceed with the narrative but as the journey drew to an end the ship's officers outdid themselves in kindness to ce qu'il y a de plus impressé et de plus aimable and i passed many amusing hours teaching them english on the sicilian coast in the harbour of catania i wrote a sailor's song which was very similar to a song well known on the sea brine wine and damsels fine the italians in general all sing very well and one of the officers who sang on deck during night watch had made a great impression upon me and had given me the idea of writing some words adapted to his melody soon after that i was very nearly obliged to reverse the well-known saying vetter napoli e poi morir that is to say suddenly i became very ill although not dangerously so i recovered to such an extent however that i could go on land to visit the sights of the city in a carriage this day tired me very much and since we had planned to see pisa the following day i went on board early in the evening and soon lay down to sleep without thinking of anything more serious than the beauty of the officers and the ugliness of the italian beggars one is somewhat disappointed at meeting here instead of the expected impression of reality rather a small intermezzo of flirtation nevertheless one of the officers the singer had made a great impression il m'avait fait beaucoup d'impression the remark at the close of the description sans songer a rien de plus sérieux que la beauté des officiers and so on diminishes the seriousness of the impression it is true the assumption however that the impression openly influenced the mood very much is supported by the fact that a poem upon a subject of such an erotic character came forth immediately brine wine and damsels fine and in the singer's honour one is only too easily inclined to take such an impression lightly and one admits so gladly the statements of the participators when they represent everything as simple and not at all serious i dwell upon this impression at length because it is important to know that an erotic impression after such an introversion has a deep effect and is undervalued possibly by miss miller the suddenly passing sickness is obscure and needs a psychologic interpretation which cannot be touched upon here because of lack of data the phenomena now to be described can only be explained as arising from a disturbance which reaches to the very depths of her being from naples to laverno the ship travelled for a night during which i slept more or less well my sleep however is seldom deep or dreamless it seemed to me as if my mother's voice wakened me just at the end of the following dream at first i had a vague conception of the words when the morning stars sang together 
which were the preludium of a certain confused representation of creation and of the mighty chorals resounding through the universe in spite of the strange contradictory and confused character which is peculiar to the dream there was mingled in it the chorus of an oratorio which has been given by one of the foremost musical societies of new york and with that were also memories of milton's paradise lost then from out of this whirl there slowly emerged certain words which arranged themselves into three strophes and indeed they seemed to be in my own handwriting on ordinary blue-lined writing-paper on a page of my old poetry book which i always carried around with me in short they appeared to me exactly as some minutes later they were in reality in my book miss miller now wrote down the following poem which she rearranged somewhat a few months later to make it more nearly in her opinion like the dream original when the eternal first made sound a myriad ears sprang out to hear and throughout all the universe there rolled an echo deep and clear all glory to the god of sound when the eternal first made light a myriad eyes sprang out to look and hearing ears and seeing eyes once more a mighty choral took all glory to the god of light when the eternal first gave love a myriad hearts sprang into life ears filled with music eyes with light pealed forth with hearts with love all right all glory to the god of love before we enter upon miss miller's attempt to bring to light through her suppositions the root of this subliminal creation we will attempt a short analytic survey of the material already in our possession the impression on the ship has already been properly emphasized so that we need have no further difficulty in gaining possession of the dynamic process which brought about this poetical revelation it was made clear in the preceding paragraphs that miss miller possibly had not inconsiderably undervalued the importance of the erotic impression this assumption gains in probability through experience which shows that very generally relatively weak erotic impressions are greatly undervalued one can see this best in cases where those concerned either from social or moral grounds consider an erotic relation as something quite impossible for example parents and children brothers and sisters relations homosexual between older and younger men and so on if the impression is relatively slight then it does not exist at all for the participators if the impression is strong then a tragic dependence arises which may result in some great nonsense or be carried to any extent this lack of understanding can go unbelievably far mothers who see the first directions of the small son in their own bed a sister who half playfully embraces her brother a twenty-year-old daughter who still seats herself on her father's lap and then has strange sensations in her abdomen they are all morally indignant to the highest degree if one speaks of sexuality finally our whole education is carried on with the tacit agreement to know as little as possible of the erotic and to spread abroad the deepest ignorance in regard to it it is no wonder therefore that the judgment in puncto of the importance of an erotic impression is generally unsafe and inadequate miss miller was under the influence of a deep erotic impression as we have seen because of the sum total of the feelings aroused by this it does not seem that this impression was more than dimly realized for the dream had to contain a powerful repetition from analytic experience one knows that the early dreams which patients bring for analysis are none the less of especial interest because of the fact that they bring out criticisms and valuations of the physician's personality which previously would have been asked for directly in vain they enrich the conscious impression which the patient had of his physician and often concerning very important points they are naturally erotic observations which the unconscious was forced to make just because of the quite universal undervaluation and uncertain judgment of the relatively weak erotic impression in the drastic and hyperbolic manner of expression of the dream the impression often appears in almost unintelligible form on account of the immeasurable dimension of the symbol a further peculiarity which seems to rest upon the historic strata of the unconscious is this that an erotic impression to which conscious acknowledgment is denied usurps an earlier and discarded transference and expresses itself in that 
therefore it frequently happens for example that among young girls at the time of their first love remarkable difficulties develop in the capacity for erotic expression which may be reduced analytically to disturbances through a regressive attempt at resuscitation of the father image or the father imago indeed one might presume something similar in miss miller's case for the idea of the masculine creative deity is a derivation analytically and historically psychologic of the father imago and aims above all to replace the discarded infantile father transference in such a way that for the individual the passing from the narrow circle of the family into the wider circle of human society may be simpler or made easier in the light of this reflection we can see in the poem and its preludium the religious poetically formed product of an introversion depending upon the surrogate of the father imago in spite of the incomplete apperception of the effectual impression essential component parts of this are included in the idea of compensation as marks so to speak of its origin pfister has coined for this the striking expression law of the return of the complex the effectual impression was that of the officer singing in the night watch when the morning stars sang together the idea of this opened a new world to the girl creation this creator has created tone then light and then love that the first to be created should have been tone can be made clear only individually for there is no cosmogony except the gnosis of hermes a generally quite unknown system which would have such tendencies but now we might venture a conjecture which is already apparent and which soon will be proven thoroughly viz the following chain of associations the singer the singing morning stars the god of tone the creator the god of light of the sun of the fire and of love the links of this chain are proven by the material with the exception of sun and fire which i put in parentheses but which however will be proven through what follows in the further course of the analysis all of these expressions with one exception belong to erotic speech my god star light my son fire of love fiery love etc creator appears indistinct at first but becomes understandable through the reference to the undertone of eros to the vibrating chord of nature which attempts to renew itself in every pair of lovers and awaits the wonder of creation miss miller had taken pains to disclose the unconscious creation of her mind to her understanding and indeed through a procedure which agrees in principle with psychoanalysis and therefore leads to the same results as psychoanalysis but as usually happens with laymen and beginners miss miller because she had no knowledge of psychoanalysis left off at the thoughts which necessarily bring the deep complex lying at the bottom of it to light in an indirect that is to say censored manner more than this a simple method merely the carrying out of the thought to its conclusion is sufficient to discover the meaning miss miller finds it astonishing that her unconscious fantasy does not following the mosaic account of creation put light in the first place instead of tone now follows an explanation theoretically constructed and correct ad hoc the hollowness of which is however characteristic of all similar attempts at explanation she says it is perhaps interesting to recall that anaxagoras also had the cosmos arise out of chaos through a sort of whirlwind which does not happen usually without producing sound but at this time i had studied no philosophy and knew nothing either of anaxagoras or of his theories about the noose which i unconsciously was openly following at that time also i was equally in complete ignorance of leibniz and therefore knew nothing of his doctrine dum deus calculat fit mundus miss miller's references to anaxagoras and to leibniz both referred to creation by means of thought that is to say that divine thought alone could bring forth a new material reality a reference at first not intelligible but which will soon however be more easily understood we now come to those fancies from which miss miller principally drew her unconscious creation in the first place there is the paradise lost by milton which we had at home in the edition illustrated by doré and which had often delighted me from childhood 
than the book of job which had been read aloud to me since the time of my earliest recollection moreover if one compares the first words of paradise lost with my first verse one notices as there is the same verse measure of man's first disobedience when the eternal first made sound my poem also recalls various passages in job and one or two places in handel's oratorio the creation which came out very indistinctly in the first part of the dream the lost paradise which as is well known is so closely connected with the beginning of the world is made more clearly evident by the verse of man's first disobedience which is concerned evidently with the fall the meaning of which need not be shown any further i know the objection which every one unacquainted with psychoanalysis will raise viz that miss miller might just as well have chosen any other verse as an example and that accidentally she had taken the first one that happened to appear which had this content almost accidentally as is well known the criticism which we hear equally from our medical colleagues and from our patients is generally based on such arguments this misunderstanding arises from the fact that the law of causation in the psychical sphere is not taken seriously enough that is to say there are no accidents no just as wells it is so and there is therefore a sufficient reason at hand why it is so it is moreover true that miss miller's poem is connected with the fall wherein just that erotic component comes forth the existence of which we have surmised above miss miller neglects to tell which passages in job occurred to her mind these unfortunately are therefore only general suppositions take first the analogy to the lost paradise job lost all that he had and this was due to an act of satan who wished to incite him against god in the same way mankind through the temptation of the serpent lost paradise and was plunged into earth's torments the idea or rather the mood which is expressed by the reference to the lost paradise is miss miller's feeling that she had lost something which was connected with satanic temptation to her it happened just as to job that she suffered innocently for she did not fall a victim to temptation job's sufferings are not understood by his friends no one knows that satan has taken a hand in the game and that job is truly innocent job never tires of avowing his innocence is there a hint in that we know that certain neurotic and especially mentally diseased people continually defend their innocence against non-existent attacks however one discovers at a closer examination that the patient while he apparently defends his innocence without reason fulfils with that a deckhand lung the energy for which arises from just those impulses whose sinful character is revealed by the contents of the pretended reproach and calumny job suffered doubly on one side through the loss of his fortune on the other through the lack of understanding in his friends the latter can be seen throughout the book the suffering of the misunderstood recalls the figure of cyrano de bergerac he too suffered doubly on one side through hopeless love on the other side through misunderstanding he falls as we have seen in the last hopeless battle against le mensonge les compromis les préjugés les lâchetés et la sottise oui vous m'arrachez tout le laurier et la rose job laments god delivereth me to the ungodly and casteth me into the hands of the wicked i was at ease and he brake me asunder yea he hath taken me by the neck and dashed me to pieces he hath also set me up for his mark his archers compass me round about he cleaveth my reins asunder and doth not spare he poureth out my gall upon the ground he breaketh me with breach upon breach he runneth upon me like a giant job sixteen eleven through fifteen the analogy of feeling lies in the suffering of the hopeless struggle against the more powerful it is as if this conflict were accompanied from afar by the sounds of creation which brings up a beautiful and mysterious image belonging to the unconscious and which has not yet forced its way up to the light of the upper world we surmise rather than know that this battle has really something to do with creation with the struggles between negations and affirmations the references to ross and cyrano through the identification with christian to milton's paradise lost to the sorrows of job misunderstood by his friends betray plainly that in the soul of the poet something was identified with these ideas she also has suffered like cyrano and job has lost paradise and dreams of creation creation by means of thought fruition through the whirlwind of anaxagoras 
we once more submit ourselves to miss miller's guidance i remember that when fifteen years old i was once very much stirred up over an article read aloud to me by my mother concerning the idea which spontaneously produced its object i was so excited that i could not sleep all night because of thinking over and over again what that could mean from the age of nine to sixteen i went every sunday to a presbyterian church in charge of which at that time was a very cultured minister in one of the earliest memories which i have retained of him i see myself as a very small girl sitting in a very large pew continually endeavouring to keep myself awake and pay attention without in the least being able to understand what he meant when he spoke to us of chaos cosmos and the gift of love don d'amour there are also rather early memories of the awakening of puberty nine to sixteen which have connected the idea of the cosmos springing from chaos with the don d'amour the medium in which these associations occur is the memory of a certain very much honoured ecclesiastic who spoke those dark words from the same period of time comes the remembrance of that excitement about the idea of the creative thought which from itself produced its object here are two ways of creation intimated the creative thought and the mysterious reference to the don d'amour at the time when i had not yet understood the nature of psychoanalysis i had a fortunate opportunity of winning through continual observation a deep insight into the soul of a fifteen-year-old girl then i discovered with astonishment what the contents of the unconscious fantasies are and how far removed they are from those which a girl of that age shows outwardly there are wide-reaching fantasies of truly mythical fruitfulness the girl was in the split-off fantasy the race mother of uncounted peoples if we deduct the poetically spoken fantasy of the girl elements are left which at that age are common to all girls for the unconscious content is to an infinitely greater degree common to all mankind than the content of the individual consciousness for it is the condensation of that which is historically the average and ordinary miss miller's problem at this age was the common human problem how am i to be created nature knows but one answer to that through the child don d'amour but how is the child attained here the terrifying problem emerges which as our analytic experience shows is connected with the father where it cannot be solved because the original sin of incest weighs heavily for all time upon the human race the strong and natural love which binds the child to the father turns away in those years during which the humanity of the father would be all too plainly recognized to the higher forms of the father to the fathers of the church and to the father god visibly represented by them and in that there lies still less possibility of solving the problem however mythology is not lacking in consolations has not the logos become flesh too has not the divine numa even the logos entered the virgin's womb and lived among us as the son of man the whirlwind of anaxagoras was precisely the divine noose which from out of itself has become the world why do we cherish the image of the virgin mother even to this day because it is always comforting and says without speech or noisy sermon to the one seeking comfort i too have become a mother through the idea which spontaneously produces its object i believe that there is foundation enough at hand for a sleepless night if those fantasies peculiar to the age of puberty were to become possessed of this idea the results would be immeasurable all that is psychologic has an under and an over meaning as is expressed in the profound remark of the old mystic the heaven above the heaven below the sky above the sky below all things above all things below decline and rise we would show but slight justice however to the intellectual originality of our author if we were satisfied to trace back the commotion of that sleepless night absolutely and entirely to the sexual problem in a narrow sense that would be but one half and truly to make use of the mystic's expression only the under half the other half is the intellectual sublimation which strives to make true in its own way the ambiguous expression of the idea which produces its object spontaneously ideal creation in place of the real End of chapter three part one section eight of psychology of the unconscious by carl jung this librivox recording is in the public domain section eight 
in such an intellectual accomplishment of an evidently very capable personality the prospect of a spiritual fruitfulness is something which is worthy of the highest aspiration since for many it will become a necessity of life also this side of the fantasy explains to a great extent the excitement for it is a thought with a presentiment of the future one of those thoughts which arise to use one of maeterlinck's expressions from the inconscient superieur that prospective potency of subliminal combinations i have had the opportunity of observing certain cases of neuroses of years duration in which at the time of the beginning of the illness or shortly before a dream occurred often of visionary clarity this impressed itself inextinguishably upon the memory and in analysis revealed a hidden meaning to the patient which anticipated the subsequent events of life that is to say their psychologic meaning i am inclined to grant this meaning to the commotion of that restless night because the resulting events of life in so far as miss miller consciously and unconsciously unveils them to us are entirely of a nature to confirm the supposition that that moment is to be considered as the inception and presentiment of a sublimated aim in life miss miller concludes the list of her fancies with the following remarks the dream seemed to me to come from a mixture of the representation of paradise lost job and creation with ideas such as thought which spontaneously produces its object the gift of love chaos and cosmos in the same way as coloured splinters of glass are combined in a kaleidoscope in her mind fragments of philosophy aesthetics and religion would seem to be combined under the stimulating influence of the journey and the countries hurriedly seen combined with the great silence and the indescribable charm of the sea ce ne fut que cela et rien de plus only this and nothing more with these words miss miller shows us out politely and energetically her parting words in her negation confirmed over again in english leave behind a curiosity viz what position is to be negated by these words sir ne fou que cela est rien de plus that is to say really only le charme impalpable de la mer and the young man who sang melodiously during the night watch is long since forgotten and no one is to know least of all the dreamer that he was a morning star who came before the creation of a new day one should take care lest he satisfy himself and the reader with a sentence such as ce ne fut que cela otherwise it might immediately happen that one would become disturbed again this occurs to miss miller too since she allowed an english quotation to follow only this and nothing more without giving the source it is true the quotation comes from an unusually effective poem the raven by poe the line referred to occurs in the following while i nodded nearly napping suddenly there came a tapping as of some one gently rapping rapping at my chamber door tis some visitor i muttered tapping at my chamber door only this and nothing more the spectral raven knocks nightly at his door and reminds the poet of his irrevocably lost lenore the raven's name is nevermore and as a refrain to every verse he croaks his horrible nevermore old memories come back tormentingly and the spectre repeats inexorably nevermore the poet seeks in vain to frighten away the dismal guest he calls to the raven be that word our sign of parting bird or fiend i shrieked up starting get thee back into the tempest and the night's plutonian shore leave no black plume as a token of that lie thy soul hath spoken leave my loneliness unbroken quit the bust above my door take thy beak from out my heart and take thy form from off my door quoth the raven nevermore that quotation which apparently skips lightly over the situation only this and nothing more comes from a text which depicts in an affecting manner the despair over the lost lenore that quotation also misleads our poet in the most striking manner therefore she undervalues 
the erotic impression and the wide-reaching effect of the commotion caused by it it is this undervaluation which freud has formulated more precisely as repression which is the reason why the erotic problem does not attain directly conscious treatment and from this there arise these psychologic riddles the erotic impression works in the unconscious and in its stead pushes symbols forth into consciousness thus one plays hide-and-seek with oneself first it is the morning stars which sing together then paradise lost then the erotic yearning clothes itself in an ecclesiastical dress and utters dark words about world creation and finally rises into a religious hymn to find there at last a way out into freedom a way against which the censor of the moral personality can oppose nothing more the hymn contains in its own peculiar character the marks of its origin it thus has fulfilled itself the law of the return of the complex the night singer in this circuitous manner of the old transference to the father priest has become the eternal the creator the god of tone of light of love the indirect course of the libido seems to be a way of sorrow at least paradise lost and the parallel reference to job lead one to that conclusion if we take in addition to this the introductory intimation of the identification with christian which we see concludes with cyrano then we are furnished with material which pictures the indirect course of the libido as truly a way of sorrow it is the same as when mankind after the sinful fall had the burden of the earthly life to bear or like the tortures of job who suffered under the power of satan and of god and who himself without suspecting it became a plaything of the superhuman forces which we no longer consider as metaphysical but as metapsychological faust also offers us the same exhibition of god's wager mephistopheles what will you bet there's still a chance to gain him if unto me full leave you give gently upon my road to train him satan but put forth thine hand now and touch all that he hath and he will curse thee to thy face job one two while in job the two great tendencies are characterized simply as good and bad the problem in faust is a pronouncedly erotic one viz the battle between sublimation and eros in which the devil is strikingly characterized through the fitting role of the erotic tempter the erotic is lacking in job at the same time job is not conscious of the conflict within his own soul he even continuously disputes the arguments of his friends who wish to convince him of evil in his own heart to this extent one might say that faust is considerably more honourable since he openly confesses to the torments of his soul miss miller acts like job she says nothing and lets the evil and the good come from the other world from the metapsychologic therefore the identification with job is also significant in this respect a wider and indeed a very important analogy remains to be mentioned the creative power which love really is rightly considered from the natural standpoint remains as the real attribute of the divinity sublimated from the erotic impression therefore in the poem god is praised throughout as creator job offers the same illustration satan is the destroyer of job's fruitfulness god is the fruitful one himself therefore at the end of the book he gives forth as an expression of his own creative power this hymn filled with lofty poetic beauty in this hymn strangely enough two unsympathetic representatives of the animal kingdom behemoth and the leviathan both expressive of the crudest force conceivable in nature are given chief consideration the behemoth being really the phallic attribute of the god of creation behold now behemoth which i made as well as thee he eateth grass as an ox lo now his strength is in his loins 
and his force is in the muscles of his belly he moveth his tail like a cedar the sinews of his thighs are knit together his bones are as tubes of brass his limbs are like bars of iron he is the chief of the ways of god he only that made him giveth him his sword behold if a river overflow he trembleth not he is confident though a jordan swell even to his mouth shall any take him when he is on the watch or pierce through his nose with a snare canst thou draw leviathan with a fish-hook or press down his tongue with a cord lay thy hand upon him remember the battle and do no more none is so fierce that dare stir him up who then is he that can stand before me who hath first given unto me that i should repay him whatsoever is under the whole heaven is mine job forty fifteen through twenty twenty three twenty four forty one one eight ten eleven god says this in order to bring his power and omnipotence impressively before job's eyes god is like the behemoth and the leviathan the fruitful nature giving forth abundance the untamable wildness and boundlessness of nature and the overwhelming danger of the unchained power but what has destroyed job's earthly paradise the unchained power of nature as the poet lets it be seen here god has simply turned his other side outwards for once the side which man calls the devil and which lets loose all the torments of nature on job naturally for the purpose of discipline and training the god who created such monstrosities before whom the poor weak man stiffens with anxiety truly must hide qualities within himself which are food for thought this god lives in the heart in the unconscious in the realm of metapsychology there is the source of the anxiety before the unspeakably horrible and of the strength to withstand the horrors the person that is to say his conscious i is like a plaything like a feather which is whirled around by different currents of air sometimes the sacrifice and sometimes the sacrificer and he cannot hinder either the book of job shows us god at work both as creator and destroyer who is this god a thought which humanity in every part of the world and in all ages has brought forth from itself and always again anew in similar forms a power in the other world to which man gives praise a power which creates as well as destroys an idea necessary to life since psychologically understood the divinity is nothing else than a projected complex of representation which is accentuated in feeling according to the degree of religiousness of the individual so god is to be considered as the representative of a certain sum of energy libido this energy therefore appears projected metaphysically because it works from the unconscious outwards when it is dislodged from there as psychoanalysis shows as i have earlier made apparent in the better tongue des vaters the religious instinct feeds upon the incestuous libido of the infantile period in the principal forms of religion which now exist the father transference seems to be at least the moulding influence in older religions it seems to be the influence of the mother transference which creates the attributes of the divinity the attributes of the divinity are omnipotence a sternly persecuting paternalism ruling through fear old testament and a loving paternalism new testament these are the attributes of the libido in that wide sense in which freud has conceived this idea empirically in certain pagan and also in certain christian attributes of divinity the maternal stands out strongly and in the former the animal also comes into the greatest prominence likewise the infantile so closely interwoven with religious fantasies and from time to time breaking forth so violently is nowhere lacking all this points to the sources of the dynamic states of religious activity these are those impulses which in childhood are withdrawn from incestuous application through the intervention of the incest barrier and which especially at the time of puberty as a result of affluxes of libido coming from the still incompletely employed sexuality are 
aroused to their own peculiar activity as is easily understood that which is valuable in the god-creating idea is not the form but the power the libido the primitive power which job's hymn of creation vindicates the unconditional and inexorable the unjust and the superhuman are truly and rightly attributes of libido which lead us unto life which let the poor be guilty and against which struggle is in vain nothing remains for mankind but to work in harmony with his will nietzsche's zarathustra teaches us this impressively we see that in miss miller the religious hymn arising from the unconscious is the compensating amend for the erotic it takes a great part of its materials from the infantile reminiscences which she reawakened into life by the introversion of the libido had this religious creation not succeeded and also had another sublimated application been eliminated the miss miller would have yielded to the erotic impression either to its natural consequence or to a negative issue which would have replaced the lost success in love by a correspondingly strong sorrow it is well known that opinions are much divided concerning the worth of this issue of an erotic conflict such as miss miller has presented to us it is thought to be much more beautiful to solve unnoticed and erotic tension in the elevated feelings of religious poetry in which perhaps many other people can find joy and consolation one is wrong to storm against this conception from the radical standpoint of fanaticism for truth i think that one should view with philosophic admiration the strange paths of the libido and should investigate the purposes of its circuitous ways it is not too much to say that we have herewith dug up the erotic root and yet the problem remains unsolved were there not bound up with that a mysterious purpose probably of the greatest biological meaning then certainly twenty centuries would not have yearned for it with such intense longing doubtless this sort of libidian current moves in the same direction as taken in the widest sense did that ecstatic ideal of the middle ages and of the ancient mystery cults one of which became the later christianity there is to be seen biologically in this ideal an exercise of psychologic projection of the paranoidian mechanism as freud would express it the projection consists in the repressing of the conflict into the unconscious and the setting forth of the repressed contents into seeming objectivity which is also the formula of paranoia the repression serves as is well known for the freeing from a painful complex from which one must escape by all means because its compelling and oppressing power is feared the repression can lead to an apparent complete suppression which corresponds to a strong self-control unfortunately however self-control has limits which are only too narrowly drawn closer observation of people shows it is true that calm is maintained at the critical moment but certain results occur which fall into two categories first the suppressed effect comes to the surface immediately afterwards seldom directly it is true but ordinarily in the form of a displacement to another object for example a person is in official relations polite submissive patient and so on and turns his whole anger loose upon his wife or his subordinates second the suppressed effect creates compensations elsewhere for example people who strive for excessive ethics who try always to think feel and act altruistically and ideally avenge themselves because of the impossibility of carrying out their ideals by subtle maliciousness which naturally does not come into their own consciousness as such but which leads to misunderstandings and unhappy situations apparently then all of these are only especially unfortunate circumstances or they are the guilt and malice of other people or they are tragic complications one is indeed freed of the conscious conflict nevertheless it lies invisible at one's feet and is stumbled over at every step the technique of the apparent suppressing and forgetting is inadequate because it is not possible of achievement in the last analysis it is in reality a mere makeshift the religious projection 
offers a much more effectual help in this one keeps the conflict in sight care pain anxiety and so on and gives it over to a personality standing outside of oneself the divinity the evangelical command teaches us this cast all your anxiety upon him because he careth for you first peter five seven in nothing be anxious but in everything by prayer and supplication let your request be made known unto god philippians four six one must give the burdening complex of the soul consciously over to the deity that is to say associate it with a definite representation complex which is set up as objectively real as a person who answers those questions for us unanswerable to this inner demand belongs the candid avowal of sin and the christian humility presuming such an avowal both are for the purpose of making it possible for one to examine one's self and to know one's self one may consider the mutual avowal of sins as the most powerful support to this work of education confess therefore your sins one to another james five sixteen these measures aim at a conscious recognition of the conflicts thoroughly psychoanalytic which is also a conditio sine qua non of the psychoanalytic condition of recovery just as psychoanalysis in the hands of the physician a secular method sets up the real object of transference as the one to take over the conflicts of the oppressed and to solve them so the christian religion sets up the saviour considered as real in whom we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of sins ephesians one seven and colossians one fourteen he is the deliverer and redeemer of our guilt a god who stands above sin who did no sin neither was guile found in his mouth peter two twenty two who his own self bear our sins in his body upon the tree peter two twenty four therefore christ has been sacrificed once to take away the sins of many hebrews nine twenty eight the god thus thought of is distinguished as innocent in himself and as the self-sacrificer these qualities are true also for that amount of energy libido which belongs to the representation complex designated the redeemer the conscious projection towards which the christian education aims offers therefore a double benefit first one is kept conscious of the conflict sins of two opposing tendencies mutually resistant and through this one prevents a known trouble from becoming by means of repressing and forgetting an unknown and therefore so much more tormenting sorrow secondly one lightens one's burden by surrendering it to him to whom all solutions are known one must not forget that the individual psychologic roots of the deity set up as real by the pious are concealed from him and that he although unaware of this still bears the burden alone and is still alone with his conflict this delusion would lead infallibly to the speedy breaking up of the system for nature cannot indefinitely be deceived but the powerful institution of christianity meets this situation the command in the book of james is the best expression of the psychologic significance of this bear ye one another's burdens this is emphasized as especially important in order to preserve society upright through mutual love transference the pauline writings leave no doubt about this through love be servants one to another galatians five thirteen let love of the brethren continue hebrews thirteen one and let us consider one another to provoke unto love and good works not forgetting our own assembling together as is the custom of some but exhorting one another hebrews ten twenty four twenty five we might say that the real transference taught in the christian community is the condition absolutely necessary for the efficacy of the miracle of redemption the first letter of john comes out frankly with this he that loveth his brother abideth in the light first john two ten if we love one another god abideth in us first john four twelve the deity continues to be efficacious in the christian religion only upon the foundation of brotherly love consequently here too the mystery of redemption is the unresisting real transference 
one may properly ask oneself for what then is the deity useful if his efficacy consists only in the real transference to this also the evangelical message has a striking answer men are all brothers in christ so christ also having been once offered to bear the sins of many shall appear a second time apart from sin to them that wait for him unto salvation hebrews nine twenty eight the condition of transference among brothers is to be such as between man and christ a spiritual one as the history of ancient cults and certain christian sects shows this explanation of the christian religion is an especially important one biologically for the psychologic intimacy creates certain shortened ways between men which lead only too easily to that from which christianity seeks to release them namely to the sexual relation with all those consequences and necessities under which the really already highly civilized man had to suffer at the beginning of our christian era for just as the ancient religious experience was regarded as distinctly as a bodily union with the deity just so was worship permeated with sexuality of every kind sexuality lay only too close to the relations of people with each other the moral degeneracy of the first christian century produced a moral reaction arising out of the darkness of the lowest strata of society which was expressed in the second and third centuries at its purest in the two antagonistic religions christianity on the one side and mithraism on the other these religions strove after precisely that higher form of social intercourse symbolic of a projected become flesh idea logos whereby all those strongest impulsive energies of the archaic man formerly plunging him from one passion into another and which seemed to the ancients like the compulsion of the evil constellations as destiny and which in the sense of later ages might be translated as the driving force of the libido the power for putting in motion of zeno could be made use of for social preservation it may be assumed most certainly that the domestication of humanity has cost the greatest sacrifices an age which produced the stoical ideal must certainly have known why and against what it was created the age of nero serves to set off effectually the famous extracts from the forty-first letter of seneca to lucilius one drags the other into error and how can we attain to salvation when no one bids us halt when all the world drives us in deeper do you ever come across a man unafraid in danger untouched by desires happy in misfortune peaceful in the midst of a storm elevated above ordinary mortals on the same plane as the gods does not reverence seize you are you not compelled to say such an exalted being is certainly something different from the miserable body which he inhabits a divine strength rules there such an excellent mind full of moderation raised above all trivialities which smiles at that which we others fear or strive after a heavenly power animates such a person a thing of this kind does not exist without the cooperation of a deity the largest part of such a being belongs to the region from which he came just as the sun's rays touch the earth in reality and yet are at home only there from whence they come so an eminent holy man associates with us he is sent to us that we may learn to know the divine better and although with us still really belongs to his original home he looks thither and reaches towards it among us he walks as an exalted being the people of this age had grown ripe for identification with the word become flesh for the founding of a new fellowship united by one idea in the name of which people could love each other and call each other brothers the old vague idea of a messiah of a mediator in whose name new ways of love would be created became a fact and with that humanity made an immense step forward this had not been brought about by a speculative completely sophisticated philosophy but by an elementary need in the mass of people vegetating in spiritual darkness the profoundest necessities had evidently driven them towards that since humanity did not thrive in a state of dissoluteness the meaning of those cults i speak of christianity and mithraism is clear it is a moral restraint of animal impulses the dynamic appearance of both religions betrays something of that enormous feeling of redemption which animated the first disciples and which we to-day 
scarcely know how to appreciate for these old truths are empty to us most certainly we should still understand it had our customs even a breath of ancient brutality for we can hardly realize in this day the whirlwinds of the unchained libido which roared through the ancient rome of the caesars the civilized man of the present day seems very far removed from that he has become merely neurotic so for us the necessities which brought forth christianity have actually been lost since we no longer understand their meaning we do not know against what it had to protect us for enlightened people the so-called religiousness has already approached very close to a neurosis in the past two thousand years christianity has done its work and has erected barriers of repression which protect us from the sight of our own sinfulness the elementary emotions of the libido have come to be unknown to us for they are carried on in the unconscious therefore the belief which combats them has become hollow and empty let whoever does not believe that a mask covers our religion obtain an impression for himself from the appearance of our modern churches from which style and art have long since fled with this we turn back to the question from which we digressed namely whether or not miss miller has created something valuable with her poem if we bear in mind under what psychologic or moral conditions christianity came into existence that is to say at a time when fierce brutality was an everyday spectacle then we understand the religious seizure of the whole personality and the worth of that religion which defended the people of the roman culture against the visible storms of wickedness it was not difficult for those people to remain conscious of sin for they saw it every day spread out before their eyes the religious product was at that time the accomplishment of the total personality miss miller not only undervalues her sins but the connection between the depressing and unrelenting need and her religious product has even escaped her thus her poetical creation completely loses the living value of a religious product it is not much more than a sentimental transformation of the erotic which is secretly carried out close to consciousness and principally possesses the same worth as the manifest content of the dream with its uncertain and delusive perishableness thus the poem is properly only a dream become audible to the degree that the modern consciousness is eagerly busied with things of a wholly other sort than religion religion and its object original sin have stepped into the background that is to say into the unconscious in great part therefore to-day man believes neither in the one nor in the other consequently the freudian school is accused of an impure fantasy and yet one might convince oneself very easily with a rather fleeting glance at the history of ancient religions and morals as to what kind of demons are harboured in the human soul with this disbelief in the crudeness of human nature is bound up the disbelief in the power of religion the phenomenon well known to every psychoanalyst of the unconscious transformation of an erotic conflict into religious activity is something ethically wholly worthless and nothing but an hysterical production whoever on the other hand to his conscious sin just as consciously places religion in opposition does something the greatness of which cannot be denied this can be verified by a backward glance over history such a procedure is sound religion the unconscious recasting of the erotic into something religious lays itself open to the reproach of a sentimental and ethically worthless pose by means of the secular practice of the naive projection which is as we have seen nothing else than a veiled or indirect real transference through the spiritual through the logos christian training has produced a widespread weakening of the animal nature so that a great part of the strength of the impulses could be set free for the work of social preservation and fruitfulness this abundance of libido to make use of this singular expression pursues with a budding renaissance for example petrarch a course which outgoing antiquity had already sketched out as religious viz the way of the transference to nature the transformation of this libidinous interest is in great part due to the mithraic worship which was a nature religion in the best sense of the word while the primitive christians exhibited throughout an antagonistic attitude to the beauties of this world i remember the passage of st augustine mentioned by j burckhardt 
men draw thither to admire the heights of the mountains and the powerful ways of the sea and to turn away from themselves the foremost authority on the mithre cult franz cumont says as follows the gods were everywhere and mingled in all the events of daily life the fire which cooked the means of nourishment for the believers and which warmed them the water which quenched their thirst and cleansed them also the air which they breathed and the day which shone for them were the objects of their homage perhaps no religion has given to its adherents in so large a degree as mithraism opportunity for prayer and motive for devotion when the initiated betook himself in the evening to the sacred grotto concealed in the solitude of the forest at every step new sensations awakened in his heart some mystical emotion the stars that shone in the sky the wind that whispered in the foliage the spring or brook which hastened murmuring to the valley even the earth which he trod under his feet were in his eyes divine and all surrounding nature a worshipful fear of the infinite forces that swayed the universe these fundamental thoughts of mithraism which like so much else of the ancient spiritual life arose again from their grave during the renaissance are to be found in the beautiful words of seneca when you enter a grove peopled with ancient trees higher than the ordinary and whose boughs are so closely interwoven that the sky cannot be seen the stately shadows of the wood the privacy of the place and the awful gloom cannot but strike you as with the presence of a deity or when we see some cave at the foot of a mountain penetrating the rocks not made by human hands but hollowed out to great depths by nature it fills the mind with a religious fear we venerate the fountain-heads of great rivers the sudden eruption of a vast body of water from the secret places of the earth obtains an altar we adore likewise the springs of warm baths and either the opaque quality or immense depths hath made some lakes sacred all this disappeared in the transitory world of the christian only to break forth much later when the thought of mankind had achieved that independence of the idea which could resist the aesthetic impression so that thought was no longer fettered by the emotional effects of the impression but could rise to reflective observation thus man entered into a new and independent relation to nature whereby the foundation was laid for natural science and technique without however there entered in for the first time a displacement of the weight of interest there arose again real transference which has reached its greatest development in our time materialistic interest has everywhere become paramount therefore the realms of the spirit where earlier the greatest conflicts and developments took place lie deserted and fallow the world has not only lost its god as the sentimentalists of the nineteenth century bewail but also to some extent has lost its soul as well one therefore cannot wonder that the discoveries and doctrines of the freudian school with their wholly psychologic views meet with an almost universal disapproval through the change of the centre of interest from the inner to the outer world the knowledge of nature has increased enormously in comparison with that of earlier times by this the anthropomorphic conception of the religious dogmas has been definitely thrown open to question therefore the present-day religions can only with the greatest difficulty close their eyes to this fact for not only has the intense interest been diverted from the christian religion but criticism and the necessary correction have increased correspondingly the christian religion seems to have fulfilled its great biological purpose in so far as we are able to judge it has led human thought to independence and has lost its significance therefore to a yet undetermined extent in any case its dogmatic contents have become related to mithraism in consideration of the fact that this religion has rendered nevertheless inconceivable service to education one cannot reject it eo ipso to-day it seems to me that we might still make use in some way of its form of thought and especially of its great wisdom of life which for two thousand years has been proven to be particularly efficacious the stumbling-block is the unhappy combination of religion and morality that must be overcome there still remain traces of this strife in the soul the lack of which in a human being is reluctantly felt it is hard to say in what such things consist for this ideas as well as words are lacking if in spite of that i attempt to say something about it i do it parabolically using seneca's words nothing can be more commendable and beneficial if you persevere in the pursuit of wisdom it is what would be ridiculous to wish for when it is in your power to attain it there is no need to lift up your hands to heaven or to pray the servant of the temple to admit you to the ear of the idol that your prayers may be heard the better 
god is near thee he is with thee yes lucilius a holy spirit resides within us the observer of good and evil and our constant guardian and as we treat him he treats us no good man is without a god could any one ever rise above the power of fortune without his assistance it is he that inspires us with thoughts upright just and pure we do not indeed pretend to say what god but that a god dwells in the breast of every good man is certain End of section eight section nine of psychology of the unconscious by carl jung this librivox recording is in the public domain section nine chapter four the song of the moth a little later miss miller travelled from geneva to paris she says my weariness on the railway was so great that i could hardly sleep an hour it was terrifically hot in the lady's carriage at four o'clock in the morning she noticed a moth that flew against the light in her compartment she then tried to go to sleep again suddenly the following poem took possession of her mind the moth to the sun i longed for thee when first i crawled to consciousness my dreams were all of thee when in the chrysalis i lay oft myriads of my kind beat out their lives against some feeble spark once caught from thee and one hour more and my poor life is gone yet my last effort as my first desire shall be but to approach thy glory then having gained one raptured glance i'll die content for i the source of beauty warmth and life have in his perfect splendour once beheld before we go into the material which miss miller offers us for the understanding of the poem we will again cast a glance over the psychologic situation in which the poem originated some months or weeks appear to have elapsed since the last direct manifestation of the unconscious that miss miller reported to us about this period we have had no information we learn nothing about the moods and fantasies of this time if one might draw a conclusion from this silence it would be presumably that in the time which elapsed between the two poems really nothing of importance had happened and that therefore this poem is again but a voiced fragment of the unconscious working of the complex stretching out over months and years it is highly probable that it is concerned with the same complex as before the earlier product a hymn of creation full of hope has however but little similarity to the present poem the poem lying before us has a truly hopeless melancholy character moth and sun two things which never meet one must in fairness ask is a moth really expected to rise to the sun we know indeed the proverbial saying about the moth that flew into the light and singed its wings but not the legend of the moth that strove towards the sun plainly here two things are connected in her thoughts that do not belong together first the moth which fluttered around the light so long that it burnt itself and then the idea of a small ephemeral being something like the day-fly which in lamentable contrast to the eternity of the stars longs for an imperishable daylight this idea reminds one of faust mark how beneath the evening sunlight's glow the green embosomed houses glitter the glow retreats done is the day of toil it yonder hastes new fields of life exploring ah that no wing can lift me from the soil upon its track to follow follow soaring then would i see eternal evening gild the silent world beneath me glowing yet finally the weary god is sinking the new-born impulse fires my mind i hasten on his beams eternal drinking the day before me and the night behind above me heaven unfurled the floor of waves beneath me a glorious dream 
though now the glories fade alas the wings that lift the mind no aid of wings to lift the body can bequeath me not long afterwards thou seest the black dog roving there through cornfields and stubble the dog who is the same as the devil the tempter in whose hellish fires faust has sent his wings when he believed that he was expressing his great longing for the beauty of the sun and the earth he went astray thereover and fell into the hands of the evil one yes resolute to reach some brighter distance on earth's fair sun i turn my back this is what faust had said shortly before in true recognition of the state of affairs the honouring of the beauty of nature led the christian of the middle ages to pagan thoughts which lay in an antagonistic relation to his conscious religion just as once mithraism was in threatening competition with christianity for satan often disguises himself as an angel of light the longing of faust became his ruin the longing for the beyond had brought as a consequence a loathing for life and he stood on the brink of self-destruction the longing for the beauty of this world led him anew to ruin into doubt and pain even to marguerite's tragic death his mistake was that he followed after both worlds with no check to the driving force of his libido like a man of violent passion faust portrays once more the folk psychologic conflict of the beginning of the christian era but what is noteworthy in a reversed order against what fearful powers of seduction christ had to defend himself by means of his hope of the absolute world beyond may be seen in the example of olypius in augustine if any of us had been living in that period of antiquity he would have seen clearly that that culture must inevitably collapse because humanity revolted against it it is well known that even before the spread of christianity a remarkable expectation of redemption had taken possession of mankind the following eclogue of virgil might well be a result of this mood the last age of cumian prophecy has come already over again the great series of the ages commences now too returns the virgin return the saturnian kingdoms now at length a new progeny is sent down from high heaven only chaste lucina to the boy at his birth be propitious in whose time first the age of iron shall discontinue and in the whole world a golden age arise now rules thy apollo under thy guidance if any traces of our guilt continue rendered harmless they shall set the earth free from fear for ever he shall partake of the life of the gods and he shall see heroes mingled with gods and he too shall be seen by them and he shall rule a peaceful world with his father's virtues the turning to asceticism resulting from the general expansion of christianity brought about a new misfortune to many monasticism and the life of the anchorite faust takes the reverse course for him the ascetic ideal means death he struggles for freedom and wins life at the same time giving himself over to the evil one but through this he becomes the bringer of death to her whom he loves most marguerite he tears himself away from pain and sacrifices his life in unceasing useful work through which he saves many lives his double mission as saviour and destroyer has already been hinted in a preliminary manner wagner with what a feeling thou great man must thou receive the people's honest veneration faust thus we our hellish boluses compounding among these vales and hills surrounding worse than the pestilence have passed thousands were done to death from poison of my giving and i must hear by all the living the shameless murderers praised at last a parallel to this double role is that text in the gospel of matthew which has become historically significant i came not to send peace but a sword matthew ten thirty four just this constitutes the deep significance of Gerdes faust that he clothes in words a problem of modern man which has been turning in restless slumber since the renaissance just as was done by the drama of oedipus for the hellenic sphere of culture what is to be the way out between the scylla of renunciation of the world and the charybdis of the acceptance of the world 
the hopeful tone voiced in the hymn to the god of creation cannot continue very long with our author the pose simply promises but does not fulfil the old longing will come again for it is a peculiarity of all complexes worked over merely in the unconscious that they lose nothing of their original amount of effect meanwhile their outward manifestations can change almost endlessly one might therefore consider the first poem as an unconscious longing to solve the conflict through positive religiousness somewhat in the same manner as they of the earlier centuries decided their conscious conflicts by opposing to them the religious standpoint this wish does not succeed now with the second poem there follows a second attempt which turns out in a decidedly more material way its thought is unequivocal only once having gained one raptured glance and then to die from the realms of the religious world the attention just as in faust turns towards the sun of this world and already there is something mingled with it which has another sense that is to say the moth which fluttered so long around the light that it burnt its wings we now pass to that which miss miller offers for the better understanding of the poem she says this small poem made a profound impression upon me i could not of course find immediately a sufficiently clear and direct explanation for it however a few days later when i once more read a certain philosophical work which i had read in berlin the previous winter and which i had enjoyed very much i was reading it aloud to a friend i came across the following words la même aspiration passionnée de la mythe vers l'étoile de l'homme vers dieu the same passionate longing of the moth for the star of man for god i had forgotten this sentence entirely but it seemed very clear to me that precisely these words had reappeared in my hypnagogic poem in addition to that it occurred to me that a play seen some years previously la mythe et la flamme was a further possible cause of the poem it is easy to see how often the word moth had been impressed upon me the deep impression made by the poem upon the author shows that she put into it a large amount of love in the expression aspiration passionne we meet the passionate longing of the moth for the star of man for god and indeed the moth is miss miller herself her last observation that the word moth was often impressed upon her shows how often she had noticed the word moth as applicable to herself her longing for god resembles the longing of the moth for the star the reader will recall that this expression has already had a place in the earlier material when the morning stars sang together that is to say the ship's officer who sings on deck in the night watch the passionate longing for god is the same as that longing for the singing morning stars it was pointed out at great length in the foregoing chapter that this analogy is to be expected sic parvis componere magna solibam it is shameful or exalted just as one chooses that the divine longing of humanity which is really the first thing to make it human should be brought into connection with an erotic fantasy such a comparison jars upon the finer feelings therefore one is inclined in spite of the undeniable facts to dispute the connection an italian steersman with brown hair and black moustache and the loftiest dearest conception of humanity these two things cannot be brought together against this not only our religious feelings revolt but our taste also rebels it would certainly be unjust to make a comparison of the two objects as concrete things since they are so heterogeneous one loves a beethoven sonata but one loves caviar also it would not occur to any one to liken the sonata to caviar it is a common error for one to judge the longing according to the quality of the object the appetite of the gourmand which is only satisfied with goose liver and quail is no more distinguished than the appetite of the labouring man for corned beef and cabbage the longing is the same the object changes nature is beautiful only by virtue of the longing and love given her by man the aesthetic attributes emanating from that has influence primarily on the libido which alone constitutes the beauty of nature the dream recognizes this well when it depicts a strong and beautiful feeling by means of a representation of a beautiful landscape whenever one moves in the territory of the erotic it becomes altogether clear how little the object and how much the love means 
the sexual object is as a rule overrated far too much and that only on account of the extreme degree to which libido is devoted to the object apparently miss miller had but little left over for the officer which is humanly very intelligible but in spite of that a deep and lasting effect emanates from this connection which places divinity on a par with the erotic object the moods which apparently are produced by these objects do not however spring from them but are manifestations of her strong love when miss miller praises either god or the sun she means her love that deepest and strongest impulse of the human and animal being the reader will recall that in the preceding chapter the following chain of synonyms was adduced the singer god of sound singing morning star creator god of light sun fire god of love at that time we had placed sun and fire in parentheses now they are entitled to their right place in the chain of synonyms with the changing of the erotic impression from the affirmative to the negative the symbols of light occur as the paramount object in the second poem where the longings clearly exposed it is by no means the terrestrial sun since the longing has been turned away from the real object its object has become first of all a subjective one namely god psychologically however god is the name of a representation complex which is grouped around a strong feeling the sum of libido properly the feeling is what gives character and reality to the complex the attributes and symbols of the divinity must belong in a consistent manner to the feeling longing love libido and so on if one honors god the sun or the fire then one honors one's own vital force the libido it is as seneca says god is near you he is with you in you god is our own longing to which we pay divine honors if it were not known how tremendously significant religion was and is this marvellous play with oneself would appear absurd there must be something more than this however because notwithstanding its absurdity it is in a certain sense conformable to the purpose in the highest degree to bear a god within oneself signifies a great deal it is a guarantee of happiness of power indeed even of omnipotence as far as these attributes belong to the deity to bear a god within one's self signifies just as much as to be god one's self in christianity where it is true the grossly sensual representations and symbols are weeded out as carefully as possible which seems to be a continuation of the poverty of symbols of the jewish cult there are to be found plain traces of this psychology there are even plainer traces to be sure in the becoming one with god in those mysteries closely related to the christian where the mystic himself is lifted up to divine adoration through initiatory rites at the close of the consecration into the isis mysteries the mystic was crowned with the palm crown he was placed on a pedestal and worshipped as helios in the magic papyrus of the mithraic liturgy published by diederich there is the sacred word of the consecrated one i am a star wandering about with you and flaming up from the depths the mystic in religious ecstasies put himself on a plane with the stars just as a saint of the middle ages put himself by means of the stigmata on a level with christ st francis of assisi expressed this in a truly pagan manner even as far as a close relationship with the brother sun and the sister moon these representations of becoming one with god are very ancient the old belief removed the becoming one with god until the time after death the mysteries however suggest this as taking place already in this world a very old text brings most beautifully before one this unity with god it is the song of triumph of the ascending soul i am the god atum i who alone was i am the god ray at his first splendor i am the great god self-created god of gods to whom no other god compares i was yesterday and no to-morrow the battleground of gods was made when i spoke i know the name of that great god who tarries therein i am that great phoenix who is in heliopolis who there keeps account of all there is of all that exists i am the god men at his coming forth who placed the feathers upon my head i am in my country i come into my city daily i am together with my father atum my impurity is driven away and the sin which was in me is overcome 
i wash myself in those two great pools of water which are in heracleopolis in which is purified the sacrifice of mankind for that great god who abideth there i go on my way to where i wash my head in the sea of the righteous i arrive at this land of the glorified and enter through the splendid portal thou who standest before me stretch out to me thy hands it is i i am become one of thee daily am i together with my father atum the identification with god necessarily has as a result the enhancing of the meaning and power of the individual that seems first of all to have been really its purpose a strengthening of the individual against his all too great weakness and insecurity in real life this great megalomania thus has a genuinely pitiable background the strengthening of the consciousness of power is however only an external result of the becoming one with god of much more significance are the deeper lying disturbances in the realm of feeling whoever introverts libido that is to say whoever takes it away from a real object without putting in its place a real compensation is overtaken by the inevitable results of introversion the libido which is turned inward into the subject awakens again from among the sleeping remembrances one which contains the path upon which earlier the libido once had come to the real object at the very first and in foremost position it was father and mother who were the objects of the childish love they are unequalled and imperishable now many difficulties are needed in an adult's life to cause those memories to reawaken and to become effectual in religion the regressive reanimation of the father and mother imago is organized into a system the benefits of religion are the benefits of parental hands its protection and its peace are the results of parental care upon the child its mystic feelings are the unconscious memories of the tender emotions of the first childhood just as the hymn expresses it i am in my country i come into my city daily am i together with my father atum the visible father of the world is however the sun the heavenly fire therefore father god son fire are mythologically synonymous the well-known fact that in the sun's strength the great regenerative power of nature is honoured shows plainly very plainly to any one to whom as yet it may not be clear that in the deity man honours his own libido and naturally in the form of the image or symbol of the present object of transference this symbol faces us in an especially marked manner in the third logos of the Diederik papyrus after the second prayer stars come from the disk of the sun to the mystic five pointed in quantities filling the whole air if the sun's disk has expanded you will see an immeasurable circle and fiery gates which are shut off the mystic utters the following prayer hear me grant me my prayer binding together the fiery bolts of heaven with spirit two-bodied fiery sky creator of humanity fire-breathing fiery spirited spiritual being rejoicing in fire beauty of humanity ruler of humanity of fiery body like giver to men fire scattering fire agitated life of humanity fire world mover of men who confounds with thunder famed among men increasing the human race enlightening humanity conqueror of stars the invocation is as one sees almost inexhaustible in light and fire attributes and can be likened in its extravagance only to the synonymous attributes of love of the mystic of the middle ages among the innumerable texts which might be used as an illustration of this i select a passage from the writings of mechtild von magsburg twelve twelve to twelve seventy seven o lord love me excessively and love me often and long the oftener you love me so much the purer do i become the more excessively you love me the more beautiful i become the longer you love me the more holy will i become here upon earth god answered that i love you often that i have from my nature for i myself am love that i love you excessively that i have from my desire for i too desire that men love me excessively that i love you long that i have from my everlastingness for i am without end the religious regression makes use indeed of the parent image without however consciously making it an object of transference for the incest horror forbids that it remains rather as a synonym for example of the father or of god or the more or less personified symbol of the sun and fire sun and fire that is to say the fructifying strength and heat are attributes of the libido in mysticism the inwardly perceived divine vision is often merely sun or light and is very little or not at all personified in the mithraic liturgy there is found for example a significant quotation 
the path of the visible gods will appear through the sun the god my father hildegard von bingen eleven hundred to eleven seventy eight expresses herself in the following manner but the light i see is not local but far off and brighter than the cloud which supports the sun i can in no way know the form of this light since i cannot entirely see the sun's disk but within this light i see at times and infrequently another light which is called by me the living light but when and in what manner i see this i do not know how to say and when i see it all weariness and need is lifted from me then too i feel like a simple girl and not like an old woman simeon the new theologian nine seventy to ten forty says the following my tongue lacks works and what happens in me my spirit sees clearly but does not explain it sees the invisible that emptiness of all forms simple throughout not complex and in extent infinite for it sees no beginning and it sees no end it is entirely unconscious of the meanings and does not know what to call that which it sees something complete appears it seems to me not indeed through the being itself but through a participation for you enkindle fire from fire and you receive the whole fire but this remains undiminished and undivided as before similarly that which is divided separates itself from the first and like something corporeal spreads itself into several lights this however is something spiritual immeasurable indivisible and inexhaustible for it is not separated when it becomes many but remains undivided and is in me and enters within my poor heart like a sun or circular disk of the sun similar to the light for it is a light that that thing perceived as inner light as the sun of the other world is longing is clearly shown by simeon's words and following it my spirit demanded to embrace the splendour beheld but it found it not as creature and did not succeed in coming out from among created beings so that it might embrace that uncreated and uncomprehended splendour nevertheless it wandered everywhere and strove to behold it it penetrated the air it wandered over the heavens it crossed over the abysses it searched as it seemed to it the ends of the world but in all of that it found nothing for all was created and i lamented and was sorrowful and my breast burned and i lived as one distraught in mind but it came as it would and descending like a luminous mystic cloud it seemed to envelop my whole head so that dismayed i cried out it left me alone and when i troubled sought for it i realized suddenly that it was in me myself and in the midst of my heart it appeared as the light of a spherical sun in nietzsche's glory and eternity we meet with an essentially similar symbol hush i see vastness and of vasty things shall man be done unless he can enshrine them with his words then take the night which brings the heart upon thy tongue charmed wisdom mine i look above there rolls the star-strewn sea o night mute silence voiceless cry of stars and lo a sign the heaven its verge unbars a shining constellation falls towards me it is not astonishing if nietzsche's great inner loneliness calls again into existence certain forms of thought which the mystic ecstasy of the old cults has elevated to ritual representation in the visions of the mithraic liturgy we have to deal with many similar representations which we can now understand without difficulty as the ecstatic symbol of the libido after you have said the second prayer when silence is twice commanded then whistle twice and snap twice and straightway you will see many five-pointed stars coming down from the sun and filling the whole lower air but say once again silence silence and you neophyte will see the circle and fiery doors cut off from the opening disk of the sun silence is commanded then the vision of light is revealed the similarity of the mystic's condition and nietzsche's poetical vision is surprising nietzsche says constellation it is well known that constellations are chiefly thereo or anthropomorphic symbols the papyrus says five-fingered stars similar to the rosy-fingered eos which is nothing else than an anthropomorphic image accordingly one may expect from that that by long gazing a living being would be formed out of the flame image a star constellation of thereo or anthropomorphic nature for the symbolism of the libido does not end with sun 
light and fire but makes use of wholly other means of expression i yield precedence to nietzsche the beacon here where the island grew amid the seas the sacrificial rock high towering here under darkling heavens zarathustra lights his mountain fires these flames with grey white belly in cold distances sparkle their desire stretches its neck towards ever pure heights a snake upreared in impatience this signal i set up there before me this flame is mine own soul insatiable for new distances speeding upward upward its silent heat at all lonely ones i now throw my fishing rod give answer to the flame's impatience let me the fisher on high mountains catch my seventh last solitude here libido becomes fire flame and snake the egyptian symbol of the living disk of the sun the disk with the two entwining snakes contains the combination of both the libido analogies the disk of the sun with its fructifying warmth is analogous to the fructifying warmth of love the comparison of the libido with sun and fire is in reality analogous there is also a causative element in it for sun and fire as beneficent powers are objects of human love for example the sun hero mithra is called the well-beloved in nietzsche's poem the comparison is also a causative one but this time in a reversed sense the comparison with the snake is unequivocally phallic corresponding completely with the tendency in antiquity which was to see in the symbol of the phallus the quintessence of life and fruitfulness the phallus is the source of life and libido the greater creator and worker of miracles and as such it received reverence everywhere we have therefore three designating symbols of the libido first the comparison by analogy as sun and fire second the comparisons based on causative relations as a object comparison the libido is designated by its object for example the beneficent sun b the subject comparison in which the libido is designated by its place of origin or by analogies of this for example by phallus or analogous snake to these two fundamental forms of comparison still a third is added in which the tertium comparationis is the activity for example the libido is dangerous when fecundating like the bull through the power of its passion like the lion like the raging boar when in heat like the ever rutting ass and so on this activity comparison can belong equally well to the category of the analogous or to the category of the causative comparisons the possibilities of comparison mean just as many possibilities for symbolic expression and from this basis all the infinitely varied symbols so far as they are libido images may properly be reduced to a very simple root that is just to libido and its fixed primitive qualities this psychologic reduction and simplification is in accordance with the historic efforts of civilization to unify and simplify to syncretize the endless number of the gods we come across this desire as far back as the old egyptians where the unlimited polytheism as exemplified in the numerous demons of places finally necessitated simplification all the various local gods amon of thebes horus of ephu horus of the east Kunum of elephantine atum of heliopolis and others became identified with the sun god re in the hymns to the sun the composite being amon re har Marcus, atum was invoked as the only god which truly lives amenhotep the fourth eighteenth dynasty went the furthest in this direction he replaced all former gods by the living great disk of the sun the official title reading the sun ruling both horizons triumphant in the horizon in his name the glittering splendor which is in the sun's disk and indeed Armon adds the sun as a god should not be honored but the sun itself as the planet which imparts through its rays the infinite life which is in it to all living creatures amenhotep the fourth by his reform completed a work which is psychologically important he united all the bull ram crocodile and pile dwelling gods into the disk of the sun and made it clear that their various attributes were compatible with the sun's attributes a similar fate overtook the hellenic and roman polytheism through the syncretistic efforts of later centuries the beautiful prayer of lucius to the queen of the heavens furnishes an important proof of this 
queen of heaven whether thou art the genial ceres the prime parent of fruits or whether thou art celestial venus or whether thou art the sister of phoebus or whether thou art proserpina terrific with midnight howlings with that feminine brightness of thine illuminating the walls of every city this attempt to gather again into a few units the religious thoughts which were divided in countless variations and personified in individual gods according to their polytheistic distribution and separation makes clear the fact that already at an earlier time analogies had formerly arisen herodotus is rich in just such references not to mention the systems of the hellenic roman world opposed to the endeavour to form a unity there stands a still stronger endeavour to create again and again a multiplicity so that even in the so-called severe monotheistic religions as christianity for example the polytheistic tendency is irrepressible the deity is divided into three parts at least to which is added the feminine deity of mary and the numerous company of the lesser gods the angels and saints respectively these two tendencies are in constant warfare there is only one god with countless attributes or else there are many gods who are then simply known differently according to lo locality and personify sometimes this sometimes that attribute of the fundamental thought an example of which we have seen above in the egyptian gods with this we turn once more to nietzsche's poem the beacon we found the flame there used as an image of the libido theriomorphically represented as a snake also as an image of the soul this flame is mine own soul we saw that the snake is to be taken as a phallic image of the libido upreared in impatience and that this image also attribute of the conception of the sun the egyptian sun idol is an image of the libido in the combination of sun and phallus it is not a wholly strange conception therefore that the sun's disc is represented with a penis as well as with hands and feet we find proof for this idea in a peculiar part of the mithraic liturgy in like manner the so-called tube the origin of the ministering wind will become visible for it will appear to you as a tube hanging down from the sun this extremely important vision of a tube hanging down from the sun will produce in a religious text such as that of the mithraic liturgy a strange and at the same time meaningless effect if it did not have the phallic meaning the tube is the place of origin of the wind the phallic meaning seems very faint in this idea but one must remember that the wind as well as the sun is a fructifier and creator this has already been pointed out in a footnote there is a picture by a germanic painter of the middle ages of the conceptio immaculata which deserves mention here the conception is represented by a tube or pipe coming down from heaven and passing beneath the skirt of mary into this flies the holy ghost in the form of a dove for the impregnation of the mother of god honegger discovered the following hallucination in an insane man paranoid dement the patient sees in the sun an upright tail similar to an erected penis when he moves his head back and forth then to the sun's penis sways back and forth in a like manner and out of that the wind arises this strange hallucination remained unintelligible to us for a long time until i became acquainted with the mithraic liturgy and its visions this hallucination threw an illuminating light as it appears to me upon a very obscure place in the text which immediately follows the passage previously cited me translate this very clearly and towards the regions westward as though it were an infinite east wind but if the other wind towards the regions of the east should be in service in the like fashion shalt thou see towards the regions of that side the converse of the sight in the original o thou pua is the vision the thing seen anapatha means properly the carrying away the sense of the text according to this might be the thing seen may be carried or turned sometimes here sometimes there according to the direction of the wind the o thou pua is the tube the place of origin of the wind which turns sometimes to the east sometimes to the west and one might add generates the corresponding wind the vision of the insane man coincides astonishingly with the description of the movement of the tube the various attributes of the sun separated into a series appear one after the other in the mithraic liturgy according to the vision of helios seven maidens appear with the heads of snakes and seven gods with the heads of black bulls End of section nine.
section ten of psychology of the unconscious by carl jung this librivox recording is in the public domain section ten it is easy to understand the maiden as a symbol of the libido used in the sense of causative comparison the snake in paradise is usually considered as feminine as the seductive principle in woman and is represented as feminine by the old artists although properly the snake has a phallic meaning through a similar change of meaning the snake in antiquity becomes the symbol of the earth which on its side is always considered feminine the bull is the well-known symbol for the fruitfulness of the sun the bull gods in the mithraic liturgy were called guardians of the axis of the earth by whom the axle of the orb of the heavens was turned the divine man mithra also had the same attributes he is sometimes called the soul invictus itself sometimes the mighty companion and ruler of helios he holds in his right hand the bare constellation which moves and turns the heavens the bull-headed gods equally the greek counterpart with mithra himself to whom the attribute young one the newcomer is given are merely attributive components of the same divinity the chief god of the mithraic liturgy is himself subdivided into mithra and helios the attributes of each of these are closely related to the other of helios it is said you will see the god youthful graceful with glowing locks in a white garment and a scarlet cloak with a fiery helmet of mithra it is said you will see a god very powerful with a shining countenance young with golden hair clothed in white vestments with a golden crown holding in his right hand a bullock's golden shoulder that is the bare constellation which wandering hourly up and down moves and turns the heavens and out of his eyes you will see lightning spring forth and from his body stars if we place fire and gold as essentially similar then a great accord is found in the attributes of the two gods to these mystical pagan ideas there deserve to be added the probably almost contemporaneous vision of revelation and being turned i saw seven golden candlesticks and in the midst of the candlesticks one like unto the son of man clothed with a garment down to the foot and girt about at the breast with a golden girdle and his head and his hair were white as white wool white as snow and his eyes were as a flame of fire and his feet like unto burnished brass as if it had been refined in a furnace and his voice as the sound of many waters and he had in his right hand seven stars and out of his mouth proceeded a sharp two-edged sword and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength revelation one twelve following lines and i looked and beheld a white cloud and upon the cloud i saw one sitting like unto the son of man having on his head a golden crown and in his hand a sharp sickle revelations fourteen fourteen and his eyes were as a flame of fire and upon his head were many diadems and he was arrayed in a garment sprinkled with blood and the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses clothed in fine linen white and pure and out of his mouth proceeded a sharp sword revelation nineteen twelve through fifteen one need not assume that there is a direct dependency between the apocalypse and the mithraic liturgy the visionary images of both texts are developed from a source not limited to one place but found in the soul of many diverse people because the symbols which arise from it are too typical for it to belong to one individual only i put these images here to show how the primitive symbolism of light gradually developed with the increasing depth of the vision into the idea of the sun hero the well-beloved the development of the symbol of light is thoroughly typical in addition to this perhaps i might call to mind the fact that i have previously pointed out this course with numerous examples and therefore i can spare myself the trouble of returning to this subject these visionary occurrences are the psychological roots of the sun coronations in the mysteries its rite is religious hallucination congealed into liturgical form which on account of its great regularity 
could become a generally accepted outer form after all this it is easily understood how the ancient christian church on one side stood in an especial bond to christ as sole novus and on the other side had a certain difficulty in freeing itself from the earthly symbols of christ indeed philo of alexandria saw in the sun the image of the divine logos or of the deity especially de somnius one eighty five in an ambrosian hymn christ is invoked by o sol salutis and so on at the time of marcus aurelius meliton in his work called christ the helios the rising sun the only sun rising from heaven still more important is a passage from pseudo cyprian oh how remarkable a providence that christ should be born on the same day on which the sun moves onward the cow of april the fourth holiday and for this reason the prophet malachi spoke to the people concerning christ unto you shall the son of righteousness arise with healing in his wings this is the son of righteousness in whose wings healing shall be displayed in a work nominally attributed to john chrysostomus de solstitiis et equinoctiis occurs this passage moreover the lord is born in the month of december in the winter on the eighth cow of january when the ripe olives are gathered so that the oil that is the chrism may be produced moreover they call it the birthday of the unconquered one who in any case is as unconquered as our lord who conquered death itself or why should they call it the birthday of the son he himself is the son of righteousness concerning whom malachi the prophet spoke the lord is the author of light and of darkness he is the judge spoken of by the prophet as the son of righteousness according to the testimony of eusebius of alexandria the christians also shared in the worship of the rising sun which lasted into the fifth century ah woe to the worshippers of the sun and the moon and the stars for i know many worshippers and prayer sayers to the sun for now at the rising of the sun they worship and say have mercy on us and not only the sun gnostics and the heretics do this but also christians who leave their faith and mix with the heretics augustine preached emphatically to the christians known as dominus so factus sed periquem so factus est ne quis carnalita sapiens solum istum christum intelligendum putarit art has preserved much of the remnants of sun worship thus the nimbus around the head of christ and the halo of the saints in general the christian legends also attribute many fire and light symbols to the saints the twelve apostles for example are likened to the twelve signs of the zodiac and are represented therefore with a star over the head it is not to be wondered at that the heathen as tertullian avows considered the sun as the christian god among the manichaeans god was really the sun one of the most remarkable works extant where the pagan asiatic hellenic and christian intermingle is the text edited by worth this is a book of fables but nevertheless a mine for near christian fantasies which gives a profound insight into christian symbolism in this is found the following magical dedication to zeus the great sun god the king the saviour in certain parts of armenia the rising sun is still worshipped by christians that it may let its foot rest upon the faces of the worshippers the foot occurs as an anthropomorphic attribute and we have already met the theriomorphic attribute in the feathers and the sun phallus other comparisons of the sun's ray as knife sword arrow and so on have also as we have learned from the psychology of the dream a phallic meaning at bottom this meaning is attached to the foot as i here point out and also to the feathers or hair of the sun which signify the power or strength of the sun i refer to the story of samson and to that of the apocalypse of baruch concerning the phoenix bird which flying before the sun loses its feathers and exhausted is strengthened again in an ocean bath at evening under the symbol of moth and sun 
we have dug down into the historic depths of the soul and in doing this we have uncovered an old buried idol the youthful beautiful fire encircled and halo crowned sun hero who forever unattainable to the mortal wanders upon the earth causing night to follow day winter summer death life and who returns again in rejuvenated splendor and gives light to new generations the longing of the dreamer concealed behind the moth stands for him the ancient pre-asiatic civilizations were acquainted with a sun worship having the idea of a god dying and rising again osiris tammuz addis adonis christ mithra and his bull phoenix and so on the beneficent power as well as the destroying power was worshipped in fire the forces of nature always have two sides as we have already seen in the god of job this reciprocal bond brings us back once more to miss miller's poem her reminiscences support our previous supposition that the symbol of moth and sun is a condensation of two ideas about one of which we have just spoken the other is the moth and the flame as the title of a play about the contents of which the author tells us absolutely nothing moth and flame may easily have the well-known erotic meaning of flying around the flame of passion until one's wings are burned the passionate longing that is to say the libido has its two sides it is power which beautifies everything and which under other circumstances destroys everything it often appears as if one could not accurately understand in what the destroying quality of the creative power consists a woman who gives herself up to passion particularly under the present-day condition of culture experiences the destructive side only too soon one has only to imagine one's self a little away from the everyday moral conditions in order to understand what feelings of extreme insecurity overwhelm the individual who gives himself unconditionally over to fate to be fruitful means indeed to destroy one's self because with the rise of the succeeding generation the previous one has passed beyond its highest point thus our descendants are our most dangerous enemies whom we cannot overcome for they will outlive us and therefore without fail will take the power from our enfeebled hands the anxiety in the face of the erotic fate is wholly understandable for there is something immeasurable therein fate usually hides unknown dangers and the perpetual hesitation of the neurotic to venture upon life is easily explained by his desire to be allowed to stand still so as not to take part in the dangerous battle of life whoever renounces the chance to experience must stifle in himself the wish for it and therefore commits a sort of self-murder from this the death fantasies which readily accompany the renunciation of the erotic wish are made clear in the poem miss miller has voiced these fantasies she adds further to the material with the following i had been reading a selection from one of byron's poems which pleased me very much and made a deep and lasting impression moreover the rhythm of my last two verses for i the source etc and the two lines of byron's are very similar now let me die as i have lived in faith nor tremble though the universe should quake this reminiscence with which the series of ideas is closed confirms the death fantasies which follow from renunciation of the erotic wish the quotation comes which miss miller did not mention from an uncompleted poem of byron's called heaven and earth the whole verse follows still blessed be the lord for what is past for that which is for all are his from first to last time space eternity life death the vast known and immeasurable unknown he made and can unmake and shall i for a little gasp of breath blaspheme and groan no let me die as i have lived in faith nor quiver though the universe may quake the words are included in a kind of praise or prayer spoken by a mortal who is in hopeless plight before the mounting deluge miss miller puts herself in the same situation in her quotation that is to say she readily lets it be seen 
that her feeling is similar to the despondency of the unhappy ones who find themselves hard pressed by the threatening mounting waters of the deluge with this the writer allows us a deep look into the dark abyss of her longing for the sun hero we see that her longing is in vain she is immortal only for a short time borne upwards into the light by means of the highest longing and then sinking to death or much more urged upwards by the fear of death like the people before the deluge and in spite of the desperate conflict irretrievably given over to destruction this is a mood which recalls vividly the closing scene in cyrano de bergerac cyrano o may peace quel et en chemin je l'attendrai debout et les prêts à la main que dites-vous c'est inutile je le sais mais on ne se bat pas dans l'espoir du succès non non c'est bien plus beau lorsque c'est inutile je sais bien qu'à la fin vous me mettrez à pas we already know sufficiently well what longing and what impulse it is that attempts to clear a way for itself to the light but that it may be realized quite clearly and irrevocably it is shown plainly in the quotation no let me die which confirms and completes all earlier remarks the divine the much beloved who is honoured in the image of the sun is also the goal of the longing of our poet byron's heaven and earth is a mystery founded on the following passage from genesis chapter six two and it came to pass that the sons of god saw the daughters of men that they were fair and they took them wives of all that they chose byron offers as a further motif for his poem the following passage from coleridge and woman wailing for her demon lover byron's poem is concerned with two great events one psychologic and one telluric the passion which throws down all barriers and all the terrors of the unchained powers of nature a parallel which has already been introduced into our earlier discussion the angels samyasa and azazel burn with sinful love for the beautiful daughters of cain anna and Hala and force a way through the barrier which is placed between mortal and immortal they revolt as lucifer once did against god and the archangel raphael raises his voice warningly but man hath listened to his voice and ye to woman's beautiful she is the serpent's voice less subtle than her kiss the snake but vanquished dust but she will draw a second host from heaven to break heaven's law the power of god is threatened by the seduction of passion a second fall of angels menaces heaven let us translate this mythologic projection back into the psychologic from whence it originated then it would read the power of the good and reasonable ruling the world wisely is threatened by the chaotic primitive power of passion therefore passion must be exterminated that is to say projected into mythology the race of cain and the whole sinful world must be destroyed from the roots by the deluge it is the inevitable result of that sinful passion which has broken through all barriers its counterpart is the sea and the waters of the deep and the floods of rain the generating fructifying and maternal waters as the indian mythology refers to them now they leave their natural bounds and surge over the mountain tops engulfing all living things for passion destroys itself the libido is god and devil with the destruction of the sinfulness of the libido an essential portion of the libido would be destroyed through the loss of the devil god himself suffered a considerable loss somewhat like an amputation upon the body of the divinity the mysterious hint in raphael's lament concerning the two rebels samyasa and azazel suggests this why cannot this earth be made or be destroyed without involving ever some vast void in the immortal ranks love raises man not only above himself but also above the bounds of his mortality and earthliness up to divinity itself and in the very act of raising him it destroys him mythologically this self-presumption finds its striking expression 
in the building of the heaven-high tower of babel which brings confusion to mankind in byron's poem it is the sinful ambition of the race of cain for love of which it makes even the stars subservient and leads away the sons of god themselves if indeed longing for the highest things if i may speak so is legitimate then it lies in the circumstances that it leaves its human boundaries that of sinfulness and therefore destruction the longing of the moth for the star is not absolutely pure and transparent but glows in sultry mist for man continues to be man through the excess of his longing he draws down the divine into the corruption of his passion therefore he seems to raise himself to the divine but with that his humanity is destroyed thus the love of anna and ahobama for their angels becomes the ruin of gods and men the invocation with which cain's daughters implore their angels is psychologically an exact parallel to miss miller's poem anna seraph from thy sphere whatever star contains thy glory in the eternal depths of heaven albeit thou watchest with the seven though through space infinite and hoary before thy bright wings worlds will be driven yet here o oh, think of her who holds thee dear and though she nothing is to thee yet think that thou art all to her eternity is in thy years unborn undying beauty in thine eyes with me thou canst not sympathize except in love and there thou must acknowledge that more loving dust ne'er wept beneath the skies thou walkest by many worlds thou seest the face of him who made thee great as he hath made of me the least of those cast out from eden's gate yet seraph dear o oh, hear for thou hast loved me and i would not die until i know what i must die in knowing that thou forgettest in thine eternity her whose heart death could not keep from o'erflowing for thee immortal essence as thou art great is their love who love in sin and fear and such i feel are waging in my heart a war unworthy to an adamite forgive my seraph that such thoughts appear for sorrow is our element the hour is near which tells me we are not abandoned quite appear appear seraph my own azazel be but here and leave the stars to their own light ahola bama i call thee i wait thee and i love thee though i be formed of clay and thou of beams more bright than those of day on eden's streams thine immortality cannot repay with love more warm than mine my love there is a ray in me which though forbidden yet to shine i feel was lighted at thy gods and mine it may be hidden long death and decay our mother eve bequeathed us but my heart defies it though this life must pass away is that a cause for thee and me to part i can share all things even immortal sorrow for thou hast ventured to share life with me and shall i shrink from thine eternity no though the serpent's sting should pierce me through and thou thyself wert like the serpent coil around me still and i will smile and curse thee not but hold thee in as warm a fold as but descend and prove a mortal's love for an immortal the apparition of both angels which follows the invocation is as always a shining vision of light aholibama the clouds from off their pinions flinging as though they bore to-morrow's light anna but if our father see the sight aholibama he would but deem it was the moon rising unto some sorcerer's tomb an hour too soon anna lo they have kindled all the west like a returning sunset on ararat's late secret crest a wild and many-coloured bow the remnant of their flashing path now shines at the sight of this many-coloured vision of light where both women are entirely filled with desire and expectation anna makes use of a simile full of presentiment which suddenly allows us to look down once more into the dismal dark depths out of which for a moment the terrible animal nature of the mild god of light emerges and now behold it hath returned to night as rippling foam which the leviathan hath lashed from his unfathomable home 
when sporting on the face of the calm deep subsides soon after he again hath dashed down down to where the ocean's fountains sleep thus like the leviathan we recall this overpowering weight in the scale of god's justice in regard to the man job there where the deep sources of the ocean are the leviathan lives from there the all-destroying flood ascends the all-engulfing flood of animal passion that stifling compressing feeling of the onward surging impulse is projected mythologically as a flood which rising up and over all destroys all that exists in order to allow a new and better creation to come forth from this destruction Japhet, the eternal will shall deign to expound this dream of good and evil and redeem unto himself all times all things and gathered under his almighty wings abolish hell and to the expiated earth restore the beauty of her birth spirits and when shall take effect this wondrous spell Japhet, when the redeemer cometh first in pain and then in glory spirits new times new climes new arts new men but still the same old tears old crimes and oldest ill shall be amongst your race in different forms but the same mortal storms shall oversweep the future as the waves in a few hours the glorious giants graves the prophetic visions of Japhet have almost prophetic meaning for our poetess with the death of the moth in the light evil is once more laid aside the complex has once again even if in a censored form expressed itself with that however the problem is not solved all sorrow and every longing begins again from the beginning but there is promise in the air the premonition of the redeemer of the well-beloved of the sun hero who again mounts to the height of the sun and again descends to the coldness of the winter who is the light of hope from race to race the image of the libido end of section ten section eleven of psychology of the unconscious by carl jung this librivox recording is in the public domain part two chapter one aspects of the libido before i enter upon the contents of this second part it seems necessary to cast a backward glance over the singular train of thought which the analysis of the poem the moth to the sun has produced although this poem is very different from the foregoing hymn of creation closer investigation of the longing for the sun has carried us into the realm of the fundamental ideas of religion and astral mythology which ideas are closely related to those considered in the first poem the creative god of the first poem whose dual nature moral and physical was shown especially clearly to us by job has in the second poem a new qualification of astral mythological or to express it better of astrological character the god becomes the sun and in this finds an adequate natural expression quite apart from the moral division of the god idea into the heavenly father and the devil the sun is as renan remarked really the only rational representation of god whether we take the point of view of the barbarians of other ages or that of the modern physical sciences in both cases the sun is the parent god mythologically predominantly the father god from whom all living things draw life he is the fructifier and creator of all that lives the source of energy of our world the discord into which the soul of man has fallen through the action of moral laws can be resolved into complete harmony through the sun as the natural object which obeys no human moral law the sun is not only beneficial but also destructive therefore the zodiacal representation of the august heat is the herd devouring lion whom the jewish hero samson killed 
in order to free the parched earth from this plague yet it is the harmonious and inherent nature of the sun to scorch and its scorching power seems natural to men it shines equally on the just and on the unjust and allows useful living objects to flourish as well as harmful ones therefore the sun is adapted as is nothing else to represent the visible god of this world that is to say that driving strength of our own soul which we call libido and whose nature it is to allow the useful and injurious the good and the bad to proceed that this comparison is no mere play of words is taught us by the mystics when by looking inwards introversion and going down into the depths of their own being they find in their heart the image of the sun they find their own love or libido which with reason i might say with physical reason is called the sun for our source of energy and life is the sun thus our life substance as an energetic process is entirely sun of what special sort this sun energy seen inwardly by the mystic is is shown by an example taken from the hindu mythology from the explanation of part three of the shvetashvatraupanishad we take the following quotation which relates to the rudra two yea the one rudra who all these worlds with ruling power doth rule stands not for any second behind those that are born he stands at ending time in gathers all the worlds he hath evolved protector he three he hath eyes on all sides on all sides surely hath faces arms surely on all sides on all sides feet with arms with wings he tricks them out creating heaven and earth the only god four who of the gods is both the source and growth the lord of all the rudra mighty seer who brought the shining germ of old into existence may he with reason pure conjoin us these attributes allow us clearly to discern the all creator and in him the sun which has wings and with a thousand eyes scans the world the following passages confirm the text and join to it the idea most important for us that god is also contained in the individual creature seven beyond this world the brahman beyond the mighty one in every creature hid according to its form the one encircling lord of all him having known immortal they become eight i know this mighty man sunlike beyond the darkness him and him only knowing one crosseth over death no other path at all is there to go eleven spread over the universe is he the lord therefore as all pervader he's benign the powerful god the equal of the sun is in that one and whoever knows him is immortal going on further with the text we come upon a new attribute which informs us in what form and manner rudra lived in men twelve the mighty monarch he the man the one who doth the essence start towards that peace of perfect stainlessness lordly exhaustless light thirteen the man the size of a thumb the inner self sits ever in the heart of all that's born by mind mind ruling in the heart is he revealed that they who know immortal they become fourteen the man of the thousands of heads and thousands of eyes and thousands of feet covering the earth on all sides he stands beyond ten finger breaths fifteen the man is verily this all both what has been and what will be lord too of deathlessness which far all else surpasses important parallel quotations are to be found in the kathopanishad section two part four twelve the man of the size of a thumb resides in the midst within the self of the past and the future the lord 
thirteen the man of the size of a thumb like flame free from smoke of past and of future the lord the same is to-day to-morrow the same will he be who this tom thumb is can easily be divined the phallic symbol of the libido the phallus is this hero dwarf who performs great deeds he this ugly god in homely form who is the great doer of wonders since he is the visible expression of the creative strength incarnate in man this extraordinary contrast is also very striking in faust the mother scene mephistopheles i'll praise thee ere we separate i see thou knowest the devil thoroughly here take this key faust that little thing mephistopheles take hold of it not undervaluing faust it glows it shines increases in my hand mephistopheles how much it is worth thou soon shalt understand the key will scent the true place from all others follow it down twill lead thee to the mothers here the devil again puts into faust's hand the marvellous tool a phallic symbol of the libido as once before in the beginning the devil in the form of the black dog accompanied faust when he introduced himself with the words part of that power not understood which always wills the bad and always creates the good united to this strength faust succeeded in accomplishing his real life task at first through evil adventure and then for the benefit of humanity for without the evil there is no creative power here in the mysterious mother scene where the poet unveils the last mystery of the creative power to the initiated faust has need of the phallic magic wand in the magic strength of which he has at first no confidence in order to perform the greatest of wonders namely the creation of paris and helen with that faust attains the divine power of working miracles and indeed only by means of this small insignificant instrument this paradoxical impression seems to be very ancient for even the upanishads could say the following of the dwarf god nineteen without hands without feet he moveth he graspeth eyeless he seeth and earless he heareth he knoweth what is to be known yet is there no knower of him him called the first mighty the man twenty smaller than small yet greater than great in the heart of this creature the self doth repose etc the phallus is the being which moves without limbs which sees without eyes which knows the future and as symbolic representative of the universal creative power existent everywhere immortality is vindicated in it it is always thought of as entirely independent an idea current not only in antiquity but also apparent in the pornographic drawings of our children and artists it is a seer an artist and a worker of wonders therefore it should not surprise us when certain phallic characteristics are found again in the mythological seer artist and sorcerer hephaestus Velen the smith and mani the founder of manichaeism whose followers were also famous have crippled feet the ancient seer melampus possessed a suggestive name blackfoot and it seems also to be typical for seers to be blind dwarfed stature ugliness and deformity have become especially typical for those mysterious chthonian gods the sons of hephaestus the cabriri to whom great power to perform miracles was ascribed the name signifies powerful and the samothracian cult is most intimately united with that of the ithithalic hermes who according to the account of herodotus was brought to attica by the pelasgians they are also called the great gods their near relations are the idean dactyli finger or idean thumb to whom the mother of the gods had taught the blacksmith's art the key will scent the true place from all others follow it down twill lead thee to the mothers 
they were the first leaders the teachers of orpheus and invented the ephesian magic formulas and the musical rhythms the characteristic disparity which is shown above in the upanishad text and in faust is also found here since the gigantic hercules passed as an idean dactyl the colossal phrygians the skilled servants of rhea were also dactyli the babylonian teacher of wisdom oannes was represented in a phallic fish form the two sun heroes the dear skiri stand in relation to the kabiri they also wear the remarkable pointed head covering pileus which is peculiar to these mysterious gods and which is perpetuated from that time on as a secret mark of identification Addis, the elder brother of christ wears the pointed cap just as does mithra it has also become traditional for our present-day chthonian infantile gods the brownies panates and all the typical kind of dwarfs freud has already called our attention to the phallic meaning of the hat in modern fantasies a further significance is that probably the pointed cap represents the foreskin in order not to go too far afield from my theme i must be satisfied here merely to present the suggestion but at a later opportunity i shall return to this point with detailed proof the dwarf form leads to the figure of the divine boy the pure eternus the young dionysus jupiter and xurus tages and so on in the vase painting of thebes already mentioned a bearded dionysus is represented as kabapoe together with the figure of a boy as paeus followed by a caricatured boy's figure designated as patoaos and then again a caricatured man which is represented as mitos miros really means thread but in orphic speech it stands for semen it was conjectured that this collection corresponded to a group of statuary in the sanctuary of a cult this supposition is supported by the history of the cult as far as it is known it is an original phoenician cult of father and son of an old and young kabir who were more or less assimilated with the grecian gods the double figures of the adult and the child dionysus lend themselves particularly to this assimilation one might also call this the cult of the large and small man now under various aspects dionysus is a phallic god in whose worship the phallus held an important place for example in the cult of the argivian bull dionysus moreover the phallic hermy of the god has given occasion for a personification of the phallus of dionysus in the form of the god phales who is nothing else but a priapus he is called a typus or ipoanus bancus comrade fellow reveller corresponding to this state of affairs one cannot very well fail to recognize in the previously mentioned kabiric representation and in the added boy's figure the picture of man and his penis the previously mentioned paradox in the upanishad text of large and small of giant and dwarf is expressed more mildly here by man and boy or father and son the motive of deformity which is used constantly by the kabiric cult is present also in the face picture while the parallel figures to dionysus and paeus are the caricatured miros and parotheus just as formerly the difference in size gave occasion for division so does the deformity here without first bringing further proof to bear i may remark that from this knowledge especially strong sidelights are thrown upon the original psychologic meaning of the religious heroes dionysus stands in an intimate relation with the psychology of the early asiatic god who died and rose again from the dead and whose manifold manifestations have been brought together in the figure of christ into a firm personality enduring for centuries we gain from our premise the knowledge that these heroes as well as their typical fates are personifications of the human libido and its typical fates they are imagery like the figures of our nightly dreams the actors and interpreters of our secret thoughts and since we in the present day have the power to decipher the symbolism of dreams and thereby surmise the mysterious psychologic history of development of the individual so away 
is here open to the understanding of the secret springs of impulse beneath the psychologic development of races our previous trains of thought which demonstrate the phallic side of the symbolism of the libido also show how thoroughly justified is the term libido originally taken from the sexual sphere this word has become the most frequent technical expression of psychoanalysis for the simple reason that its significance is wide enough to cover all the unknown and countless manifestations of the will in the sense of schopenhauer it is sufficiently comprehensive and rich in meaning to characterize the real nature of the psychical entity which it includes the exact classical significance of the word libido qualifies it as an entirely appropriate term libido is taken in a very wide sense in cicero from the good proceed desire and joy joy having reference to some present good and desire to some future one but joy and desire depend upon the opinion of good as desire being inflamed and provoked is carried on eagerly toward what has the appearance of good and joy is transported and exults on obtaining what was desired for we naturally pursue those things that have the appearance of good and avoid the contrary wherefore as soon as anything that has the appearance of good presents itself nature incites us to endeavour to obtain it now where this strong desire is consistent and founded on prudence it is by the stoics called bulesis and the name which we give it is volition and this they allow to none but their wise men and define it thus volition is a reasonable desire but whatever is incited too violently in opposition to reason that is a lust or an unbridled desire which is discoverable in all fools the tusculum disputation cicero page four o three the meaning of the libido here is to wish and in the stoical distinction of will dissolute desire cicero used libido in a corresponding sense ageri rem aliquam libidine non ratione in the same sense salust says era candia pars es libidinus in another place in a milder and more general sense which completely approaches the analytical use magisque in decorus armis et militaribus equisquam in scortus et convivius libidinum habebant libido is used for arms and military horses rather than for dissipations and banquets also quod si tibi bona libido furorit patriae etc the use of libido is so general that the phrase libido as scire merely had the significance of i will it pleases me in the phrase aliquam libido urinae lacessit libido had the meaning of urgency the significance of sexual desire is also present in the classics this general classical application of the conception agrees with the corresponding etymological context of the word libido or lubido with libet more ancient lubet it pleases me and libens or lubens gladly willingly sanskrit lubiati to experience violent longing labiati excites longing lubda eager loba longing eagerness gothic lius and old high german liab love moreover in gothic lubians was represented as hope and old high german loban to praise lob commendation praise glory old bulgarian le Djibouti, to love le Djibouti, love lithuanian la sinti to praise it can be said that the conception of libido as developed in the new work of freud and of his school it has functionally the same significance in the biological territory as has the conception of energy since the time of robert mayer in the physical realm it may not be superfluous to say something more at this point concerning the conception of libido after we have followed the formation of its symbol to its highest expression in the human form of the religious hero End of section eleven section twelve of psychology of the unconscious by carl jung 
this librivox recording is in the public domain section twelve part two chapter two the conception of the genetic theory of libido the chief source of the history of the analytic conception of libido is freud's three contributions to the sexual theory there the term libido is conceived by him in the original narrow sense of sexual impulse sexual need experience forces us to the assumption of a capacity for displacement of the libido because functions or localizations of non-sexual force are undoubtedly capable of taking up a certain amount of libidinous sexual impetus libidinous afflux functions or objects could therefore obtain sexual value which under normal circumstances really have nothing to do with sexuality from this fact results the freudian comparison of the libido with a stream which is divisible which can be dammed up which overflows into branches and so on freud's original conception does not interpret everything sexual although this has been asserted by critics but recognizes the existence of certain forces the nature of which are not well known to which freud however compelled by the notorious facts which are evident to any layman grants the capacity to receive afflexes of libido the hypothetical idea at the basis is the symbol of the triabundal bundle of impulses wherein the sexual impulse figures as a partial impulse of the whole system and its encroachment into the other realms of impulse is a fact of experience the theory of freud branching off from this interpretation according to which the motor forces of a neurotic system correspond precisely to their libidinous additions to other non-sexual functional impulses has been sufficiently proven as correct it seems to me by the work of freud in his school since the appearance of the three contributions in nineteen o five a change has taken place in the libido conception its field of application has been widened an extremely clear example of this amplification is this present work however i must state that freud as well as myself saw the need of widening the conception of libido it was paranoia so closely related to the mentia precox which seemed to compel freud to enlarge the earlier limits of the conception the passage in question which i will quote here word for word reads a third consideration which presents itself in regard to the views developed here starts the query as to whether we should accept as sufficiently effectual the universal receding of the libido from the outer world in order to interpret from that the end of the world or whether in this case the firmly rooted possession of the eye must not suffice to uphold the rapport with the outer world then one must either let that which we call possession of the libido interest from erotic sources coincide with interest in general or else take into consideration the possibility that great disturbance in the disposition of the libido can also induce a corresponding disturbance in the possession of the eye now these are the problems which we are still absolutely helpless and unfitted to answer things would be different could we proceed from a safe fund of knowledge of instinct but the truth is we have nothing of that kind at our disposal we understand instinct as the resultant of the reaction of the somatic and the psychic we see in it the psychical representation of organic forces and take the popular distinction between the eye impulse and the sexual impulse which appears to us to be in accord with the biological double role of the individual being who aspires to his own preservation as well as to the preservation of the species but anything beyond this is a structure which we set up and also willingly let fall again in order to orient ourselves in the confusion of the dark processes of the soul we expect particularly from the psychoanalytic investigations into diseased soul processes to have certain decisions forced upon us in regard to questions of the theory of instinct this expectation has not yet been fulfilled on account of the still immature and limited investigations in these fields 
at present the possibility of the reaction of libido disturbance upon the possession of the eye can be shown as little as the reverse the secondary or induced disturbances of the libido processes through abnormal changes in the eye it is probable that processes of this sort form the distinctive character of the psychoses the conclusions arising from this in relation to paranoia are at present uncertain one cannot assert that the paranoic has completely withdrawn his interest from the outer world nor withdrawn into the heights of repression as one sometimes sees in certain other forms of hallucinatory psychoses he takes notice of the outer world he takes account of its changes he is stirred to explanations by their influence and therefore i consider it highly probable that the changed relation to the world is to be explained wholly in great part by the deficiency of the libido interest in this passage freud plainly touches upon the question whether the well-known longing for reality of the paranoic dement and the dementia precox patients to whom i have especially called attention in my book the psychology of dementia precox is to be traced back to the withdrawal of the libidinous afflexes alone or whether this coincides with the so-called objective interest in general it is hardly to be assumed that the normal fonction du réel jeune is maintained only through afflexes of libido or erotic interest the fact is that in very many cases reality disappears entirely so that not a trace of psychological adaptation or orientation can be recognized reality is repressed under these circumstances and replaced by the contents of the complex one must of necessity say that not only the erotic interest but the interest in general has disappeared that is to say the whole adaptation to reality has ceased to this category belong the stuporose and catatonic automatons i have previously made use of the expression psychic energy in my psychology of dementia precox because i was unable to establish the theory of this psychosis upon the conception of the displacement of the afflexes of libido my experience at that time chiefly psychiatric did not enable me to understand this theory however the correctness of this theory in regard to neuroses strictly speaking the transference neuroses was proven to me later after increased experience in the field of hysteria and compulsion neuroses in the territory of these neuroses it is mainly a question whether any portion of the libido which is spared through the specific repression becomes introverted and regressive into earlier paths of transference for example the path of the parental transference with that however the former non-sexual psychologic adaptation to the environment remains preserved so far as it does not concern the erotic and its secondary positions symptoms the reality which is lacking to the patients is just that portion of the libido to be found in the neurosis in dementia precox on the contrary not merely that portion of libido which is saved in the well-known specific sexual repression is lacking for reality but much more than one could write down to the account of sexuality in a strict sense the function of reality is lacking to such a degree that even the motive power must be encroached upon in the loss the sexual character of this must be disputed absolutely for reality is not understood to be a sexual function moreover if that were so the introversion of the libido in the strict sense must have as a result a loss of reality in the neuroses and indeed a loss which could be compared with that of dementia precox these facts have rendered it impossible for me to transfer for its theory of libido to dementia precox and therefore i am of the opinion that abraham's investigation is hardly tenable theoretically from the standpoint of the freudian theory of libido if abraham believes that through the withdrawal of the libido from the outer world the paranoid system or the schizophrenic symptomatology results then this assumption is not justified from the standpoint of the knowledge of that time because a mere libido introversion and regression leads speedily as freud has clearly shown into the neuroses and strictly speaking into the transference neuroses and not into dementia precox therefore the transference 
of the libido theory to dementia precox is impossible because this illness produces a loss of reality which cannot be explained by the deficiency of the libido defined in this narrow sense it affords me a special satisfaction that our teacher also when he laid his hand on the delicate material of the paranoic psychology was forced to doubt the applicability of the conception of libido held by him at that time the sexual definition of this did not permit me to understand those disturbances of function which affect the vague territory of the hunger instinct just as much as that of the sexual instinct for a long time the theory of libido seemed to me inapplicable to dementia precox with increasing experience in analytical work however i became aware of a gradual change in my conception of libido in place of the descriptive definition of the three contributions there gradually grew up a genetic definition of the libido which rendered it possible for me to replace the expression of psychic energy by the term libido i was forced to ask myself whether indeed the function of reality to-day does not consist only in its smaller part of libido sexualis and in the greater part of other impulses it is still a very important question whether phylogenetically the function of reality is not at least in great part of sexual origin to answer this question directly in regard to the function of reality is not possible but we shall attempt to come to an understanding indirectly a fleeting glance at the history of evolution is sufficient to teach us that countless complicated functions to which today must be denied any sexual character were originally pure derivations from the general impulse of propagation during the ascent through the animal kingdom an important displacement in the fundamentals of the procreative instinct has taken place the mass of the reproductive products with the uncertainty of fertilization has more and more been replaced by a controlled impregnation and an effective protection of the offspring in this way part of the energy required in the production of eggs and sperma has been transposed into the creation of mechanisms for allurement and for protection of the young thus we discover the first instincts of art in animals used in the service of the impulse of creation and limited to the breeding season the original sexual character of these biological institutions became lost in their organic fixation and functional independence even if there can be no doubt about the sexual origin of music still it would be a poor unaesthetic generalization if one were to include music in the category of sexuality a similar nomenclature would then lead us to classify the cathedral of cologne as mineralogy because it is built of stones it can be a surprise only to those to whom the history of evolution is unknown to find how few things there really are in human life which cannot be reduced in the last analysis to the instinct of procreation it includes very nearly everything i think which is beloved and dear to us we spoke just now of libido as the creative impulse and at the same time we allied ourselves with the conception which opposes libido to hunger in the same way that the instinct of the preservation of the species is opposed to the instinct of self-preservation in nature this artificial distinction does not exist here we see only a continuous life impulse a will to live which will attain the creation of the whole species through the preservation of the individual thus far this conception coincides with the idea of the will in schopenhauer for we can conceive will objectively only as a manifestation of an internal desire this throwing of psychological perceptions into material reality is characterized philosophically as introjection Ferenczi's conception of introjection denoted the reverse that is the taking of the outer world into the inner world naturally the conception of the world was distorted by introjection freud's conception of the principle of desire is a voluntary formulation of the idea of introjection while his once more voluntarily conceived principle of reality corresponds functionally to that which i designate as corrective of reality and r avenarius designates as imperacritisca principiale coordination the conception of power owes its existence to this very introjection this has already been said expressively by galileo in his remark that its origin is to be sought in the subjective perception of the muscular power of the individual 
because we have already arrived at the daring assumption that the libido which was employed originally in the exclusive service of egg and seed production now appears firmly organized in the function of nest building and can no longer be employed otherwise similarly this conception forces us to relate it to every desire including hunger for now we can no longer make any essential distinction between the will to build a nest and the will to eat this view brings us to a conception of libido which extends over the boundaries of the physical sciences into a philosophical aspect to a conception of the will in general i must give this bit of psychological voluntarismus into the hands of the philosophers for them to manage for the rest i refer to the words of schopenhauer relating to this in connection with the psychology of this conception by which i understand neither meta psychology nor metaphysics i am reminded here of the cosmogenic meaning of eros in plato and hesiod and also of the orphic figure of phanes the shining one the first created the father of eros phanes has also orphically the significance of priapus he is a god of love bisexual and similar to the theban dionysus lysios the orphic meaning of phanes is similar to that of the indian kama the god of love which is also the cosmogenic principle to plotinus of the neoplatonic school the world soul is the energy of the intellect plotinus compares the one the creative primal principle with light in general the intellect with the sun world so with the moon in another comparison plotinus compares the one with the father the intellect with the sun the one designated as uranus is transcendent the sun as cronus has dominion over the visible world the world so designated as zeus appears as subordinate to him the one or the usia of the whole existence is designated by plotinus as hypostatic also as the three forms of emanation also one substance in three forms as Drews observed this is also the formula of the christian trinity god the father god the son and god the holy ghost as it was decided upon at the councils of nicaea and constantinople it may also be noticed that certain early christian sectarians attributed a maternal significance to the holy ghost world soul moon see what follows concerning chi of timaeus according to plotinus the world soul has a tendency toward a divided existence and towards divisibility the conditio sine qua non of all change creation and procreation also a maternal quality it is an unending all of life and holy energy it is a living organism of ideas which attain in it effectiveness and reality the intellect is its procreator its father which having conceived it brings it to development in thought what lies enclosed in the intellect comes to development in the world's soul as logos fills it with meaning and makes it as if intoxicated with nectar nectar is analogous to soma the drink of fertility and of life also to sperma the soul is fructified by the intellect as over soul it is called heavenly aphrodite as the undersoul the earthly aphrodite it knows the birth pangs and so on the bird of aphrodite the dove is not without good cause the symbol of the holy ghost this fragment of the history of philosophy which may easily be enlarged shows the significance of the indo psyche perception of the libido and of its symbolism in human thought in the diversity of natural phenomena we see the desire the libido in the most diverse applications and forms we see the libido in the stage of childhood almost wholly occupied in the instinct of nutrition which takes care of the upbuilding of the body with the development of the body there are successively opened new spheres of application for the libido the last sphere of application and surpassing all the others in its functional significance is sexuality which seems at first almost bound up with the function of nutrition compare with this the influence on procreation of the conditions of nutrition in lower animals and plants in the territory of sexuality the libido wins that formation the enormous importance of which has justified us in the use of the term libido in general here the libido appears very properly as an impulse of procreation and almost in the form of an undifferentiated sexual primal libido as an energy of growth which clearly forces the individual towards division budding etc 
the clearest distinction between the two forms of libido is to be found among those animals in whom the stage of nutrition is separated from the sexual stage by a chrysalis stage from that sexual primal libido which produced millions of eggs and seeds one small creature derivatives have been developed with the great limitation of the fecundity derivatives in which the functions are maintained by a special differentiated libido this differentiated libido is henceforth desexualized because it is dissociated from its original function of egg and sperma production nor is there any possibility of restoring it to its original function thus in general the process of development consists in an increasing transformation of the primal libido which only produce products of generation to the secondary functions of allurement and protection of the young this now presupposes a very different and very complicated relation to reality a true function of reality which functionally inseparable is bound up with the needs of procreation thus the altered mode of procreation carries with it as a correlate a correspondingly heightened adaptation to reality in this way we attain an insight into certain primitive conditions of the function of reality it would be radically wrong to say that its compelling power is a sexual one it was a sexual one to a large extent the process of transformation of the primal libido into secondary impulses always took place in the form of a fluxes of sexual libido that is to say sexuality became deflected from its original destination and a portion of it turned little by little increasing in amount into the phylogenetic impulse of the mechanisms of allurement and of protection of the young this diversion of the sexual libido from the sexual territory into associated functions is still taking place where this operation succeeds without injury to the adaptation of the individual it is called sublimation where the attempt does not succeed it is called repression the descriptive standpoint of psychology accepts the multiplicity of instincts among which is the sexual instinct as a special phenomenon moreover it recognizes certain afflexes of libido to non-sexual instincts quite otherwise is the genetic standpoint it regards the multiplicity of instincts as issuing from a relative unity the primal libido it recognizes that definite amounts of the primal libido are split off as it were associated with the newly formed functions and finally merged in them as a result of this it is impossible from the genetic standpoint to hold to the strictly limited conception of libido of the descriptive standpoint it leads inevitably to a broadening of the conception with this we come to the theory of libido that i have surreptitiously introduced into the first part of this work for the purpose of making this genetic conception familiar to the reader the explanation of this harmless deceit i have saved until the second part for the first time through this genetic idea of libido which in every way surpasses the descriptive sexual the transference was made possible of the freudian libido theory into the psychology of mental disease the passage quoted above shows how the present freudian conception of libido collides with the problem of the psychoses therefore when i speak of libido i associate with it the genetic conception which contains not only the immediate sexual but also an amount of desexualized primal libido when i say a sick person takes his libido away from the outer world in order to take possession of the inner world with it i do not mean that he takes away merely the afflexus from the function of reality but he takes energy away according to my view from those desexualized instincts which regularly and properly support the function of reality with this alteration in the libido conception certain parts of our terminology need revision as well as we know abraham has undertaken the experiment of transferring the freudian libido theory to dementia precox and has conceived the characteristic lack of rapport and the cessation of the function of reality as autoerotism this conception needs revision hysterical introversion of the libido leads to autoerotism since the patient's erotic afflux of libido designed for the function of adaptation is introverted whereby his ego is occupied by the corresponding amount of erotic libido the schizophrenic however shuns reality far more than merely the erotic afflux could account for therefore his inner condition is very different from that of the hysteric 
he is more than autoerotic he builds up an intra-psychic equivalent for reality for which purpose he has necessarily to employ other dynamics than that afforded by the erotic afflux therefore i must grant to bluler the right to reject the conception of autoerotism taken from the study of hysterical neuroses and their legitimate and to replace it by the conception of autismus i am forced to say that this term is better fitted to facts than autoerotism with this i acknowledge my earlier idea of the identity of autismus bluler and autoerotism freud as unjustified and therefore retract it this thorough revision of the conception of libido has compelled me to this from these considerations it follows necessarily that the descriptive psychologic conception of libido must be given up in order for the libido theory to be applied to dementia precox that it is there applicable is best shown in freud's brilliant investigation of schreber's fantasies the question now is whether this genetic conception of libido proposed by me is suitable for the neuroses i believe that this question may be answered affirmatively natura non fecit saltum it is not merely to be expected but it is also probable that at least temporary functional disturbances of various degrees appear in the neuroses which transcend the boundaries of the immediate sexual in any case this occurs in psychotic episodes i consider the broadening of the conception of libido which has developed through the most recent analytic work as a real advance which will prove of a special advantage in the important field of the introversion psychoses proofs of the correctness of my assumption are already at hand it has become apparent through a series of researches of the zurich school which are now published in part that the fantastic substitution products which take the place of the disturbed function of reality bear unmistakable traces of archaic thought this confirmation is parallel to the postulate asserted above according to which reality is deprived not merely of an immediate individual amount of libido but also of an already differentiated or desexualized quantity of libido which among normal people has belonged to the function of reality ever since prehistoric times a dropping away of the last acquisition of the function of reality or adaptation must of necessity be replaced by an earlier mode of adaptation we find this principle already in the doctrines of the neuroses that is that a repression resulting from the failure of the recent transference is replaced by an old way of transference namely through a regressive revival of the parent imago in the transference neurosis hysterical where merely a part of the immediate sexual libido is taken away from reality by the specific sexual repression the substituted product is a fantasy of individual origin and significance with only a trace of those archaic traits found in the fantasies of those mental disorders in which a portion of the general human function of reality organized since antiquity has broken off this portion can be replaced only by a generally valid archaic surrogate we owe a simple and clear example of this proposition to the investigation of honegger a paranoic of good intelligence who has a clear idea of the spherical form of the earth in its rotation around the sun replaces the modern astronomical views by a system worked out in great detail which one must call archaic in which the earth is a flat disk over which the sun travels i am reminded of the sun phallus mentioned in the first part of this book for which we are also indebted to honegger spielrein has likewise furnished some very interesting examples of archaic definitions which begin in certain illnesses to overlay the real meanings of the modern word for example spielrein's patient had correctly discovered the mythological significance of alcohol the intoxicating drink to be an effusion of seed she also had a symbolism of boiling which i must place parallel to the especially important alchemistic vision of zosimos who found people in boiling water within the cavity of the altar this patient used earth in place of mother and also water to express mother i refrain from further examples because future work of the zurich school will furnish abundant evidence of this sort my foregoing proposition of the replacement of the disturbed function of reality by an archaic surrogate is supported by an excellent paradox of 
spiel rhymes she says i often had the illusion that these patients might be simply victims of a folk superstition as a matter of fact patients substitute fantasies for reality fantasies similar to the actually incorrect mental products of the past which however were once the view of reality as the zosimos vision shows the old superstitions were symbols which permitted transitions to the most remote territory this must have been very expedient for certain archaic periods for by this means convenient bridges were offered to lead a partial amount of libido over into the mental realm evidently spielrein thinks of a similar biological meaning of the symbols when she says thus a symbol seems to me to owe its origin in general to the tendency of a complex for dissolution in the common totality of thought the complex is robbed by that of the personal element this tendency towards dissolution transformation of every individual complex is the motive for poetry painting for every sort of art when here we replace the formal conception complex by the conception of the quantity of libido the total effect of the complex which from the standpoint of the libido theory is a justified measure then does spiel rhine's view easily agree with mine when primitive man understands in general what an act of generation is then according to the principle of the path of least resistance he never can arrive at the idea of replacing the generative organs by a sword-blade or a shuttle but this is the case with certain indians who explain the origin of mankind by the union of the two transference symbols he then must be compelled to devise an analogous thing in order to bring a manifest sexual interest upon an asexual expression the propelling motive of this transition of the immediate sexual libido to the non-sexual representation can in my opinion be found only in the resistance which opposes primitive sexuality it appears as if by this means of fantastic analogy formation more libido would gradually become desexualized because increasingly more fantasy correlates were put in the place of the primitive achievement of the sexual libido with this an enormous broadening of the world idea was gradually developed because new objects were always assimilated as sexual symbols it is a question whether the human consciousness has not been brought to its present state entirely or in great part in this manner it is evident in any case that an important significance in the development of the human mind is due to the impulse towards the discovery of analogy we must agree thoroughly with steinthal when he says that an absolutely overweening importance must be granted to the little phrase gleich wie even as in the history of the development of thought it is easy to believe that the carryover of the libido to a fantastic correlate has led primitive man to a number of the most important discoveries end of section twelve section thirteen of psychology of the unconscious by carl jung this librivox recording is in the public domain section thirteen chapter three the transformation of the libido a possible source of primitive human discoveries in the following pages i will endeavour to picture a concrete example of the transition of the libido i once treated a patient who suffered from a depressive catatonic condition the case was one of only a slight introversion psychosis therefore the existence of many hysterical features was not surprising in the beginning of the analytic treatment while telling of a very painful occurrence she fell into a hysterical dreamy state in which she showed all signs of sexual excitement for obvious reasons she lost the knowledge of my presence during this condition the excitement led to a masturbative act frictio femorum this act was accompanied by a peculiar gesture she made a very violent rotary motion with the forefinger of the left hand on the left temple as if she were boring a hole there 
afterwards there was complete amnesia for what had happened and there was nothing to be learned about the queer gesture with her hand although this act can easily be likened to a boring into the mouth nose or ear now transferred to the temple it belongs in the territory of infantile ludus sexualis to the preliminary exercise preparatory to sexual activity without really understanding it this gesture nevertheless seemed very important to me many weeks later i had an opportunity to speak to the patient's mother and from her i learned that her daughter had been a very exceptional child when only two years old she would sit with her back to an open cupboard door for hours and rhythmically beat her head against the door to the distraction of the household a little later instead of playing as other children she began to bore a hole with her finger in the plaster of the wall of the house she did this with little turning and scraping movements and kept herself busy at this occupation for hours she was a complete puzzle to her parents from her fourth year she practised onanism it is evident that in this early infantile activity the preliminary stage of the later trouble may be found the especially remarkable features in this case are first that the child did not carry out the action on its own body and secondly the assiduity with which it carried on the action one is tempted to bring these two facts into a causal relationship and to say because the child does not accomplish this action on her own body perhaps that is the reason of the assiduity for by boring into the wall she never arrives at the same satisfaction as if she executed the activity onanistically on her own body the very evident onanistic boring of the patient can be traced back to a very early stage of childhood which is prior to the period of local onanism that time is still psychologically very obscure because individual reproductions and memories are lacking to a great extent the same as among animals the race characteristics manner of life predominate during the entire life of the animal whereas among men the individual character asserts itself over the race type granting the correctness of this remark we are struck with the apparently wholly incomprehensible individual activity of this child at this early age we learn from her later life history that her development which is as is always the case intimately interwoven with parallel external events has led to that mental disturbance which is especially well known on account of its individuality and the originality of its productions that is dementia precox the peculiarity of this disturbance as we have pointed out above depends upon the predominance of the fantastic form of thought of the infantile in general from this type of thinking proceed all those numerous contacts with mythological products and that which we consider as original and holy individual creations are very often creations which are comparable with nothing but those of antiquity i believe that this comparison can be applied to all formations of this remarkable illness and perhaps also to this special symptom of boring we have already seen that the onanistic boring of the patient dated from a very early stage of childhood that is to say it was reproduced from that period of the past the sick woman fell back for the first time into the early onanism only after she had been married many years and following the death of her child with whom she had identified herself through an overindulgent love when the child died the still healthy mother was overcome by early infantile symptoms in the form of scarcely concealed fits of masturbation which were associated with this very act of boring as already observed the primary boring appeared at a time which preceded the infantile onanism localized in the genitals this fact is of significance in so far as this boring differs thereby from a similar later practice which appeared after the genital onanism the later bad habits represent as a rule a substitution for repressed genital masturbation 
or for an attempt in this direction as such these habits finger-sucking biting the nails picking at things going into the ears and nose etc may persist far into adult life as regular symptoms of a repressed amount of libido as has already been shown above the libido in youthful individuals at first manifests itself in the nutritional zone when food is taken in the act of suckling with rhythmic movements and with every sign of satisfaction with the growth of the individual and the development of his organs the libido creates for itself new avenues to supply its need of activity and satisfaction the primary model of rhythmic activity producing pleasure and satisfaction must now be transferred to the zone of other functions with sexuality as its final goal a considerable part of the hunger libido is transferred into the sexual libido this transition does not take place suddenly at the time of puberty as is generally supposed but very gradually in the course of the greater part of childhood the libido can free itself only with difficulty and very slowly from that which is peculiar to the function of nutrition in order to enter into the peculiarity of the sexual function two periods are to be distinguished in this state of transition so far as i can judge the epoch of suckling and the epoch of the displaced rhythmic activity suckling still belongs to the function of nutrition but passes beyond it however in that it is no longer the function of nutrition but rhythmic activity with pleasure and satisfaction as a goal without the taking of nourishment here the hand enters as an auxiliary organ in the period of the displaced rhythmic activity the hand appears still more clearly as an auxiliary organ the gaining of pleasure leaves the mouth sown and turns to other regions the possibilities are now many as a rule other openings of the body become the objects of the libido interest than the skin and special portions of that the activity expressed in these parts which can appear as rubbing boring picking and so on follows a certain rhythm and serves to produce pleasure after longer or shorter tearings of the libido at these stations it passes onward until it reaches the sexual zone and there for the first time can be occasion for the beginning of onanistic attempts in its migration the libido takes more than a little of the function of nutrition with it into the sexual zone which readily accounts for the numerous and innate correlations between the functions of nutrition and sexuality if after the occupation of the sexual zone an obstacle arises against the present form of application of the libido then there occurs according to the well-known laws a regression to the nearest station lying behind to the two above-mentioned periods it is now of special importance that the epoch of the displaced rhythmic activity coincides in a general way with the time of the development of the mind and of speech i might designate the period from birth until the occupation of the sexual zone as the pre-sexual stage of development this generally occurs between the third and fifth year and is comparable to the chrysalis stage in butterflies it is distinguished by the irregular commingling of the elements of nutrition and of sexual functions certain regressions follow directly back to the pre-sexual stage and judging from my experience this seems to be the rule in the regression of dementia precox i will give two brief examples one case concerns a young girl who developed a catatonic state during her engagement when she saw me for the first time she came up suddenly embraced me and said papa give me something to eat the other case concerns a young maid-servant who complained that people pursued her with electricity and that this caused a queer feeling in her genitals as if it ate and drank down there these regressive phenomena show that even from the distance of the modern mind those early stages of the libido can be regressively reached one may assume therefore that in the earliest states of human development this road was much more easily travelled than it is to-day it becomes then a matter of great interest to learn whether traces of this have been preserved in history 
we owe our knowledge of the ethnologic fantasy of boring to the valuable work of abraham who also refers us to the writings of adalbert Kuhn. through this investigation we learn that prometheus the fire-bringer may be a brother of the hindu pramantha that is to say of the masculine fire-rubbing piece of wood the hindu fire-bringer is called matarikvan and the activity of the fire preparation is always designated in the hieratic text by the verb manthami which means shaking rubbing bringing forth by rubbing kuhn has put this verb in connection with the greek pantheus which means to learn and has explained this conceptual relationship the tertium comparitianus might lie in the rhythm the movement to and fro in the mind according to kuhn the root month or moth must be traced from the greek i learn that which is learned knowledge the act of learning to take thought beforehand to prometheus forethought who is the greek fire robber through an unauthorized sanskrit word pramatheus which comes by way of pramantha and which possesses the double meaning of rubber and robber the transition to prometheus was effected with that however the prefix pra caused special difficulties so that the whole derivation was doubted by a series of authors and was held in part as erroneous on the other hand it was pointed out that as the thuric zeus bore the especially interesting cognomen promontheus thus prometheus might not be an original indo-germanic stem word that was related to the sanskrit pramantha but might represent only a cognomen this interpretation is supported by a gloss of hesychius prometheus the herald of the titans another gloss of hesychius explains other greek terms meaning of the flaming one analogous to similar greek words the relation of prometheus to pramantha could scarcely be so direct as kuhn conjectures the question of an indirect relation is not decided with that above all prometheus is of great significance as a surname for atheos since the flaming one is the forethinker pramati equals precaution is also an attribute of agni although pramati is of another derivation prometheus however belongs to the line of phlegeans which was placed by kuhn in uncontested relationship to the indian priest family of burgu the burgu are like mata Rivakvan, the one swelling in the mother also fire bringers kuhn quotes a passage according to which burgu also arises from the flame like agni in the flame burgu originated burgu roasted but did not burn this view leads to a root related to burgu that is to say to the sanskrit bray equal to light latin fulgio and greek theo sanskrit burgus equals splendor latin fulgur burgu appears therefore as the shining one Bignes means a certain species of eagle on account of its burnished gold color the connection with phalius which signifies to burn is clear the phlegeans are also the fire eagles prometheus also belongs to the phlegeans the path from pramantha to prometheus passes not through the word but through the idea and therefore we should adopt this same meaning for prometheus as that which pramantha attains from the hindu fire symbolism the pramantha as the tool of manthana the fire sacrifice is considered purely sexual in the hindu the pramantha as phallus or man the board wood underneath as vulva or woman the resulting fire is the child the divine son agni the two pieces of wood are called in the cult per ru ra vas and er vachi and were thought of personified as man and woman the fire was born from the genitals of the woman an especially interesting representation of fire production as a religious ceremony manthana is given by weber a certain sacrificial fire was lit by the rubbing together of two sticks one piece of wood is taken up with the words thou art the birthplace of the fire and two blades of grass are placed upon it ye are the two testicles to the adhara rani 
the underlying wood thou art urvachi then the uttarani that which is placed on top is anointed with butter thou art power this is then placed on the adhara rani thou art peru ravas and both are rubbed three times i rub thee with the diatrinetrum i rub thee with the trishtabhmetrum i rub thee with the yaga timetrum the sexual symbolism of this fire production is unmistakable we see here also the rhythm the meter in its original place as sexual rhythm rising above the mating call into music a song of the rig veda conveys the same interpretation and symbolism here is the gear for function here tinder made ready for the spark bring thou the matron we will rub agni in ancient fashion forth in the two fire sticks yata vedas lieth even as the well-formed germ in pregnant women agni who day by day must be exalted by men who watch and worship with oblations lay this with care on that which lies extended straight hath she borne the steer when made prolific with his blood pillar radiant in a splendour in our skilled task is born the son of illa book three twenty nine one through three side by side with the unequivocal coitus symbolism we see that the pramantha is also agni the created sun the phallus is the sun or the sun is the phallus therefore agni in the vedic mythology has the threefold character with this we are once more connected with the above-mentioned kabiric father-son cult in the modern german language we have preserved echoes of the primitive symbols a boy is designated as bangel short thick piece of wood in hessian as stiff or bolzen arrow wooden peg or stump the artemisia abrotanum which is called in german stabwort stick root is called in english boy's love the vulgar designation of the penis as boy was remarked even by grimm and others the ceremonial production of fire was retained in europe as late as the nineteenth century as a superstitious custom kuhn mentions such a case even in the year eighteen twenty eight which occurred in germany the solemn magic ceremony was called the nod fire the fire of need and the charm was chiefly used against cattle epidemics kuhn cites from the chronicle of lanner cost of the year twelve sixty eight an especially noteworthy case of a nod fire the ceremonies of which plainly reveal the fundamental phallic meaning in latin instead of preserving the divine faith in its purity the reader will call to mind the fact that in this year when the plague usually called lung sickness attacked the herds of cattle in laodonia certain bestial men monks in dress but not in spirit taught the ignorant people of their country to make fire by rubbing wood together and to set up a statue of priapus and by that method to succour the cattle after a cistercian lay brother had done this near fentone in front of the entrance of the court he sprinkled the animals with holy water and with the preserved testicles of a dog etc these examples which allow us to recognise a clear sexual symbolism in the generation of fire prove therefore since they originate from different times and different peoples the existence of a universal tendency to credit to fire production not only a magical but also a sexual significance this ceremonial or magic repetition of this very ancient long outlived observance shows how insistently the human mind clings to the old forms and how deeply rooted is this very ancient reminiscence of fire boring one might almost be inclined to see in the sexual symbolism of fire production a relatively late addition to the priestly lore this may indeed be true for the ceremonial elaboration of the fire mysteries but whether originally the generation of fire was in general a sexual action that is to say a coitus play is still a question that similar things occur among very primitive people we learn from the australian tribe of the wa shandies who in the spring perform the following magic ceremonies of fertilization they dig a hole in the ground so formed and surrounded with bushes as to counterfeit a woman's genitals they dance the night long around this hole in connection with this they hold spears in front of themselves in a manner to recall the penis in erection they dance around the hole and thrust their spears into the ditch while they cry to it pulli neri pulli neri wataka 
non fossa non fossa said crunus such obscene dances appear among other primitive races as well in this spring incantation are contained the elements of the coitus play this play is nothing but a coitus game that is to say originally this play was simply a coitus in the form of sacramental mating which for a long time was a mysterious element among certain cults and reappeared in sects in the ceremonies of zinzendorf's followers echoes of the coitus sacrament may be recognized also in other sects one can easily think that just as the above-mentioned australian bushmen performed the coitus play in this manner the same performance could be enacted in another manner and indeed in the form of fire production instead of through two selected human beings the coitus was represented by two substitutes by perurabus and urvachi by phallus and vulva by borer and opening just as the primitive thought behind other customs is really the sacramental coition so here the primal tendency is really the act itself for the act of fertilization is the climax the true festival of life and well worthy to become the nucleus of a religious mystery if we are justified in concluding that the symbolism of the whole in the earth used by the watts shandis for the fertilization of the earth takes the place of the coitus then the generation of fire could be considered in the same way as a substitute for coitus and indeed it might be further concluded as a consequence of this reasoning that the invention of fire-making is also due to the need of supplying a symbol for the sexual act let us return for a moment to the infantile symptom of boring let us imagine a strong adult man carrying on the boring with two pieces of wood with the same perseverance and the energy corresponding to that of this child he may very easily create fire by this play but of greatest significance in this work is the rhythm this hypothesis seems to me psychologically possible although it should not be said with this that only in this way could the discovery of fire occur it could result just as well by the striking together of flints it is scarcely possible that fire was created in only one way all i want to establish here is merely the psychologic process the symbolic indications of which point to the possibility that in such a way was fire invented or prepared the existence of the primitive coitus play or rite seems to me sufficiently proven the only thing that is obscure is the energy and emphasis of the ritual play it is well known that those primitive rites were often of very bloody seriousness and were performed with an extraordinary display of energy which appears as a great contrast to the well-known indolence of primitive humanity therefore the ritual activity entirely loses the character of play and wins that of purposeful effort if certain negro races can dance the whole night long to three tones in the most monotonous manner then according to our idea there is in this an absolute lack of the character of play pastime it approaches nearer to exercise there seems to exist a sort of compulsion to transfer the libido into such ritual activity if the basis of the ritual activity is the sexual act we may assume that it is really the underlying thought and object of the exercise under these circumstances the question arises why the primitive man endeavours to represent the sexual act symbolically and with effort or if this wording appears to be too hypothetical why does he exert energy to such a degree only to accomplish practically useless things which apparently do not especially amuse him it may be assumed that the sexual act is more desirable to primitive man than such absurd and moreover fatiguing exercises it is hardly possible but that a certain compulsion conducts the energy away from the original object and real purpose inducing the production of surrogates the existence of a phallic or orgiastic cult does not indicate ao ipso a particularly lascivious life any more than the ascetic symbolism of christianity means an especially moral life one honours that which one does not possess or that which one is not this compulsion to speak in the nomenclature formulated above removes a certain amount of libido from the real sexual activity and creates a symbolic and practically valid substitute for what is lost this psychology is confirmed by the above-mentioned 
watts chandi ceremony during the entire ceremony none of the men may look at a woman this detail again informs us from whence the libido is to be diverted but this gives rise to the pressing question whence comes this compulsion we have already suggested above that the primitive sexuality encounters a resistance which leads to a side-tracking of the libido on to substitution actions analogy symbolism etc it is unthinkable that it is a question of any outer opposition whatsoever or of a real obstacle since it occurs to no savage to catch his elusive quarry with ritual charms but it is a question of an internal resistance will opposes will libido opposes libido since a psychologic resistance as an energic phenomenon corresponds to a certain amount of libido the psychologic compulsion for the transformation of the libido is based on an original division of the will i will return to this primal splitting of the libido in another place here let us concern ourselves only with the problem of the transition of the libido the transition takes place as has been repeatedly suggested by means of shifting to an analogy the libido is taken away from its proper place and transferred to another substratum the resistance against sexuality aims therefore at preventing the sexual act it also seeks to crowd the libido away from the sexual function we see for example in hysteria how the specific repression blocks the real path of transference therefore the libido is obliged to take another path and that an earlier one namely the incestuous road which ultimately leads to the parents let us speak however of the incest prohibition which hindered the very first sexual transference then the situation changes in so far that no earlier way of transference is left except that of the pre-sexual stage of development where the libido was still partly in the function of nutrition by a regression to the pre-sexual material the libido becomes quasi desexualized but as the incest prohibition signifies only a temporary and conditional restriction of the sexuality thus only that part of the libido which is best designated as the incestuous component is now pushed back to the pre-sexual stage the repression therefore concerns only that part of the sexual libido which wishes to fix itself permanently upon the parents the sexual libido is only withdrawn from the incestuous component repressed upon the pre-sexual stage and there if the operation is successful desexualized by which this amount of libido is prepared for an asexual application however it is to be assumed that this operation is accomplished only with difficulty because the incestuous libido so to speak must be artificially separated from the sexual libido with which for ages through the whole animal kingdom it was indistinguishably united the regression of the incestuous component must therefore take place not only with great difficulty but also carry with it into the pre-sexual stage a considerable sexual character the consequence of this is that the resulting phenomena although stamped with the character of a sexual act are nevertheless not really sexual acts de facto they are derived from the pre-sexual stage and are maintained by the repressed sexual libido therefore possess a double significance thus the fire boring is a coitus and to be sure an incestuous one but a desexualized one which has lost its immediate sexual worth and is therefore indirectly useful to the propagation of the species the pre-sexual stage is characterized by countless possibilities of application because the libido has not yet formed definite localizations it therefore appears intelligible that an amount of libido which reaches this stage through regression is confronted with manifold possibilities of application above all it is met with the possibility of a purely onanistic activity but as the matter in question in the regressive component of libido is sexual libido the ultimate object of which is propagation therefore it goes to the external object parents it will also introvert with this destination as its essential character the result therefore is that the purely onanistic activity turns out to be insufficient and another object must be sought for which takes the place of the incest object the nurturing mother earth represents the ideal example of such an object the psychology of the pre-sexual stage contributes the nutrition component the sexual libido the coitus idea from this the ancient symbols of agriculture arise in the work of agriculture hunger and incest intermingle 
the ancient cults of mother earth and all the superstitions founded thereon saw in the cultivation of earth the fertilization of the mother the aim of the action is desexualized however for it is the fruit of the field and the nourishment contained therein the regression resulting from the incest prohibition leads in this case to the new valuation of the mother this time however not as a sexual object but as a nourisher the discovery of fire seems to be due to a very similar regression to the pre-sexual stage more particularly to the nearest stage of the displaced rhythmic manifestation the libido introverted from the incest prohibition with the more detailed designation of the motor components of coitus when it reaches the pre-sexual stage meets the related infantile boring to which it now gives in accordance with its realistic destination an actual material therefore the material is fittingly called materia as the object is the mother as above as i sought to show above the action of the infantile boring requires only the strength and perseverance of an adult man and suitable material in order to generate fire if this is so it may be expected that analogous to our foregoing case of onanistic boring the generation of fire originally occurred as such an act of quasi onanistic activity objectively expressed the demonstration of this can never be actually furnished but it is thinkable that somewhere traces of this original onanistic preliminary exercise of fire production have been preserved i have succeeded in finding a passage in a very old monument of hindu literature which contains this transition of the sexual libido through the onanistic phase in the preparation of fire this passage is found in brihadaranayaka upanishad in truth he atman was as large as a woman and a man when they embrace each other this his own self he divided into two parts out of which husband and wife were formed with her he copulated from this humanity sprang she however pondered how may he unite with me after he has created me from himself now i shall hide then she became a cow he however became a bull and mated with her from that sprang the horned cattle then she became a mare he however became a stallion she became a she-ass he an ass and mated with her from these sprang the whole hoofed animals she became a goat he became a buck she became a mew he became a ram and mated with her thus were created goats and sheep thus it happened that all that mates even down to the ants he created then he perceived truly i myself am creation for i have created the whole world thereupon he rubbed his hands so before the mouth so that he brought forth fire from his mouth as from the mother womb and from his hands we meet here a peculiar myth of creation which requires a psychologic interpretation in the beginning the libido was undifferentiated and bisexual this was followed by differentiation into a male and a female component from then on man knows what he is now follows a gap in the coherence of the thought where belongs that very resistance which we have postulated above for the explanation of the urge for sublimation next follows the onanistic act of rubbing or boring here finger sucking transferred from the sexual zone from which proceeds the production of fire the libido here leaves its characteristic manifestation as sexual function and regresses to the pre-sexual stage where in conformity with the above explanation it occupies one of the preliminary stages of sexuality thereby producing in the view expressed in the upanishad the first human art and from there as suggested by kuhn's idea of the root month perhaps the higher intellectual activity in general this course of development is not strange to the psychiatrist for it is a well-known psychopathological fact that onanism and excessive activity of fantasy are very closely related the sexualizing autonomizing of the mind through autoerotism is so familiar a fact that examples of that are superfluous the course of the libido as we may conclude from these studies originally proceeded in a similar manner as in the child only in a reversed sequence the sexual act was pushed out of its proper zone and was transferred into the analogous mouth zone the mouth receiving the significance of the female genitals the hand and the fingers respectively receiving the phallic meaning in this manner the regressively reoccupied activity of the pre-sexual stage is invested 
with the sexual significance which indeed it already possessed in part before but in a wholly different sense certain functions of the pre-sexual stage are found to be permanently suitable and therefore are retained later on as sexual functions thus for example the mouth zone is retained as of erotic importance meaning that its valuation is permanently fixed concerning the mouth we know that it also has a sexual meaning among animals inasmuch as for example stallions bite mares in the sexual act also cats cocks etc a second significance of the mouth is as an instrument of speech it serves essentially in the production of the mating call which mostly represents the developed tones of the animal kingdom as to the hand we know that it has the important significance of the contractation organ for example among frogs the frequent erotic use of the hand among monkeys is well known if there exists a resistance against the real sexuality then the accumulated libido is most likely to cause a hyperfunction of those collaterals which are most adapted to compensate for the resistance that is to say the nearest functions which serve for the introduction of the act on one side the function of the hand on the other that of the mouth the sexual act however against which the opposition is directed is replaced by a similar act of the pre-sexual stage the classic case being either finger-sucking or boring just as among apes the foot can on occasions take the place of the hand so the child is often uncertain in the choice of the object to suck and puts the big toe in the mouth instead of the finger this last movement belongs to a hindu rite only the big toe was not put in the mouth but held against the eye through the sexual significance of the hand and mouth these organs which in the pre-sexual stage serve to obtain pleasure are invested with procreating power which is identical with the above-mentioned destination which aims at the external object because it concerns the sexual or creating libido when through the actual preparation of fire the sexual character of the libido employed in that is fulfilled then the mouth zone remains without adequate expression only the hand has now reached its real purely human goal in its first art the mouth has as we saw a further important function which has just as much sexual relation to the object as the hand that is to say the production of the mating call in opening up the autoerotic ring hand mouth where the phallic hand became the fire producing tool the libido which was directed to the mouth zone was obliged to seek another path of functioning which naturally was found in the already existing love call the excess of libido entering here must have had the usual results namely the stimulation of the newly possessed function hence an elaboration of the mating call we know that from the primitive sounds human speech has developed corresponding to the psychological situation it might be assumed that language owes its real origin to this moment when the impulse repressed into the pre-sexual stage turns to the external in order to find an equivalent object there the real thought as a conscious activity is as we saw in the first part of this book a thinking with positive determination towards the external world that is to say a speech thinking this sort of thinking seems to have originated at that moment it is very remarkable that this view which was won by the path of reasoning is again supported by old tradition and other mythological fragments End of section 13section fourteen of psychology of the unconscious by carl jung this librivox recording is in the public domain section fourteen chapter three two in a ture opana shad the following quotation is to be found in the doctrine of the development of man being brooded o'er his mouth hatched out like as an egg from out his mouth came speech from speech the fire in part two where it is depicted how the newly created objects entered man it reads fire speech becoming entered in the mouth these quotations allow us to plainly recognize the intimate connection between fire and speech in Bri had aranyaka upanishad is to be found this passage 
yea na valkia thus he spake when after the death of this man his speech entereth the fire his breath into the wind his eye into the sun etc a further quotation from the brihadaranyaka upon a shad reads but when the sun is set o ye navalkia and the moon has set and the fire is extinguished what then serves man as light then speech serves him as light then by the light of speech he sits and moves he carries on his work and he returns home but when the sun is set o ye navalkia and the moon is set and the fire extinguished and the voice is dumb what then serves man as light then he serves himself Atman, as light then by the light of himself he sits and moves carries on his work and returns home in this passage we notice that fire again stands in the closest relation to speech speech itself is called a light which in its turn is reduced to the light of the atman the creating psychic force the libido thus the hindu metapsychology conceives speech and fire as emanations of the inner light from which we know that it is libido speech and fire are its forms of manifestation the first human arts which have resulted from its transformation this common psychologic origin seems also to be indicated by certain results of philology the indo-germanic root ba designates the idea of to lighten to shine the root is found in greek to shine to show forth reveal light in old icelandic ban equals white in new high german bonen equals to make shining the same root ba also designates to speak it is found in sanskrit ban equals to speak armenian ban equals word in new high german ban equals to banish greek i said they said a saying an oracle latin fari phanum the root belso with the meanings to ring to bark is found in sanskrit bas equals to bark and bas equals to talk to speak lithuanian balsus equals voice tone really belso equals to be bright or luminous compare greek equals bright lithuanian balti equals to become white middle high german blots equals pale the root la with the meaning of to make sound to bark is found in sanskrit las lasati equals to resound and las lasati equals to radiate to shine the related root less so with the meaning desire is also found in sanskrit las lasati equals to play lash lashati equals to desire greek equals lustful gothic lustus new high german lust latin lascivus a further related root lasso equals to shine to radiate is found in las lasati equals to radiate to shine this group unites as is evident the meanings of to desire to play to radiate and to sound a similar archaic confluence of meanings in the primal libido symbolism as we are perhaps justified in calling it is found in that class of egyptian words which are derived from the closely related roots ben and bel and the reduplication ben ben and bel bel the original significance of these roots is to burst forth to emerge to extrude to well out with the associated idea of bubbling boiling and roundness bel bel accompanied by the sign of the obelisk of originally phallic nature means source of light the obelisk itself had besides the names of 
tekenu and min also the name ben ben more rarely berber and bel bel libido symbolism makes clear this connection it seems to me the indo-germanic root vel with the meaning to wave to undulate fire is found in sanskrit ulanka equals burning greek attic equals warmth of the sun gothic bulan equals to undulate old high german and middle high german falm equals heat glow the related indo-germanic root velco with the meaning of to lighten to glow is found in sanskrit alka equals firebrand greek equals vulcan this same root vel means also to sound in sanskrit vani equals tone song music to check volati equals to call the root sveno equals to sound to ring is found in sanskrit svan savanti equals to rustle to sound zend kanant latin sonare old iranian senum cambrian sane latin saunus anglo-saxon spincian equals to resound the related root svenus equals noise sound is found in vedic svanus equals noise latin sonor sonorous a further related root is svanus equals tone noise in old iranian sun equals word the root sve in locative sveni dative sunai means sun in zend keng equals sun compare above sveno zend kanant gothic sana sano here goethe has preceded us the sun orb sings in emulation mid brother spheres his ancient round his path predestined through creation he ends with step of thunder sound faust part one hearken hark the hours careering sounding loud to spirit hearing see the new-born day appearing rocky portals jarring shatter phoebus wheels in rolling clatter with a crash the light draws near peeling rays and trumpet blazes eye is blinded ear amazes the unheard can no one hear slip within each blossom bell deeper deeper there to dwell in the rocks beneath the leaf if it strikes you you are deaf faust part two we also must not forget the beautiful verse of herderlin where art thou drunken my soul dreams of all thy rapture yet even now i hearken as full of golden tones the radiant sun youth upon his heavenly lyre plays his even song to the echoing woods and hills just as in archaic speech fire and the speech sounds the mating call music appear as forms of emanation of the libido thus light and sound entering the psyche become one libido manilius expresses it in his beautiful verses why is it wonderful to understand the universe if men are able that is men in whose very being the universe exists and each one of whom is a representative of god in miniature or is it right to believe that men have sprung in any way except from heaven he alone stands in the midst of the citadel a conqueror his head erect and his shining eyes fixed on the stars the idea of the sanskrit tijas suggests the fundamental significance of the libido for the conception of the world in general i am indebted to dr abeg in zurich a thorough sanskrit scholar for the compilation of the eight meanings of this word tejas signifies one sharpness cutting edge two fire splendor light glow heat three healthy appearance beauty four the fiery and color producing power of the human organism thought to be in the bile five power energy vital force six passionate nature seven mental also magic strength 
influence position dignity eight sperma this gives us a dim idea of how for primitive thought the so-called objective world was and had to be a subjective image to this thought must be applied the words of the chorus mysticus all that is perishable is only an allegory the sanskrit word for fire is agnes the latin ignis the fire personified is the god agni a divine mediator whose symbol has certain points of contact with that of christ in avesta and in the vedas the fire is the messenger of the gods in the christian mythology certain parts are closely related with the myth of agni daniel speaks of the three men in the fiery furnace then nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished and rose up in haste and spake and said unto his counsellors did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire they answered and said true o king he answered and said lo i see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire and they have no hurt and the form of the fourth is like the son of god in regard to that the biblia pauperum observes according to an old german incunabulum of fourteen seventy one one reads in the third chapter of the prophet daniel that nebuchadnezzar the king caused three men to be placed in a glowing furnace and that the king often went there looked in and that he saw with the three a fourth who was like the son of god the three signify for us the holy trinity and the fourth the unity of the being christ too in his explanation designated the person of the trinity and the unity of the being according to this mystic interpretation the legend of the three men in the fiery furnace appears as a magic fire ceremony by means of which the son of god reveals himself the trinity is brought together with the unity or in other words through coetus a child is produced the glowing furnace like the glowing tripod in faust is a mother symbol where the children are produced the fourth in the fiery furnace appears as christ the son of god who has become a visible god in the fire the mystic trinity and unity are sexual symbols compare with that the many references in inman ancient pagan and modern christian symbolism it is said of the saviour of israel the messiah and of his enemies isaiah ten seventeen and the light of israel shall be for a fire and his holy one for a flame in a hymn of the syrian ephraim it is said of christ thou who art all fire have mercy upon me agni is the sacrificial flame the sacrificer and the sacrificed as christ himself just as christ left behind his redeeming blood in the greek a potion of immortality in the stimulating wine so agni is the soma the holy drink of inspiration the mead of immortality soma and fire are entirely identical in hindu literature so that in soma we easily rediscover the libido symbol through which a series of apparently paradoxical qualities of the soma are immediately explained as the old hindus recognized in fire an emanation of the inner libido fire so too they recognized in the intoxicating drink fire water soma agni as rain and fire an emanation of libido the vedic definition of soma as seminal fluid confirms this interpretation the soma significance of fire similar to the significance of the body of christ in the last supper compare the passover lamb of the jews baked in the form of a cross is explained by the psychology of the pre-sexual stage where the libido was still in part the function of nutrition the soma is the nourishing drink the mythological characterization of which runs parallel to fire in its origin therefore both are united in agni the drink of immortality was stirred by the hindu gods like fire through the retreat of the libido into the pre-sexual stage it becomes clear why so many gods were either defined sexually or were devoured as was shown by our discussion of fire preparation the fire tool 
did not receive its sexual significance as a later addition but the sexual libido was the motor power which led to its discovery so that the later teachings of the priests were nothing but confirmations of its actual origin other primitive discoveries probably have acquired their sexual symbolism in the same manner being also derived from the sexual libido in the previous statements which were based on the pamantha of the agni sacrifice we have concerned ourselves only with one significance of the word manthami or mathnami that is to say with that which expresses the movement of rubbing as kuhn shows however this word also possesses the meaning of tearing off taking away by violence robbing as kuhn points out this significance is already extant in the vedic text the legend of its discovery always expresses the production of fire as a robbery in this far it belongs to the motive widely spread over the earth of the treasure difficult to attain the fact that in many places and not alone in india the preparation of fire is represented as having its origin in robbery seems to point to a widely spread thought according to which the preparation of fire was something forbidden something usurped or criminal which could be obtained only through stratagem or deeds of violence mostly through stratagem when onanism confronts the physician as a symptom it does so frequently under the symbol of secret pilfering or crafty imposition which always signifies the concealed fulfilment of a forbidden wish historically this train of thought probably implies that the ritual preparation of fire was employed with a magic purpose and therefore was pursued by official religions then it became a ritual mystery guarded by the priests and surrounded with secrecy the ritual laws of the hindus threaten with severe punishment him who prepares fire in an incorrect manner the fact alone that something is mysterious means the same as something done in concealment that which must remain secret which one may not see nor do also something which is surrounded by severe punishment of body and soul therefore presumably something forbidden which has received a license as a religious right after all has been said about the genesis of the preparation of fire it is no longer difficult to guess what is the forbidden thing it is onanism when i stated before that it might be lack of satisfaction which breaks up the auto-erotic ring of the displaced sexual activity transferred to the body itself and thus opens wider fields of culture i did not mention that this loosely closed ring of the displaced onanistic activity could be much more firmly closed when man makes the other great discovery that of true onanism with that the activity is started in the proper place and this under certain circumstances may mean a satisfaction sufficient for a long time but at the expense of cheating sexuality of its real purpose it is a fraud upon the natural development of things because all the dynamic forces which can and should serve the development of culture are withdrawn from it through onanism since instead of the displacement a regression to the local sexual takes place which is precisely the opposite of that which is desirable psychologically however onanism is a discovery of a significance not to be undervalued one is protected from fate since no sexual need then has the power to give one up to life for with onanism one has the greatest magic in one's hands one needs only to fantasize and with that to masturbate then one possesses all the pleasure of the world and is no longer compelled to conquer the world of one's desires through hard labour and wrestling with reality aladdin rubs his lamp and the obedient genii stand at his bidding thus the fairy tale expresses the great psychologic advantage of the easy regression to the local sexual satisfaction aladdin's symbol subtly confirms the ambiguity of the magic fire preparation the close relation of the generation of fire 
to the onanistic act is illustrated by a case the knowledge of which i owe to dr schmidt in Kerry, that of an imbecile peasant youth who set many incendiary fires at one of these conflagrations he drew suspicion to himself by his behaviour he stood with his hands in his trouser pockets in the door of an opposite house and gazed with apparent delight at the fire under examination in the insane asylum he described the fire in great detail and made suspicious movements in his trouser pockets with his hands the physical examination undertaken at once showed that he had masturbated later he confessed that he had masturbated at the time when he had enjoyed the fire which he had enkindled himself the preparation of fire in itself is a perfectly ordinary useful custom employed everywhere for many centuries which in itself involved nothing more mysterious than eating and drinking however there was always a tendency from time to time to prepare fire in a ceremonious and mysterious manner exactly as with ritual eating and drinking which was to be carried out in an exactly prescribed way and from which no one dared differ this mysterious tendency associated with the technique is the second path in the onanistic regression always present by the side of culture the strict rules applied to it the zeal of the ceremonial preparations and the religious awe of the mysteries next originate from this source the ceremonial although apparently irrational is an extremely ingenious institution from the psychologic standpoint for it represents a substitute for the possibility of onanistic regression accurately circumscribed by law the law cannot apply to the content of the ceremony for it is really quite indifferent for the ritual act whether it is carried out in this way or in that way on the contrary it is very essential whether the restrained libido is discharged through a sterile onanism or transposed into the path of sublimation these severe measures of protection apply primarily to onanism i am indebted to freud for a further important reference to the onanistic nature of the fire theft or rather the motive of the treasure difficult of attainment to which fire theft belongs mythology contains repeated formulas which read approximately as follows the treasure must be plucked or torn off from a taboo tree paradise tree hesperides this is a forbidden and dangerous act the clearest example of this is the old barbaric custom in the service of diana of arikia only he can become a priest of the goddess who in her sacred grove dares to tear off ab zerisen a bow the tearing off has been retained in vulgar speech besides a bribon rubbing as a symbol of the act of onanism thus ribon to rub is like ricin to break off both of which are contained in manthami and united apparently only through the myth of the fire theft bound up in the act of onanism in a deeper stratum wherein ribon probably speaking ricin is employed but in a transferred sense therefore it might perhaps be anticipated that in the deepest stratum namely the incestuous which precedes the autoerotic stage the two meanings coincide which through lack of mythological tradition can perhaps be traced through etymology only End of section fourteen section fifteen of psychology of the unconscious by carl jung this librivox recording is in the public domain section fifteen chapter four one the unconscious origin of the hero prepared by the previous chapters we approach the personification of the libido in the form of a conqueror a hero or a demon with this symbolism leaves the impersonal and neuter realm which characterizes the astral and meteorologic symbol and takes human form the figure of a being changing from 
sorrow to joy from joy to sorrow and which like the sun sometimes stands in its zenith sometimes is plunged in darkest night and arises from this very night to new splendour just as the sun guided by its own internal laws ascends from morn till noon and passing beyond the noon descends towards evening leaving behind its splendour and then sinks completely into the all enveloping night thus too does mankind follow his course according to immutable laws and also sinks after his course is completed into night in order to rise again in the morning to a new cycle in his children the symbolic transition from sun to man is easy and practicable the third and last creation of miss miller's also takes this course she calls this piece chewantable a hypnagogic poem she gives us the following information about the circumstances surrounding the origin of this fantasy after an evening of care and anxiety i lay down to sleep at about half past eleven i felt excited and unable to sleep although i was very tired there was no light in the room i closed my eyes and then i had the feeling that something was about to happen the sensation of a general relaxation came over me and i remained as passive as possible lines appeared before my eyes sparks and shining spirals followed by a kaleidoscopic review of recent trivial occurrences the reader will regret with me that we cannot know the reason for her cares and anxieties it would have been of great importance for what follows to have information on this point this gap in our knowledge is the more to be deplored because between the first poem in eighteen ninety eight and the time of the fantasy here discussed nineteen o two four whole years have passed all information is lacking regarding this period during which the great problem surely survived in the unconscious perhaps this lack has its advantages in that our interest is not diverted from the universal applicability of the fantasy here produced by sympathy and regard to the personal fate of the author therefore something is obviated which often prevents the analyst in his daily task from looking away from the tedious toil of detail to that wider relation which reveals each neurotic conflict to be involved with human fate as a whole the condition depicted by the author here corresponds to such a one as usually precedes an intentional somnambulism often described by spiritualistic mediums a certain inclination to listen to these low nocturnal voices must be assumed otherwise such fine and hardly perceptible inner experiences pass unnoticed we recognize in this listening a current of the libido leading inward and beginning to flow towards a still invisible mysterious goal it seems that the libido has suddenly discovered an object in the depths of the unconscious which powerfully attracts it the life of man turned wholly to the external by nature does not ordinarily permit such introversion there must therefore be surmised a certain exceptional condition that is to say a lack of external objects which compels the individual to seek a substitute for them in his own soul it is however difficult to imagine that this rich world has become too poor to offer an object for the love of human atoms nor can the world and its objects be held accountable for this lack it offers boundless opportunities for every one it is rather the incapacity to love which robs mankind of his possibilities this world is empty to him alone who does not understand how to direct his libido towards objects and to render them alive 
and beautiful for himself for beauty does not indeed lie in things but in the feeling that we give to them that which compels us to create a substitute for ourselves is not the external lack of objects but our incapacity to lovingly include a thing outside of ourselves certainly the difficulties of the conditions of life and the adversities of the struggle for existence may oppress us yet even adverse external situations would not hinder the giving out of the libido on the contrary they may spur us on to the greatest exertions whereby we bring our whole libido into reality real difficulties alone will never be able to force the libido back permanently to such a degree as to give rise for example to a neurosis the conflict which is the condition of every neurosis is lacking the resistance which opposes its unwillingness to the will alone has the power to produce that pathogenic introversion which is the starting point of every psychogenic disturbance the resistance against loving produces the inability to love just as the normal libido is comparable to a steady stream which pours its waters broadly into the world of reality so the resistance dynamically considered is comparable not so much to a rock rearing up in the river-bed which is flooded over or surrounded by the stream as to a backward flow towards the source a part of the soul desires the outer object another part however harks back to the subjective world where the airy and fragile palaces of fantasy beckon one can assume the dualism of the human will for which bluler from the psychiatric point of view has coined the word ambi tendency as something generally present bearing in mind that even the most primitive motor impulse is in opposition as for example in the act of extension the flexor muscles also become innervated this normal ambi tendency however never leads to an inhibition or prevention of the intended act but is the indispensable preliminary requirement for its perfection and coordination for a resistance disturbing to this act to arise from this harmony of finely attuned opposition an abnormal plus or minus would be needed on one or the other side the resistance originates from this added third this applies also to the duality of the will from which so many difficulties arise for mankind the abnormal third frees the pair of opposites which are normally most intimately united and causes their manifestation in the form of separate tendencies it is only thus that they become willingness and unwillingness which interfere with each other the bhagavad-gita says be thou free of the pairs of opposites the harmony thus becomes disharmony it cannot be my task here to investigate whence the unknown third arises and what it is taken at the roots in the case of our patients the nuclear complex freud reveals itself as the incest problem the sexual libido regressing to the parents appears as the incest tendency the reason this path is so easily travelled is due to the enormous indolence of mankind which will relinquish no object of the past but will hold it fast for ever the sacrilegious backward grasp of which nietzsche speaks reveals itself stripped of its incest covering as an original passive arrest of the libido in its first object of childhood this indolence is also a passion as la rochefoucauld has brilliantly expressed it of all passions that which is least known to ourselves is indolence it is the most ardent and malignant of them all 
although its violence may be insensible and the injuries it causes may be hidden if we will consider its power attentively we will see that it makes itself upon all occasions mistress of our sentiments of our interests and of our pleasures it is the anchor which has the power to arrest the largest vessels it is a calm more dangerous to the most important affairs than rocks and the worst tempest the repose of indolence is a secret charm of the soul which suddenly stops the most ardent pursuits and the firmest resolutions finally to give the true idea of this passion one must say that indolence is like a beatitude of the soul which consoles it for all its losses and takes the place of all its possessions this dangerous passion belonging above all others to primitive man appears under the hazardous mask of the incest symbol from which the incest fear must drive us away and which must be conquered in the first place under the image of the terrible mother it is the mother of innumerable evils not the least of which are neurotic troubles for especially from the fogs of the arrested remnants of the libido arise the harmful phantasmagoria which so veil reality that adaptation becomes almost impossible however we will not investigate any further in this place the foundations of the incest fantasies the preliminary suggestion of my purely psychologic conception of the incest problem may suffice we are here only concerned with the question whether resistance which leads to introversion in our author signifies a conscious external difficulty or not if it were an external difficulty then indeed the libido would be violently dammed back and would produce a flood of fantasies which can best be designated as schemes that is to say plans as to how the obstacles could be overcome they would be very concrete ideas of reality which seek to pave the way for solutions it would be a strenuous meditation indeed which would be more likely to lead to anything rather than to a hypnagogic poem the passive condition depicted above in no way fits in with a real external obstacle but precisely through its passive submission it indicates a tendency which doubtless scorns real solutions and prefers fantastic substitutes ultimately and essentially we are therefore dealing with an internal conflict perhaps after the manner of those earlier conflicts which led to the two first unconscious creations we therefore are forced to conclude that the external object cannot be loved because a predominant amount of libido prefers a fantastic object which must be brought up from the depths of the unconscious as a compensation for the missing reality the visionary phenomena produced in the first stages of introversion are grouped among the well-known phenomena of hypnagogic vision they form as i explained in an earlier paper the foundation of the true visions of the symbolic auto revelations of the libido as we may now express it miss miller continues then i had the impression that some communication was immediately impending it seemed to me as if there were re-echoed in me the words speak o lord for thy servant listens open thou mine ears this passage very clearly describes the intention the expression communication is even a current term in spiritualistic circles the biblical words contain a clear invocation or prayer that is to say a wish libido directed towards divinity the unconscious complex the prayer refers to samuel one three where samuel at night was three times called by god but believed that it was eli calling until the latter informed him that it was god himself who spoke and that he must answer if his name was called again speak o lord for thy servant hears the dreamer uses these words really in an inverse sense namely in order to produce god with them with that 
she directs her desires her libido into the depths of her unconscious we know that although individuals are widely separated by the differences in the contents of their consciousness they are closely alike in their unconscious psychology it is a significant impression for one working in practical psychoanalysis when he realizes how uniform are the typical unconscious complexes difference first arises from individualization this fact gives to an essential portion of the schopenhauer and hartmann philosophies a deep psychologic justification the very evident uniformity of the unconscious mechanism serves as a psychologic foundation for these philosophic views the unconscious contains the differentiated remnants of the earlier psychologic functions overcome by the individual differentiation the reaction and products of the animal psyche are of a generally diffused uniformity and solidity which among men may be discovered apparently only in traces man appears as something extraordinarily individual in contrast with animals this might be a tremendous delusion because we have the appropriate tendency always to recognize only the difference of things this is demanded by the psychologic adaptation which without the most minute differentiation of the impressions would be absolutely impossible in opposition to this tendency we have ever the greatest difficulty in recognizing in their common relations the things with which we are occupied in everyday life this recognition becomes much easier with things which are more remote from us for example it is almost impossible for a european to differentiate the faces in a chinese throng although the chinese have just as individual facial formations as the europeans but the similarity of their strange facial expression is much more evident to the remote onlooker than their individual differences but when we live among the chinese then the impression of their uniformity disappears more and more and finally the chinese become individuals also individuality belongs to those conditional actualities which are greatly overrated theoretically on account of their practical significance it does not belong to those overwhelmingly clear and therefore universally obtrusive general facts upon which a science must primarily be founded the individual content of consciousness is therefore the most unfavorable object imaginable for psychology because it has veiled the universally valid until it has become unrecognizable the essence of consciousness is the process of adaptation which takes place in the most minute details on the other hand the unconscious is the generally diffused which not only binds the individuals among themselves to the race but also unites them backwards with the peoples of the past and their psychology thus the unconscious surpassing the individual in its generality is in the first place the object of a true psychology which claims not to be psychophysical man as an individual is a suspicious phenomenon the right of whose existence from a natural biological standpoint could be seriously contested because from this point of view the individual is only a race atom and has a significance only as a mass constituent the ethical standpoint however gives to the human being an individual tendency separating him from the mass which in the course of centuries led to the development of personality hand in hand with which developed the hero cult and has led to the modern individualistic cult of personages the attempts of rationalistic theology to keep hold of the personal jesus as the last and most precious remnant of the divinity which has vanished beyond the power of the imagination corresponds to this tendency in this respect the roman catholic church was more practical because she met the general need of the visible or at least historically believed hero through the fact that she placed upon the throne of worship a small but clearly perceptible god of the world namely the roman pope the pater patrum and at the same time the pontifex maximus of the invisible 
upper or inner god the sensuous demonstrability of god naturally supports the religious process of introversion because the human figure essentially facilitates the transference for it is not easy to imagine something lovable or venerable in a spiritual being this tendency everywhere present has been secretly preserved in the rationalistic theology with its jesus historically insisted upon this does not mean that men love the visible god they love him not as he is for he is merely a man and when the pious wish to love humanity they go to their neighbours and their enemies to love them mankind wishes to love in god only their ideas that is to say the ideas which they project into god by that they wish to love their unconscious that is that remnant of ancient humanity and the centuries-old past in all people namely the common property left behind from all development which is given to all men like the sunshine in the air but in loving this inheritance they love that which is common to all thus they turn back to the mother of humanity that is to say to the spirit of the race and regain in this way something of that connection and of that mysterious and irresistible power which is imparted by the feeling of belonging to the herd it is the problem of Atias who preserves his gigantic strength only through contact with mother earth this temporary withdrawal into oneself which as we have already seen signifies a regression to the childish bond to the parent seems to act favourably within certain limits in its effect upon the psychologic condition of the individual it is in general to be expected that the two fundamental mechanisms of the psychoses transference and introversion are to a wide extent extremely appropriate methods of normal reaction against complexes transference as a means of escaping from the complex into reality introversion as a means of detaching oneself from reality through the complex after we have informed ourselves about the general purposes of prayer we are prepared to hear more about the vision of our dreamer after the prayer the head of a sphinx with an egyptian headdress appeared only to vanish quickly here the author was disturbed so that for a moment she awoke this vision recalls the previously mentioned fantasy of the egyptian statue whose rigid gesture is entirely in place here as a phenomenon of the so-called functional category the light stages of the hypnosis are designated technically as engordissement stiffening the word sphinx in the whole civilized world signifies the same as riddle a puzzling creature who proposes riddles like the sphinx of oedipus standing at the portal of his fate like a symbolic proclamation of the inevitable the sphinx is a semi theriomorphic representation of that mother image which may be designated as the terrible mother of whom many traces are found in mythology this interpretation is correct for oedipus here the question is opened the objection would be raised that nothing except the word sphinx justifies the allusion to the sphinx of oedipus on account of the lack of subjective materials which in the miller text are wholly lacking in regard to this vision an individual interpretation would also be excluded the suggestion of an egyptian fantasy part one chapter two is entirely insufficient to be employed here therefore we are compelled if we wish to venture at all upon an understanding of this vision to direct ourselves perhaps in all too daring a manner to the available ethnographic material under the assumption that the unconscious of the present-day man coins its symbols as it was done in the most remote past the sphinx in its traditional form is a half-human half-animal creature which we must in part interpret in the way that is applicable to such fantastic products the reader is directed to the deductions in the first part of this volume where the theriomorphic representations of the libido were discussed this manner of representation is very familiar to the analyst through the dreams and fantasies of neurotics and of normal men the impulse is readily represented as an animal as a bull horse dog etc one of my patients who had questionable relations with women and who began the treatment with the fear so to speak that i would surely forbid him his sexual adventures dreamed that i his physician 
very skillfully speared to the wall a strange animal half pig half crocodile dreams swarm with such theriomorphic representations of the libido mixed beings such as are in this dream are not rare a series of very beautiful illustrations where especially the lower half of the animal was represented theriomorphically has been furnished by Bertz Schinger. the libido which was represented theriomorphically is the animal sexuality which is in a repressed state the history of repression as we have seen goes back to the incest problem where the first motives for moral resistance against sexuality display themselves the objects of the repressed libido are in the last degree the images of father and mother therefore the theriomorphic symbols in so far as they do not symbolize merely the libido in general have a tendency to present father and mother for example father represented by a bull mother by a cow from these roots as we pointed out earlier might probably arise the theriomorphic attributes of the divinity in as far as the repressed libido manifests itself under certain conditions as anxiety these animals are generally of a horrible nature in consciousness we are attached by all sacred bonds to the mother in the dream she pursues us as a terrible animal the sphinx mythologically considered is actually a fear animal which reveals distinct traits of a mother derivate in the oedipus legend the sphinx is sent by hera who hates thebes on account of the birth of bacchus because oedipus conquers the sphinx which is nothing but fear of the mother he must marry jocasta his mother for the throne and the hand of the widowed queen of thebes belong to him who freed the land from the plague of the sphinx the genealogy of the sphinx is rich in allusions to the problem touched upon here she is a daughter of echnida a mixed being a beautiful maiden above a hideous serpent below this double creature corresponds to the picture of the mother above the human lovely and attractive half below the horrible animal half converted into a fear animal through the incest prohibition echnida is derived from the all-mother the mother earth gaea who with tartarus the personified underworld the place of horrors brought her forth echnida herself is the mother of all terrors of the chimera scylla gorgo of the horrible cerberus of the nemean lion and of the eagle who devoured the liver of prometheus besides this she gave birth to a number of dragons one of her sons is orthus the dog of the monstrous geryon who was killed by hercules with his dog her son echnida in incestuous intercourse produced the sphinx these materials will suffice to characterize that amount of libido which led to the sphinx symbol if in spite of the lack of subjective material we may venture to draw an inference from the sphinx symbol of our author we must say that the sphinx represents an original incestuous amount of libido detached from the bond to the mother perhaps it is better to postpone this conclusion until we have examined the following visions after miss miller had concentrated herself again the vision developed further suddenly an aztec appeared absolutely clear in every detail the hand spread open with large fingers the head in profile armoured headdress similar to the feathered ornaments of the american indian the whole was somewhat suggestive of mexican sculpture the ancient egyptian character of the sphinx is replaced here by american antiquity by the aztec the essential idea is neither egypt nor mexico for the two could not be interchanged but it is the subjective factor which the dreamer produces from her own past i have frequently observed in the analysis of americans that certain unconscious complexes that is repressed sexuality are represented by the symbol of a negro or an indian for example when a european tells in his dream then came a ragged dirty individual for americans and for those who live in the tropics it is a negro when with europeans it is a vagabond or a criminal with americans it is a negro or an indian which represents the individual's own repressed sexual personality and the one considered inferior it is also desirable to go into the particulars of this vision as there are various things worthy of notice the feather cap which naturally had to consist of eagle's feathers is a sort of magic charm the hero assumes at the same time something of the sunlight character of this bird when he adorns himself with his feathers just as the courage and strength of the enemy 
are appropriated in swallowing his heart or taking his scalp at the same time the feather crest is a crown which is equivalent to the rays of the sun the historical importance of the sun identification has been seen in the first part especial interest attaches to the hand which is described as open and the fingers which are described as large it is significant that it is the hand upon which the distinct emphasis falls one might rather have expected a description of the facial expression it is well known that the gesture of the hand is significant unfortunately we know nothing about that here nevertheless a parallel fantasy might be mentioned which also puts the emphasis upon hands a patient in a hypnagogic condition saw his mother painted on a wall like a painting in a byzantine church she held one hand up open wide with fingers spread apart the fingers were very large swollen into knobs on the ends and each surrounded by a small halo the immediate association with this picture was the fingers of a frog with sucking discs at the ends then the similarity to the penis the ancient setting of this mother picture is also of importance evidently the hand had in this fantasy a phallic meaning this interpretation was confirmed by a further very remarkable fantasy of the same patient he saw something like a sky-rocket ascending from his mother's hand which at a closer survey becomes a shining bird with golden wings a golden pheasant as it then occurs to his mind we have seen in the previous chapter that the hand has actually a phallic generative meaning and that this meaning plays a great part in the production of fire in connection with this fantasy there is but one observation to make fire was bored with the hand therefore it comes from the hand agni the fire was worshipped as a golden-winged bird it is extremely significant that it is the mother's hand i must deny myself the temptation to enter more deeply into this let it be sufficient to have pointed out the possible significance of the hand of the aztec by means of these parallel hand fantasies we have mentioned the mother suggestively with the sphinx the aztec taking the place of the sphinx points through his suggestive hand to parallel fantasies in which the phallic hand really belongs to the mother likewise we encounter an antique setting in parallel fantasies the significance of the antique which experience has shown to be the symbol for infantile is confirmed by miss miller in this connection in the annotation to her fantasies for she says in my childhood i took a special interest in the aztec fragments and in the history of peru and of the incas through the two analyses of children which have been published we have attained an insight into the child's small world and have seen what burning interests and questions secretly surround the parents and that the parents are for a long time the objects of the greatest interest we are therefore justified in suspecting that the antique setting applies to the ancients that is to say the parents and that consequently this aztec has something of the father or mother in himself up to this time indirect hints point only to the mother which is nothing remarkable in an american girl because americans as a result of the extreme detachment from the father are characterized by a most enormous mother complex which again is connected with the especial social position of woman in the united states this position brings about a special masculinity among capable women which easily makes possible the symbolizing into a masculine figure after this vision miss miller felt that a name formed itself bit by bit which seemed to belong to this aztec the son of an inca of peru the name is chi want to pell as the author intimated something similar to this belonged to her childish reminiscences the act of naming is like baptism something exceedingly important for the creation of a personality because since olden times a magic power has been attributed to the name with which for example the spirit of the dead can be conjured to know the name of any one means in mythology to have power over that one as a well-known example i mention the fairy tale of rapel stiltskin in an egyptian myth isis robs the sun-god ray permanently of his power by compelling him to tell her his real name therefore to give a name means to give power invest with a definite personality 
the author observed in regard to the name itself that it reminded her very much of the impressive name popo catapeltal a name which belongs to unforgettable school memories and to the greatest indignation of the patient very often emerges in an analysis in a dream or fantasy and brings with it the same old joke which one heard in school told one's self and later again forgot although one might hesitate to consider this unhallowed joke as of psychologic importance still one must inquire for the reason of its being one must also put as a counter question why is it always popa coddle and not neighbouring ista kikwatl or the even higher and just as clear or ritsaba the last has certainly the more beautiful and more easily pronounced name popa coddle is impressive because of its onomatopoetic name in english the word is to pop pop gun which is here considered as anamatopoesy in german the words are hinter pommern pumpernickel bomb petard lepet equals flatus the frequent german word popo podex does not indeed exist in english but flatus is designated as to poop in childish speech the act of defecation is often designated as to pop a joking name for the posterior part is the bomb poop also means the rear end of a ship in french pouf is onomatopoetic pouffer equals platson to explode la poupe equals rear end of a ship le pompard equals the baby in arms la poupe equals doll poupon is a pet name for a chubby-faced child in dutch pop german papa and latin puppus equal doll in plaudus however it is also used jokingly for the posterior part of the body poupus means child pupula equals girl little dolly the greek word papa designates a cracking snapping or blowing sound it is used of kissing by theocritus also of the associated noise of flute blowing the etymologic parallels show a remarkable relationship between the part of the body in question and the child this relationship we will mention here only to let it drop at once as this question will claim our attention later one of my patients in his childhood had always connected the act of defecation with the fantasy that his posterior was a volcano and a violent eruption took place explosion of gases and gushings forth of lava the terms for the elemental occurrences of nature are originally not at all poetical one thinks for example of the beautiful phenomenon of the meteor which the german language most unpoetically calls stern schnupper the smouldering wick of a star certain south american indians call the shooting star the urine of the stars according to this principle of the least resistance expressions are taken from the nearest source available for example the transference of the metronomic expression of urination as schiffens to rain End of section fifteen